Restricting your audio or video according according to the the board. Your video is on. Hey, let me check here. <laughs> Yes, hello.
that you yeah, me. yeah, I tried to let you in, but you refused. Okay, say so this time accept it, okay? Yeah, which is what it says. Okay, you I should you should get it. Time. Did you get the uh okay? Yeah. Hold on, I'm, hold on. Here you, you should be getting it right now. All right, here we go. Okay, there you go. So you're you should be set. Cool. And then okay. And then cool. And then also the one I should be logged in under mine. Uh which is Okay, Ricardo. yeah, there's a Tom there's a Thomas guest. Is that you? No. No. Um I'm under Ricardo. Okay, Ricardo. Okay, here you go, Ricardo. You're getting invited in. Thank you. I can get it set up now. Thank you. Okay, thank you.
Ricardo, your camera and mic are off, according to the panel. Maybe you need to reboot and plug in again. Because according to my panel, your audio and video are turned off. Thomas is open, video and audio. Knock, knock. Good morning, guys. Uh, the, the problem of the Friday morning is that we pay for the uh, 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 party from Thursday night, so it's always a bit slower, and, and people wake up as the day goes. Uh, uh, we'll start here uh, uh, this morning uh, with Dr. Uh, Johnson uh, uh, Foy. Uh, uh, she, she's a... She's a uh, frequent flyer as well with us, uh, phenomenal uh, work in helping us uh, educate our primary care physicians what brain animals are about and what we should be doing for that. Thank you again uh, uh, for being here. Good morning. 
I, I am Dr. Trishella Johnson Foy. And again, I thank you guys for allowing me the opportunity to be here again today. Um, it's not on. <laughs> there we go. So I get to start your day off, uh, wake you up this morning, if not with this delightful presentation that with my bright yellow dress that looks like the sun. So I am thankful and hopefully as we go through these next 30 minutes, you will feel a little bit more enlightened and invigorated for all of the bigger brains in here. This is meant for primary care doctors or those who are kind of really trying to understand those basics of aneurysms. And so that's why as a primary care provider, I get to provide this information for you. I have no disclosures. And the objective of this presentation is to really kind of go back to the basics of understanding aneurysms and how we as those primary care physicians should approach it. So every year there is someone who I can look back through the news who has been affected by aneurysms. And this year, and well, in 2023, Tom Sizemore, which you guys may remember from Saving Private Ryan, unfortunately passed away at the age of 61 from a brain aneurysm in March of last year. So Oftentimes, it is a sad story where someone actually passes away, but many times there are stories of survival. Now, last year, and don't let me be the harbinger of gossip um, because it has not completely been confirmed, but it is thought or it was initially stated that a part of what Jamie Foxx was, uh, his health crisis, was that he had actually had an aneurysm, but they kind of took it back almost immediately. Uh, but if that is what happened, then he had a hard time, but has been back on the scene and survived as you many, you all may know. Now this face is one that is familiar to you. She has a real survival story. Uh, if you can't tell who she is from there. This may help a little bit more. This is our queen of the Andals and the first men, the mother of dragons. And while she was filming Game of Thrones, she also experienced in the first season, she had two aneurysms, two brain surgeries, and two near fatal events. And she was only 24 years old. But now she tells the story of what survivorship looks like. So this beautiful, beautiful site right here, which I love this picture because it really is a remarkable thing. And it's, of course, magnified here, but it is such a tiny little thing in our brain that can affect so many people. So although we have those survivors, there have been many in the past that you may not have even realized a part of their outcome was related to the fact that they had aneurysms that ruptured. And I always like to give a little bit of local history here. Tilly Fowler, which there's a park not too far down the road, was one of our Congresswomen who was really a hot star on the rise. And she unfortunately died in 2005 from a brain hemorrhage, but who knows if she had survived, she might've been one of our first presidents, so first female presidents. So how common is this? About one in 50 have a brain aneurysm and about four in 10 people with a ruptured brain aneurysm, unfortunately die of it. And so this becomes something that is important for us to truly make sure we are approaching. So when you break that down, that means about one to 3% of the population has uh, aneurysms. Of these aneurysms, this accounts for about 80 to 85% of subarachnoid hemorrhages. And so when you look at autopsy studies, although we initially, we say one to 3%, there are some who suggest it may be around 5%, but meeting in the middle, it's thought to be about two to 3% really of the population. Now, 50 to 80% of these aneurysms do not rupture during the course of a person's lifetime. And that's where, as primary care providers, our story 
really needs to be focused on helping people understand, although there are risks and challenges and concerns, that it really is about survivorship. And if we can play our role and do the part that we're supposed to do, then it can help people live long, healthy lives without the stress and uh, the strife of thinking that their aneurysm is going to rupture. It is something that is more common in women. Um, there's about a three to one to two ratio of women to men. So this means about 16, six to 15 million people in the US have a brain aneurysm, but it's suggested about 90% of them know little or nothing about it. So my job is to help you know a little bit more. The real risk of an aneurysm bursting can be less than one, less than half of 1% over a person's lifetime. About 13% of strokes are caused by an aneurysm, but a ruptured aneurysm can cause the most debilitating types of strokes. So from the primary care standpoint, understanding risk factors, making sure you uh, order the proper radiology and refer when it is appropriate, but more than anything, provide reassurance when reassurance can be provided. Now, I am going to take a step back for a minute since this is a primary care talk to just refresh us on the anatomy of the brain. That brain, the blood to the brain is supplied by those major blood vessels that form that circle of will issue. You have the anterior cerebral artery, posterior cerebral artery, internal carotid, and the basilar artery. Now, this is a beautiful picture of it. What occurs when an aneurysm uh, develops is there is a weakness in the wall of the blood vessel that causes it to bulge or balloon out or uh, dilate. And this weakness is usually going to occur at those bifurcation points, those branches that are more susceptible to shear forces and the things that are going to usually make things a little bit weaker. Now, major risk factors are going to be kind of more the biomechanics of it. It used to be thought that it was more genetic. However, studies have shown that it, we actually are dealing with other things. And then we'll get more into how do you approach it and repair it. There are three types of aneurysms. You have your saccular, your fusiform, and your dissecting types of aneurysms. And this kind of helps you understand a little bit more about it. Saccular aneurysms are degenerative or developmental, thought to be more from traumatic or mycotic or oncotic related uh, issues, also vasculopathy related or drug related. Sites, again, of the saccular aneurysms occur mostly in that anterior communicating artery bifurcation area or the middle cerebral artery bifurcation area. And it is the, the most frequent cause of, non, of clinically significant non-traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhages is a rupture of that saccular or berry aneurysm. This shows that anatomy in the brain and where people are more likely to be affected. So again, it was thought that you were likely born with these aneurysms, but studies have found really not a lot of evidence to support that, um, that there is any congenital development or inherited weakness in the arterial wall, although genetic conditions are associated with an increased risk of aneurysm development. But the true source is thought to be that this probably results more so from that hemodynamically induced degenerative vascular injury. So the occurrence grows thrombosis and even the rupture of aneurysms are usually explained by these sheer stresses on the walls of these large cerebral arteries, particularly again at those bifurcation points. Other causes that are less common can be trauma, infection, tumors, or drug abuse as well as high flow states associated with the AVMs or fistulas. Now, as we look back at Mr. Sizemore, he had admitted throughout his lifetime that he had used, he used to uh, drink alcohol, but it was too obvious of a uh, thing that people could identify. And so then cocaine became his drug of choice. And it was something that he had battled with for many years. So as we think about his uh, choices, 
been and wonder whether or not that had any effect on this development or and his death, unfortunately, from the aneurysm. I'm putting some things together that was not necessarily uh, spoken about, but as a scientist, it's important to kind of look at all of the possibilities. So having conversations with your patients about substance use and long-term potential effects is something that's going to be important, even if it's a tough conversation for you. But ultimately, it could end in their death and usually in people who are younger. So don't be afraid to have those conversations. Now, there are several other inherited risk factors, uh, many things that people are born with that may inherently put them at risk for the development of these aneurysms. Um, things that are common and things that are not as common. Alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency is one of those things that we see a lot in people who have COPD or um, uh, liver disease. And so it's an easy test to do, it's inexpensive. And so as primary care providers, if there is any question or thought, if they have the condition, then you should consider screening, but also making sure that it is one of those things that if they have an aneurysm that you consider as well. Family history, female, gender, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, um, all of these things are potentially inherited. A big one is fibromuscular dysplasia. I remember as I have gone through uh, medicine, I've actually been a doctor now for over 20 years. And so fibromuscular dysplasia, when we first started talking about aneurysms, wasn't as much of a conversation. But now in primary care, it is very important that if you identify a patient who has this condition that you make sure that you are doing proper screening on these patients. And so that's one of those wonderful things as you see us get smarter in medicine, how we now know how to approach patients with certain conditions and those connections that are there. Uh, hereditary hemorrhagic telangiectasia, Klinefelter's, Noonan's, uh, polycystic kidney disease, again, another one that over time we have recognized is one of those really important diseases that affects a lot of people that puts patients at increased risk of cerebral aneurysms. So again, making sure if you are managing these types of conditions, you don't want to just worry about their blood pressure, worry about whether they're ending up on dialysis, because the thing that can cut their life short very quickly would be a ruptured aneurysm. So doing that screening test to rule that out is one of those things that's uh, recommended in these types of patients. Now, as you get, as we move past the things that are genetic or things that are inherited, we talk about things that are more acquired, what happens over the lifetime. So as you get older, because things on the inside of our body change the same way things on the outside, our face gets a little bit more wrinkly, well, also those blood vessels become a little bit weaker. And then because of that, this puts you at an increased risk of having weakness in those areas that add, end up potentially um, leading to uh, aneurysms, alcohol consumption, a, a lifetime of alcohol consumption, um, especially if you're a binge drinker, can change those sheer forces, forces on those blood vessels. So you become a higher risk. Cigarette smoking, illicit drugs that we talked about, high blood pressure, trauma to the head and infection, all of those things are going to put you at risk. So understanding the risk is one thing. But as you have your conversations with your patients, making sure you clarify that having a risk doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to have the disease. So doing our due diligence to investigate it is what, as their doctor, we should be doing. And again, providing that reassurance that even though these are your risk factors, you may never develop the disease, that is what we're here for. But staying on top of making sure we're looking for it is the thing that we have to do in what we, our guidance is. All right, so genetic testing. Now I know I told you earlier that this was not a genetic disease. However, there are some things that have been shown to be potentially uh, related to uh, the development of aneurysms. And so in the world where genetic we, we are able to do more genetic testing and figure out those connections between things. There has been some strong associations found with chromosome nine and chromosome eight and chromosome um, four. So they may come to you because they can order a $300 test or less if it's Black Friday 
to see what their genetic risks are. And they may say, hey, this says I'm at risk for uh, aneurysm, and it may be related to finding one of these uh, chromosomal uh, abnormalities. Now, we have large studies that look at what is the natural history of aneurysms in these patients who we have identified the risk. So making sure that we really are knowing how to clarify or classify these patients becomes important. So we have something called the phase risk score that helps with understanding the risk of rupture. And so this was a study that looked at the potential uh, risk over time and it assigned a point for each of these different categories. Now, the phases risk score ranges from you can have less than two to greater than 12. And of course, the larger or the higher the number is, the higher that five-year risk of rupture is. So then it becomes an opportunity for you to really know how to have a discussion with your patients about what their risks are. Previously, when a patient had a, a, a aneurysm, we just watched and we might have been as nervous as they were, but now we're developing things that allow us to have a certain understanding and comfort level with this is what this individual person's true risk is. We also have an elapsed score that consists of six easily retrievable predictors that can help a physician in decision making on the need for timing and the follow-up imaging in patients with unruptured aneurysms. So again, we have now opportunities to uh, determine how to follow these patients. Going a little fast because I only have a few minutes, so I won't delve into it, but hopefully you get a, a copy of this. The new growth score is a new simple scoring that consists of only female cigarette smoking and age less than 40 years, and it helps predict the growth of an intracranial aneurysm um, and what the long-term follow-up is. And in comparison, it has been shown to be significantly better than the elapsed score. So who do you hone in on? Those patients, like I said, who have polycystic kidney disease, uh, AVL formations and uh, fibromuscular dysplasia, those are some really low hanging fruit opportunities. And these are conditions that you are likely to see. So this is why I'm putting an emphasis on them. These are your, if you don't remember a lot of other things, these are conditions like, oh, my daddy has a kidney disease, he's on dialysis. Well, first, clarifying if they might have polycystic kidney disease because they can walk around and not know it, and all of a sudden their blood pressure is high and then you're, you're finding it. But if you do a good family history on these patients, then you're likely able to identify these things. And now you're able to take it a step further because now you've identified polycystic kidney disease and here's a new conversation. You have this, this is something we can man manage, but let's look for something else. And that's the conversation you wanna start having with them. Same thing with fibromuscular dysplasia. That's something that oftentimes is um, just incidentally caught and noted. So again, helping them understand what their long time risk is. Family history. There are studies that show it predicts a likelihood of development of a, a aneurysm, but not necessarily the risk of rupture. So when we're having conversations, people are scared about the fact that mom or dad or auntie or grandma had a, an aneurysm that ruptured. So this is your opportunity here. Let me do your risk factors and score and then help you understand what your risk is. The guidelines here currently say that if a person has two immediate relatives, with intracranial aneurysms, um, then this is where uh, uh, screening should be occur. And all patients with aut autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease should have screening. Again, genetic testing is available to everyone. <laughs> so they no longer have to come to the doctor and say, I wanna see a geneticist. They can go online and write 23andMe or all of the different things um, that they have opportunities. It's gone from being thousands of dollars to hundreds of dollars. And so again, they may come provide you with more information than you have for them. There have been studies that are associated with uh, risk of rupture and anticoagulation because this, as a primary care provider, there is a common question about uh, 
do we have these patients on um, aspirin or not? And it actually remains unclear at this point, the benefit of aspirin use in patients presenting. Um, so it's important to understand the risk versus benefit. Um, we'll need more trials to answer this. If you have patients of color, it's important to know that they are twice as likely to have a rupture. And so how do these patients present? Well, we have all heard of the worst headache of your life. They have severe headaches. Um, they may present. And so again, telling them present to the, go to the ER if you have that worst headache in your life. They may show seizures, light sensitivity, double vision or blurred vision. They also may have some face pain or the small embolic stroke um, from the aneurysm thrombus can cause some of that. They may have visual field defects or TIAs. Uh, dilated pupils are another uh, presenting symptom. So you want to make sure that you avoid misdiagnosis because if you scan these patients properly, you could save their life. So what scanning do we do? We have CTAs, MRAs. Um, this MRA and CTA are the methods of choice in unruptured aneurysms, but angiography by direct intraarterial catheterization, that's the gold standard. Uh, of course, it's, a, it's more expensive and has the potential for some risk factors that uh, we have to be cautious about. However, it is going to give us the best information and these beautiful pictures. Getting them in the right hands, if you guys know, you look around this room, you're surrounded by these wonderful people who can make sure your patients are taken care of, they take care of many of mine. Conservative management, however, is usually going to be the course. Patients over 60 years who have small aneurysms, unless there's a strong family history of um, hemorrhage, um, are they symptomatic, those are the people who we monitor. Now, patients who are older, who have aneurysms, they also can be considered for conservative management, but you want to make sure that you're stratifying their risk properly as you, the same you would do with young people. So counseling them on what their biggest risk factors are, making sure that their blood pressure is controlled, that if they're smokers, you uh, recommend cessation, and that if they're drinking alcohol, that they're only doing so in moderation. Make sure you're scanning them properly. You repeat the MRA or CTA on that annual basis for about three years and then on several further occasions at a reduced frequency. Again, a lot of times this is guided by our neurosurgeons. So making sure they're in good hands takes the pressure off you of trying to remember how frequently they need to be scanned. And then the interventions, again, this is going to be uh, determined by our wonderful neurosurgeons. Um, and this is just um, some opportunities that uh, are present um, coiling, um, of course, is one of those uh, opportunities to treat these aneurysms, the stent and the aneurysm clip. Those are the, the opportunities that we have. And we have lots of studies that are going to help guide what is the best treatment for these unruptured aneurysms. What is your job more than anything to reassure these patients, to not allow them to feel like they're walking around with a ticking time bomb in their head, to help them live their lives as they normally would, making sure they follow up, but then at the same time, putting them at ease, encouraging them. How you deliver the information is how they receive it. So if you give a doom and gloom talk, then they're gonna feel doom and gloom. But if you are sunshine like me, then you are able to help them feel a little bit more reassured about what those next steps are. Connecting them with proper resources outside, making sure they have a community of people that they can tap into to feel good about this is something that I can live with because reassurance helps them live their best life. Survivorship is real. These are people we see every day who have gone through this, been through this, and we are still seeing them every day. So are there any questions? I didn't go too far over. I appreciate your time. And I will turn it over if there aren't any questions. <laughs> uh, the doctor, uh, Santiago Ortega from Iowa is texting me here on the side. I wish I have primary care with this enthusiasm about aneurysm in Iowa. So Thank you. I echo that. Thank and you. Any questions, guys? 
Come on. Uh-huh. Too much wine last night? No. I was just so good. <laughs> hey, uh, Dr. Aldana. Hi, uh, excellent talk. Thank Could you. you tell me more about the the consumer genetic uh, testing that's out there? Do they actually um, detect the genes uh, that that may be predisposed to, to aneurysms? So with the consumer genetic testing, they are testing for so many things right now. And it's not just the consumer genetic testing. As primary care providers, we oftentimes get uh, solicitations from um, genetic company or genetic testing companies about various things. So with cardiovascular disease, they'll have aneurysms listed there. Now, I can't tell you for sure if it's chromosome nine and chromosome three that they're testing for, but they are giving the impression for patients that that is something that they're screening for. So knowing that and us understanding that there may be an association is important. Uh, I don't know if you noticed it was a uh, University of Michigan, so I hope you buy the test. That will decrease the tuition that I have to pay for my son to go there. <laughs> and Dr. Foy is wearing a yellow that is a uh, University of Michigan. Uh, go, go, go blue. It wasn't intentional. Uh, <laughs> Oh. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Here. All right. Uh, any more questions, guys? Thank, thank you. you. Thank yeah. you. So, uh, so it's not every day uh, that we we have the the opportunity to have on the same room a guy that I I I give credit as the father of flow divert. I'll never remember. He's not giving a talk, but it's a perfect introduction to the guy that is giving a talk. Uh, uh, AJ Waklo is a frequent flyer here. It's the first time that we're able to get uh, Pedro Lilic here. Uh, it's not easy for a Brazilian to say that, but anything that happens in our field happens first in Buenos Aires. So you know uh, how passionate about I am about Brazil and our football. Uh, when you talk to Argentinians this day, I have to put my head down and say, yes, Pedro, you guys beat us uh, or beat everybody. Uh, but but uh, 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 Pedro has done, and I, I know Pedro since I was uh, uh, thinking about uh, doing neurosurgery. So everybody in Latin America was doing my residence in Curitiba, our, our state, Paraná's neighbors with Argentina. I was born about 200 kilometers, 150 miles from the border with Argentina. Uh, so... Uh, seeing the work, and we know the resource limitations that we have in Latin America, to build what Pedro did, uh, the time that he did and continue that, the guy that came to show me how to do this procedure called Ishan that we did Wednesday is Pedro's uh, uh, oldest son, Ivan. So not only he created a phenomenal uh, practice, he inspired his kids, uh, Ivan Radiology, uh, Pedrito, uh, neurosurgery to follow on the footsteps of the dad and with the amount of the work and uh, uh, punishment that we give to our families to do what we do to help uh, humankind uh, I think it's phenomenal to see that and maybe uh, my kids will see that one day and follow that uh, Pedro is going to talk to us about his journey through flow diversion uh, he did that first Again, I, 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 would, I will show you this afternoon the list of things that he did first. Uh, it's really long, uh, and it's phenomenally inspiring, again, for, for anybody in the world to see that if you put your mind to do something, uh, you can accomplish, no matter where you are, no matter what kind of limitations your environment gives to you. Uh, Pedro, uh, mi honor te, te loca. Thank you, Ricardo, this kind introduction. Uh, I don't know if I deserve it that much, but uh, yes, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here with you guys. Uh, has been very, it will be very difficult to go and, and, and try to show you uh, the things that I have done in probably 18 years in flow diversion and, and half an hour, but I will, I will try to do my best. Uh, for some reason, 
And, and, and again, thank you for having me here and invite me. Thank you to the organizing committee. Thank you for everybody. Uh, so let's try to, maybe I need some help. It doesn't work. Okay. So everything that you will see is uh, was, was done in Buenos Aires in our center. We have a very active center, uh, a lot of fellows from all over the world, but especially from Latin America. Okay, so those are my uh, my disclosure. Okay. It must be the Argentinian computer. No? Sorry for that. I, I will buy from Brazil next. Next one. There we go. Now the metros came to reinforce you on. Yeah. Uh, you know, the things we try everything before and works. So it's. Um, well, I tell you through what the what the, the I, I I read the paper from uh, I read the paper from uh, from uh, AJ and Baruch about the flow diversion. I thought, well, maybe in twenty or thirty years would be would be true. And after they came and show us the uh, the first device, Aaron Bere and, and Kim Nelson, I, I become very enthusiastic about it. So that was done in our center in Buenos Aires. We are changing facility now, and those are some of the fellows that we have in Argentina from all over the world, especially from Brazil. We have a few, few of them, uh, Colombia, Uruguay. So, and this is the actual fellows that we have, eight fellows now in, in Argentina. Uh, Dr. Foy did a fantastic job showing the, what is the problem with the aneurysm. There is a multifactorial disease, as you learned already, uh, is driving by hemodynamic, but has some clinical biomechanics and also some environment around of the aneurysm. So every time when you have a new technique, you you it's a big impact, no? You learn uh, the scope, but also you learn the limitation of the technique because every every single technique has his limitation. Uh, the flow diversion was a great uh, idea of, of innovation. No? So some has a vision and make true, which is not easy, uh, but you know, our field is a field of innovation. Nothing that we do today is, uh, is, is like we learn uh, used to do it and when we, we had our fellowship problem. So those are some of the some of the things that we have done in Buenos Aires since uh, COIL is back in the 90 to Cerevax uh, on OCT now in 2023. So those are, we, we, we carry history of evolution. Once in a while, uh, in that evolution, we have a revolution with big change, big improvement. Uh, and that happens with the GDC. And this is, those are uh, uh, two Europeans, Bilo Guglielmi and Ivan Sepetka from Czechoslovakia. They built and they make a, a GDC, the first coiling. Uh, we took advantage of that because our uh, we had a lot of limitation. Our practice was, is always an evaluation. Once in a while, we got the benefit of uh, RCT. And we have a really uh, unusual practice uh, with less questions. Uh, but, you know, we, will, we, we have very well established uh, practice in the vascular for coiling. Why? Well, what was the need to change that? Why stands? Why flow diverter? That was a, a question. Uh, back in 1995, when FDA approved the GDC, we had more than 500 patients treated in Buenos Aires. And we saw the limitation. The biggest limitation was and is the recanalization. As bigger is the aneurysm, bigger are your chance to, to, to have a recanalization. I was shown nicely by this paper by Yuichi Nurayama. Uh, so, you know, we, that was the origin of everything. Uh, Baruch Lieber and, and uh, AJ groups uh, stated back in 1995, so at the time that we have 500 aneurysm by calling, uh, they envisioned that maybe the stent 
will be an alternative treatment and will help NAS in the endovascular treatment of, of aneurysm. So those are the guys. Uh, AJ Wakalu, uh, we are very fortunate to have him here, the father of, of flow diversion. And we took that idea with uh, some European colleagues, Daniel Rufenat from, from Switzerland, and we built an, uh, an intracranial stand meeting starting in 2003, tried to see how we can help. At that time, I joined uh, Nelson, Peter Kim from New York, and Aaron Bere from Stanford, and they came with a, with a Quantran with, with that was an engineer, with, uh, he made the, the idea and, and they comes with a new with a new device. So why is new device? Well, the new device will be succeed if there is a demand, if there is a need. So first the need and after you have to understand the problem and, af and after that you have you, you, you will come with a possible solution. So we understood the problem uh, as you will learn this morning in the first talk, the formation grow and rupture of the aneurys is not an easy task. It's a very complex problem. And there are external conditions which are very well known for neurosurgery. There are internal conditions uh, we manage from the endovascular point of view, but there is the wall. Uh, we, we don't know that much about the wall until recently that uh, we got help from Matthew Gunes group and others like Giovanni Hugi, uh, Vania. Uh, we learned much about the OCT and the wall. And you know, that scared me a lot. This is one of my cases in Buenos Aires. Uh, see, see the normal wall of the of the of of, of the arte here uh, you see how thin is as soon as you approach the aneurysm here's the aneurysm you know here we ha you have only 20 microns so uh, is the size only the proper thing to see to treat an aneurysm i'm i'm sure that is not there are many variables uh, that we have to consider on that uh, so probably there are different people in this room uh, and, and there are a lot of different aneurysms. And for uh, one single aneurysm, there are different tools. So we need to consider that. And we have to have all the capability. We have to have clipping, polling, and whatsoever. So this is, this is the, the, the second meeting of intracranial stenting was in Geneva. Um, and this is a Japanese uh, cohort that we have the pleasure to work with. Makoto Ota is, is a bright, was a bright engineer. This is Kim Nelson here and Daniel Rufenach. So we understood the problem at that time. There are two diseases uh, with one single name, aneurysm. But you have a focal disease that you can clip it, you can coil, you can onyx, you can do whatever you want, it will be okay. But if you have a segmental disease, if, we, if you have a big segment of the RT, you have to do something else. Uh, what do you call segmental disease? Well, the, when there is a defect that uh, damages more than a quarter of the vessel circumference or the same distance on length. Uh, that, that that was a segmental for us. In that regard, you have to have another solution. So intracranial stenting is one solution and the flow diversion is the best solution for that. So we start early with stenting in Argentina. That was my first case, three o'clock in the morning, of course, physician that bleeds from that dissecting pica aneurysm. I tried to put coils, I couldn't. I tried to occlude the contralateral vert, vert was very small. So, uh, I was working with cardiologists uh, in the next room. So I asked them, what kind of stent do you have? Blah, blah, blah. And they come and, and show me the balloon expandable need to know stand. It's called angio stent. So we went ahead and put that stent in the patient uh, and we filled the, the analysis with coiling. And this is a follow-up showing complete, uh, complete uh, so, uh, remodeling of the artery. So using stent, we make more of those untreatable analysis from the endovascular point of view potentially treatable and treatable. And that was back in 2009. The first stent that we used were, were a balloon expandable stent. And we used like a scaffold concept. We used them to went through uh, to interstitials uh, as, as we did. This is a scaffold. This is the AV INX, very old one. Maybe some of you have, uh, have used that. Uh, and through these stents, we were able to treat that physician again. They, they call them a loco. Uh, the crazy man because he was uh, he, the behavior was was not very very proper and he has that mask uh, and this is four year follow up showing uh, the, the good solution for that particular case you see the how the edema went away uh, in 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 that case so branch of neurovascular stains come out of there uh, the, the first was the neuroform the enterprise a uh, lot of them are Ave express and and solitaire we were still looking we are still looking for ideal stand. We still don't have an ideal stand. 
But what happened at that time, we, we thought, well, what happened if you overlap stents? Instead of having only one, maybe we, we can overlap two of them. So that was the born of the first generation of, of, of flow diversion, telescopic stent, multiple device that you can overlap or telescope them. And there was the first case that we did, two neuroforms, P1 dissecting aneurys. Uh, so two, two stents, stent in stent technique, and this is a three by 20, three by 15. And this is a eight month follow up showing a complete disappearance of, of, of the of the aneurysm, what the dissecting aneurysm. So that was the beginning, our own our own stance. But you know, with the time being, uh, there, there was a lot of, of, of stance. So what is the goal of of of, uh, of the flow diversion treatment on aneurysm? Just to exclude the aneurysm. We have to kill. We have to exclude the aneurysm. We have to do a positive remodeling of the artery. How we can do that? Well, we have to allow thromb thrombus formation, uh, allow uh, development of endothelial cells at the level of the neck, and some collagen deposit and granulation. So that, that's the way. We have to build a new segmental uh, artery instead of, of, of disease, disease segmental. So I like more the word flow modulation than, than, uh, than the flow diversion. You know, we can, we can use uh, uh, water uh, to modulate the flow to the font, eh? The same, the same thing we can do in the brain. Uh, this is the case with the lady with the four aneurysms in one single segment. You see the the the, the proximal one, the proximal one is, is at the level of the ophthalmic. The, the ophthalmic artery arise from the neck. So what happened over the time? This is nine month follow up. This is the contralateral contralateral clip that was using in the contralateral aneurysm here. But in nine months, all of them went away. The only one that's still there is the one that has the ophthalmic coming from the neck, of course. Uh, so, but with the time being, we make a channel inside. We have a thrombus distally, and we, we make a channel in, inside of the aneurysm. And this, you look at what happened in three, three years and six years, you know, the shrinkage of the, of the aneurysm over the time. So we modulate the flow. We, we give time to the thrombus to be exclude the, uh, the aneurysm from the circulatory. And also we make hemodynamic changes in the artery this is, this is an example, huge aneurysm, that's be before and this is after. You see, uh, the, here, nine months, the anterior communicator was taking over for the contralateral size, but the three years, uh, it came back again. So we make those, those changes. I borrowed that uh, slide from, from AJ. Uh, that shows very nice what happened in the last probably 20 years in our experience. A lot of... Uh, visualization improvements now we see much better we see inside of the animals from the endovascular point of view but also a lot of new tools uh bioinformatic came to our help as well as the, a lot of research so this is the way that we see now inside the combine show us where is the device which is a big big improvement it's like an endovascular microscope probably um we got the help from the cpd guys this is a, a Juan Sebral from Mason, he'll, he'll help us a lot to understand uh, the mechanism of growth, but also try to explain why after the treatment, some of those or, or, or those aneurysms rupture. So first of all, we have to take care of the patient. Forget about the devices. We, we I am not uh, a device man. I don't like to speak about the device. Speak about the patient. Uh, and after what kind of aneurysm, and after what kind of device. So I think this is very, very important. Flow diversion we're using for which aneurysm? For unruptured aneurysm. This is our first choice. Flow diversion for unruptured is the last resort for rupture aneurysm. And that, that has to be very clear. Um, so my journey and on very long introduction. So that was my journey. I start with the animal uh, preclinical and animal work in Buenos Aires in our lab back in 2005. We implanted the first, the first stent in the pigs. Uh, at that time, and after we have some rabbits. 2006, we uh, we have the privilege to, to do our first in men. We were part of the PETA study right after, and others, many, many studies. 2011, we report our first three cases of bleeding, uh, and that was reported in AGNR. This is, uh, this is the paper. So what were our indications? Segmental disease, segmental disease, or, or dissecting aneurysms, fusiform aneurysms, large and giants, we call them complex. So today we are approaching more than 3,000 uh, aneurysms treated in Buenos Aires, this is the old slide. Uh, and we have five generations. The first one that I spoke already to you, 
telescope stand and the last generation with the surface treatment, which I think is a big thing to have because we implant to the patient the second disease. We implant antiplatelet drugs in, 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 a, in a case where it can bleed. So it's, it's something that we have to pay attention. It has to be probably the sixth, the sixth generation is coming. We have to speed up the endotelization. This is very important. Uh, with the time being, we, we learn the good, but also learn the bad things that we had hemorrhagic complication and we have to thromboembolic complication. Uh, so we'll be back on, the, on that. But we learned that we were safe. Our, our morbid mortality rate in every single in every single registry or RCT trial is less than 6%. The, and the efficacy, I must tell you, is very high, more than 90%, which was very, were very unusual for coilings. And we had today, you know, we have a long-term follow-up. I will show you some of the cases more than 10 years. So in the beginning, we were very proximal. We were using multiple devices, as was was uh, um, there was the choice the Kim at that time. Uh, with the time being, we went more distal. Uh, we prefer one single device. This was our first paper in, in neurosurgery back in 2009. Uh, and after that, we did a registry that we just published about the 1,000 aneurysm. Um, I think that uh, that uh, registry has probably will have a place between those uh, those all, all those uh, RCT also uh, like Premier like uh, uh, Safe like Pita and Path especially the Path. Um, the Premier comes to our help. They have not only uh, the immediate result but also the one year and three year follow up. Ricardo did a fantastic job on that. In our series, in our series, one third of our series. Uh, are large and giant tunnels, more than 35%. Our more mortality rate is very close to very close to uh, uh, PAF, uh, is 5.8%. And all cause mortality, our is 4.6, a little bit higher than, than PAF. Uh, so I think, and with that series and with, with the RCD that we have, we show that, that, uh, that the endovascular treatment with the flow diversion in intracranial aneurysm was safe and effective. Let's, let's have a look on some, some of the cases. Probably you are interested in a long-term follow-up. So this is the first case that we did. That's where the AVM and, and large channel that was called elsewhere and sent it back to us. So we did both. We did AVMs and, and we did the aneurysms with flow diversion. This is six-year follow-up showing nice remodeling of, 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 of the artery. And, and if you see in the lateral view, it's like a... a is a new artery is there, you know? The, the mass of coil is far behind in, in the deep and, and the patient did very, very well. And we saw very nice correlation between image, like in this case, and, and the clinical correlation, and also this disappearance, some of those, uh, those, those lesions, like in, the, in that uh, ladies in two years. With the time we, we went more distal, this is one example, the, the giant ACOM that I went from A1 in the right to A2 on the left. And this is, uh, I released the mass effect. You see, for those that did a lot of angiography, you see the 10 effect, you see the massive mass effect, uh, both A1. Uh, you see in seven years how it diminished that, that effect. And it correlates very nicely, not only with the image of, of the device, which also changed in shape, uh, like in that particular case. And more, more, more and more with it, uh, complex aneurysms like this one. This is a giant with a lot of mass effect, uh, pressing and anterior communication. There was no flow from the left side. There was no left side. I tried to recognize with the wall center, I couldn't, the left side. So we decided to went ahead and, and find the exit, which is the major limitation. Sometimes you have to have use several techniques like balloon remodeling, you have anchoring your stand distally and straight everything right after. Uh, so I was lucky, I, I succeeded. We, I, we went to contralateral M1 and to contralateral A2 with two, 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 two microcatheters, two wires, and we were able to, to deploy, and this is formal follow-up after we deployed three, three devices, three pipeline. And this is one year follow-up uh, showing uh, positive uh, results as well as the MRI. So with the time being, during those 18 years, we got more and more clinical experience, a lot of improvements on delivery system, uh, more lengths available. Today we have 50, we have 60 millimeters in length. So instead of putting three or four, five, six uh, flow diverter, we're using one uh, for those long 
cases, and we have a, a surface coating and smaller device for smaller artery. So what is our problem today? Well, to choose. Sometimes it's very difficult to choose, but we have to have all the options with us and, and choose right, right after. So pipeline surpass, P64 for, 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 for uh, Bal has a fantastic Vista baby for small aneurysm. Uh, remember, Cloud diversion is for sidewall aneurysm, but uh, in some in some cases we use for for bifurcation, like in this one that I will show you. There was a rupture that we coil and recanalize, so we inserted uh, uh, after uh, we we insert first coils and after flow diversion. This is two years follow up, showing nice. Uh, and this is another one uh, and with a shallow uh, MCA bifurcation on the right that we just crossing one one device. Uh, this is. Uh, this is one year follow-up showing the disappearance of the lesion. But remember, this is not my first election. This is for flow diversion, for side wall aneurysm, it's not for bifurcation, at least in my experience. Bleeding case, and when we're using, uh, 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 again, this is not the first, flow diversion should be not used for bleeding cases. This is very important. I'm only use what I have, no other option. Blister light is a clear example for that. Uh, some other options. Uh, this is a this is a, a lady uh, that she bled twice. They coil uh, and she bled again. They coil and she bled again. So at the very end, they send it us in the third bleeding. After the third bleeding, she developed a, a very strong vasospasm. Uh, this is the old uh, double balloon technique. Remember to increase to increase the perfusion. Unfortunately, we don't have the, we don't have that more that balloon. But in that particular case, we went very good very good job. She was very ill. And, and she recovered right after. I was I was able to deploy an, uh, uh, a stent, a flow diverter here. You see what happened after 14 months of follow-ups, this appearance of, of the lesion, and she recovered very, very well. Uh, so we, we were looking for solution in Buenos Aires. We have to find some solution, especially we have a big problem in Argentina. Uh, so we, we are uh, we, we are trying to we, we are trying to to find another another president. Uh, so we are a very pro Messi pro president. Uh, posterior circulation. Well, uh, we have some some of these cases treated. I think the the chromo cobaltum is a fantastic uh, is a fantastic uh, flow diverter for posterior circulation. I'll show you one of the cases that we treat uh, uh, with AJ in Buenos Aires. This is a surpass. Uh, only one only one device. You see a long device. Three months, fourteen and twenty. I shut off the contralateral, uh, the contralateral uh, vertebral, and I put those patients under heparin for one year because there is a lot, as you know, as we know, there is a lot of perforator in the in this area. So smaller device. This is the first amendment that we did for Fred Junior in Buenos Aires. I recognize uh, P1 and basilar tip. Uh, this is uh, eleven month follow up, and this is the sm very small. P48 that goes to the 21 made by, by Phenox. It's a German, used to be a German company, now it's a Chinese company. Uh, this is very, this, this is unfortunately, this is, a, <laughs> I wish they copied good things, not the bad things. But uh, so this is a, a one year follow up on that particular case. This is another one. Uh, you have very, very sharp at the level of this is a pica. You have to be at, at the level, at the edge of the artery, which is sometimes is. As you know, it's very difficult to accomplish. And this is the beauty. This is the smallest that we have that goes to the, the uh, SL10 or any, any 10 catheters. Uh, sick Vista baby, this is a uh, ACOM one. We choose, we try to do H, but we ended up with the, with the X technique. And this is the six month follow up in that particular case. Uh, some, you have to be flexible. If something doesn't work, you have to change very fast. Uh, this is, that, that was the, the giant, uh, Right, giant supraclavian animals that we, we were half an hour to find an exit. We find an exit 360. Uh, we couldn't we couldn't deploy the original stent that we planted. So we 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 came and we brought uh, the second second device surpass with a lot of of strength, uh, the chromo cobaltum, uh, and we were able to de to deploy as as you can see there very nicely. Uh, and this is uh, the follow up. Even with this, those difficult cases where there is no neck, there is a really a segmental disease. So you have to be flexible, have everything with you in, in the room. I think this is important. Flow, flow disruptors, I mean, intrasacular flow diversion uh, is another name. 
Uh, we were very early in Buenos Aires, 2009, we did the first three cases. That was a very rigid device. Uh, it turned out that this is an advantage, not a disadvantage. Today, the web and all the devices are very soft, and there is a lot of recanalization, as you will learn over the time. Uh, so this is the first case, three cases that we did with a, with a single layer device back in 2009. I will show you two years follow up on that and that particular first generation. There is no recanalization, but that was very strong device. It was very difficult to get into the aneurysm because we were looking with the 27 catheters inside in a small aneurysm and, and also uh, was not very soft. Uh, the contour is much, much softer. Of course, it's a half of the diverter. Uh, we, we, we did our first case 2016, and this is the 15 months of follow up, showing very nice. The key here is have the metal inside of the artery. You have to drop the, the junction at the level of the artery. So you will have very nice lateral uh, force in both sides of, of the annulus. Uh, the P60, the specific fix for uh, is it was a mechanical detachment, and they improve a lot. Uh, they, they have now a, a surface treatment, treatment with HPC, but they have very very unique thing. I mean, the wire which is inside is in that independent wire. So once you open up the device, you are able to hold the wire. The wire, the wire will not go in front. That's happened with all, all of the others, and sometimes can can blade the patients. So. That's that's very interesting feature. Uh, fortunately for us, I mean, uh, uh, the, those big companies buying smaller and, and after all the scams. But you know, uh, even though uh, we have always some improvement for us and for the patients with the with the with the those those companies. Uh, the last improvement that uh, I think we had is a surface coating. Uh, we have a shield and we have HPC. I don't have experience with Derivo. I don't have experience with the CD. Day one, and I had experience with the multi layer cardiatis. Unfortunately, that company now is out of the business. Uh, so, Ma Matthew Group showed very nicely that phosphorin coline, that, uh, that the surface treatment for pipeline, uh, are associated with less thrombus formation on the surface of the device. I think that was, was the first proof that we have on that. We have experience, we have more than 200 cases with the shield. Uh, if you look in, in complication rates, uh, drops dramatically uh, in the in the subgroup of the shield if you compare if you compare against the the regular uh, the regular series of pediatrics. And when we were using that, well, this is one of the cases that, as Dr. Johnson mentioned, early Danlos syndrome. That was the lady referral for to us from from uh, Thailand. Uh, so the, I use I think I don't remember. I think I use something like a nine nine device. I, I start from distal supraclinal from the cavernous sinus back down to the bifur bifurcation. And this is one year follow up. Uh, she has a disease and all the family uh, has, has the same disease. So it's, we, we follow them very, very close. Uh, the second choice for the shield in, in our experience, the blister light. This is the typical case that bled. And we we will call, uh, we did the second angio. You see how, how this partial reabsor reabsorption of the hematomatic part. So we, we implant three, three shields and we put coils and this is the follow-up MRI three months and, and MRI A and also uh, six months uh, follow-ups DSA showing um, the positive remodeling of the artery. Of course, there are new new devices coming in. This is the first case that we have the opportunity to use Vantage. Uh, the, that patient was uh, was in a very bad situation with referral from Paraguay at that time left giant, sorry, right uh, giant MCA that was treated with the P P48 and a bacillar that was treated with Tuvantage. So this is the this is the, the Phenox and this is the Vantage, Tuvantage. I was very short. I have only two Vantage, unfortunately. I was short. I, I couldn't treat the more proximal lesion. You see what happened immediately post-treatment. Everything was like, looks very well. But, you know, if you follow those patients, six month follow-up, very nice remodeling of, of the portion of the artery where the vantage is, but it's nothing proximal because I was very short. I didn't have enough time and I, I, I didn't succeed to bring the patient back, even though he improved a lot. As you can see, you know, you see the life different if you are prostrated or if you are sitting. Uh, no, so that was a big, big difference for him, but we didn't succeed to bring him back. Uh, HPC from, 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 uh, 
from Phenox. This was a diff very difficult case. Uh, very difficult to find an aneurysm, probably, no? Maybe you can see in the late phase, very small one. So we were able to deliver a small uh, T by 15 uh, with tirofiban. You see one week, still the aneurysm is filling there. Uh, a six month follow up is nothing. Uh, with the combing, with the 3D, and the, the trunk, uh, the brainstem is intact. So pay attention to the, so choose, make your strategy. We are not using clopidogrel anymore. For me, there is no reason to use uh, a drug that doesn't work in one of the four cases. So we switched many years ago for, for prasugrel. Are we using prasugrel? We adjust the doses uh, depending of the age of the patient. If the patient has more than 75 years or less than 60 kilos, we are we're using only five milligrams daily instead of, of 10. Uh, the aspirin, we have done some of the cases, um, but you know, it doesn't work. Works maybe like a mono integration works only 50% of the cases. And my experience, why? Well, uh, the aspirin is impaired by, by subarachnoid bleeding, by intraparenchymatous bleeding, by any inflammation. So uh, you need to, would I, when well, I'm using mono aggregation, I'm using only parasugrel. Um, so what, we have a lot of limitations of our technique, the access uh, and, and other ones. I just want to, I know I have to finish, <laughs> but I just want to show my complications, which are, are important. Uh, so what are the complications? First of all, you have to learn. And this for learn is very important if the young generation went to the Maxim Shapiro web, the banana, I think is very nice because we blame the devices. And sometimes the device is not the problem, it's our technique, you know? So, so the, the stretching is one of the problems. Uh, I recommend you be in the wine, uh, in the wine glass, uh, like our Malbec from Mendoza. Instead of having, uh, instead of having martini glass, in martini glass, you have too much load. And, and champagne flower, you, you have li very little load. So it better be in the center, in the center of everything. Remember, no little, no much, much load. I think this is important. Other thing is when we fail with cloud diverter, we fail when there is an adequate annulus coverage. Uh, and that always related to the mal, to the bad apposition, not mal apposition, but bad apposition. Or you have a branch that coming off from the neck. A typical example is the PCA. Uh, Bad deformation, look for those brain deformation that was re recently uh, sent to the press by filler. I think the for short and pay attention when you finish, uh, pay attention to the convincity. Look for, for short and look for hump or fish mounting. You know, sometimes you have to work with the wire or you have to do angioplasty right after. This is one of the cases that we failed. Why we failed? Because it was a laser cutted nitinol stand before there. So we, we had very bad position. We coil. We stented, we did a first uh, one flow diversion, the second flow diversion, uh, and still there's some feeling in, inside of the nerves because, because the bad opposition. Jailing is another problem. You know, we jail a anterior choroidal, we jail posterior circulation, but once in a while you have a problem. Again, this was a nevrophone that was deployed before with coils. Uh, we, make, uh, we, we implant a flow diversion after, and uh, we have a, a small contained infarct, which is a big infarct for the patient. Was a disaster for the patient. Well, the question is why they bled after flow delivery it has been traced by, by Professor Wakalo. I think there are more than one factor, hemodynamic, and, 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 and I'll show you only one case. It was very dramatic and acute. We were doing a case and the patient bled. Uh, and this is, the, this is the case. I hope the video will work. I want to scare you a little bit, guys. Uh, so this is very... Uh, very bad in, in AP view and, and the lateral view. And I think we dissected uh, in, with our catheter, we dissected uh, the wall of, of the annulus was, was immediately was in, in, in the bed. Uh, uh, another question, what do you do? Are you using coils or no? In my practice, I use an MRI. If I have slimming of, of the wall, I'm using coil. But if there is no slimming, I am not using coils. And, and, that, and the last thing that I have to you, I strongly recommend, please, pay attention to hypertension. The hypertension is not only important for formation and the growth, but also for the rupture of the aneurysm. So we have developed a, a, special, a, a special protocol our cardiologists uh, did for, for manage those cases. So we're still searching for, uh, for, uh, for flow diverter. I hope will be uh, more ideas after, after uh, those talks. Uh, there are many, many things. 
people from Calgary coming are uh, working on bioabsorbable flow diverter, which I think uh, is fantastic. So just to to resume, my journey was fantastic. I uh, was a rewarding experience for me, for our team in Buenos Aires, for our fellows. Uh, of course, once you learn, it's, it's a lot of fun. Less radiation for you and for the patient, which is very important. So the procedure is is, is faster and you cure more than 90% of the people, uh, which is I, I think is, is, is important. Uh, I, I'm very grateful to all the fathers of neuroradiology and especially all those people that, like AJ, contribute during those 18 years to develop more and more flow diversity. I'm very grateful to Matt and Kim, Aaron, all of them. They help me a lot. They teach me a lot. And I learned a little bit. So thank you. Thank you. We have to, there is more tasks to do. I mean, we have to understand better biology. We are missing biology here. We are very good, thanks to Matt, to AJ's in, in mathematics and engineering, but we are missing biology here. So we, we must put a stress on that. I remember sometimes you have to change uh, to have a better, better results. Thank you. This is, uh, this is my last time for my people in Buenos Aires. Uh, they do the work. I am just traveling and giving lectures. Thank, thank you very much. Fantastic, Pedro. Uh, I know we're running a little bit late, but I cannot go through this talk and not have some questions. Uh, I, I knew AJ was going to raise his hand, so he was itching to talk. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you for all your contributions. You are a legend. And for the journey you started when you were probably in kindergarten, you are still continuing that. And I adore your strength and your stamina. Two quick questions. One, is Argentina going to beat Brazil again? I'm sorry. He invited me, so don't say anything bad. Okay. The second thing is, when you see after your follow-up a year, some remodeling happening, the aneurysm is not completely gone. When do you retreat a patient? What do you tell to the patients as far as the cure of the aneurysm and activity is concerned? Well, very good questions. Um, yeah, the first question is very easy. We will try our best. We know they are very good on football, so we, we, are, we have our concerns. We were very lucky in Qatar. Unfortunately, I was not there, but I sent my Brazilian uh, friends uh, to be there. Thank you. Thank you for support us, guys. Uh, so this is the first, the first thing. The second thing, I think this is one of the problems that we have, AJ. We have to speed up. Uh, after you know, 18 years, we need something better to offer to the patients, not only to wait and see. I mean, because basically we are telling them, okay, uh, it's sometimes between three and six months, we'll be healing uh, of the analysis, everything will be okay. But we fail some 10% probably of the cases we fail. So we have to look for something better for that. Uh, in that regards, we are, there are some things in the pipe that will help that to be more certain about that. To give, I am really concerned about that because, you know, some, sometimes those giants that we, we, we put three or four or six, uh, six, uh, six flow diverter after a while, they increase in size and they have more mass effect. So really I'm very, we need, we need to have something better for, especially for those we, they call complex aneurysms. Complex means very difficult to treat, either by surgery or by, by endovascular, uh, difficult to treat. So we, we, we are working, in, there are several groups that are working on that. I think, uh, I think we have to, the other thing that probably will help is to know much more about the wall. I mean, the, the OCT, uh, it, it will come in our help on, the, on that regards. Um, there were all, other solutions, you know, like a thin film, nighting all around, and they tend to speed up, the, to speed up. I have some experience with that, still work in progress. Uh, but nice thing about that, you know, there was a lot of innovation. I'm going back and probably there are more, more things. Not only innovation in devices, bigger, bigger hall, for strokes or, or in catheters or different coils or different material, but also in concept. So we need, after 18 years, we need to change our mind about that. It was fantastic, it was very good, like coil. You know, after 30 years, we learned that you have to change. 
Uh, so now it's time to change for that. Thank you, Pedro. Uh, last question. Hey, Professor Lilik, thank you so much for your visit here. So uh, I have two quick questions. So I didn't hear properly. What, uh, uh, when do you decide to put coils or not for, um, for large aneurysm? Yes, uh, I was, was, was something erratic in our, and now we are doing MRI and with, with, with contrast in every single case. If we have, if we see wall enhancement, we always coil it. If we don't, we don't see wall enhancement. If there is no slimming on, on, on the wall, we are not using, we are not using coil. We're using, why? Because even with coils, we have bleedings. Uh, so we actually, I pay more attention to the hypertension to control the tension or the pay, those patients stay three days in ICU because we, we want to have very clear uh, control of the, of, the, uh, of the pressure of those, those patients. And all of them are under protocol. Our, our cardiologists are very severe on that uh, because we found a correlation of hypertension and the rupture of those complex cases. Yeah, thank you. And and my other one is a bit more philosophical. I mean, you've seen the field evolving from you know all those years. What is the uh, changes that got you the more excited over the years? Uh, well, you know, this uh, as you said, this is a more philosophical. I am very excited today to understand much the wall, the wall in in aneurys, but also in a new concept. We are crossing, we are crossing fronters now. We are going to CSF. We're going to the venous side. I think we we need that that direction. Also, to, I I envision that will be a lot of uh, of treatment delivery by endovascular inside of the brain. You know, inside of the CSF. And I I think uh, Matthew probably will have some insight of that. But I I am really interested in a new concept more than more than uh, uh, try to to have better device. It's not only device that was device driven. Uh, our experience, what even innovation. Now, now we are switching gears. We are going for concepts, new concept. I think this is the way. Thank you, Pedro. You know we can be talking here all day long about this. We have a lot. Of, we have a lot of passion and a lot of science in the room. But your answer was perfect segue to the next. Um, uh, per request of our of one of our honorary members, Matt. Matt suggests instead of me talking about animals, let's get Vanya to talk about drug delivery into the brain. So uh, Pedro talk about excitement and uh, this ties uh, uh, Pedro's talk to AJ's talk that will come next. So uh, Vanya, uh, I I'm sorry, I'm not going to try to pronounce your last name uh, because uh, I'll be very unfair to you and your family. Thank you for being here and uh, please, please, drug delivery to the brain. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Um, thank you, Ricardo, for giving me the opportunity. I think the microphone is off. And hold on a sec. You knock on that for us. Here we go. Now we're on. So I have to say that this is not a very good position spot for me because I have to speak after Professor Lilik and before Professor Waklu. That makes it, you know, a bit difficult. So I'm going to be talking about how we can combine concepts and ideas um, that are established with new technology. And specifically, I'll be talking about drug delivery to the CSF space and the brain as well as um, imaging of the CSF space and, and what's new regarding that. So these are not my disclosures, these are Matt's. So, <laughs> so we know that drug delivery to the brain um, has challenges because of the protective blood brain barrier. And there are drugs and large molecules that cannot cross that barrier. So current methods of administration that bypass or cross the blood-brain barrier 
involve invasive delivery or have um, biodistribution that it's not so favorable. Um, lately, viral vectors have emerged and these are an excellent um, way to deliver gene therapy for different types of disease, but the blood-brain barrier still remains a problem. To overcome that, um, some viral serotypes with enhanced um, CNS tropism and capsids, um, which can cross the blood-brain barrier have been developed. And also there's the idea of directly delivering to the central nervous system through intrathecal or intracranial routes. But for that, we need to develop adequate and safe delivery techniques. So currently, the routes that we have are through the veins, the intravenous, but that demands high dose of viral vector, which increases the cost. Um, you can have adverse effects because the um, gene therapy is uh, expressed more in off-target tissues. We have the intraparenchymal route, which is rather invasive and can cause injury. And we also have um, the direct administration into the CSF space. And um, up to now, we can do that through the ventricular system, through the cisterna magna, and intrathecal. But there are some complications that come with these procedures, and also the transduction of the therapy in deep brain structures is rather low. But we can't bypass the blood-brain barrier. So what if we could find a way to safely and minimally invasively access some CSF space and potentially increase the effectiveness of the treatment. So I will be talking about the sternomagna mostly and the CPA angle. Um, we know that sternomagna, direct sternomagna delivery of viral vectors can bypass the blood brain, brain barrier and can improve delivery to target brain tissue, but the risk profile is not very good. Um, you can injure the medulla. You can also have leak of therapeutics from the needle that it's positioned inside the cisterna magna. And also it's not really clinically used anymore. Um, people, I don't think that people are trained for that procedure anymore. So in the past, a few years ago in the lab, um, an interesting technique was developed um, where you can catheterize the cisterna magna um, through a lumbal puncture using a microcatheter. And the technique at the time was used to treat um, babies, children with tie sex disease. I was not part of that project. Matt Gunis was one of the leading members of the team that made this um, effort a reality. And after a lot of preclinical testing, um, the method was brought to clinical practice. And Dr. Ajit Puri, um, who is the head of the neurointerventional department at UMass, performed this procedure to a baby. Um, so you see here on the left, there's a access of the fecal sac through a lumbar puncture, and then there is um, navigation of a microcatheter up to the cisterna magna. And then the relevant viral uh, vector, the relevant gene therapy was delivered through the microcatheter directly into the cisterna magna. Um, now we have some novel endovascular technology, which gives us the opportunity to access the CPA cistern. The technology was initially developed uh, with the goal of treating hydrocephalus, and I believe Professor Lilik is going to give a talk on that later. Um, the device is called Ishant and you can deliver it through a percutaneous route, through the veins. So it's a catheter system, which um, will leave an implant into the CPA cistern, and you can um, you go through the femoral vein, you reach the in internal jugular vein, then the inferior petrosal sinus, and the system pierces the dura uh, and the wall of the, of the vein, and then you can reach the CPA cistern. It can be used to drain, um, CSF, of course, and it can also be used to administer 
therapeutics. So it might potentially resolve the challenge of safely delivering um, clinical therapies, usual therapies to the brain. Here's a schematic of, of, the, of the system. And on the right-hand side, you see a 3D reconstruction where you can appreciate the position of the sterna magna and the position of the um, CPA cistern. So we made a hypothesis. Um, and we said, um, how about we compare um, CPA injection to cisterna magna injection using a microcatheter-based technique and uh, see if we can improve the biodistribution uh, in the CPA cistern, since it's a space which has a lot of vasculature and maybe arteries that pass through there can deliver um, the therapies more effectively to the brain tissue. So the CPA is located closer to the basal cisterns and closer to important brain areas. As I said, it's a vasculature rich area while the sterna magna is more inferiorly located and it's rather vasculature poor. We used an intrathecal um, axis um, in the ovine model um, from the lumbosacral um, area. And then we advanced in a microcatheter, an SL10 microcatheter through the puncture needle. We navigated with fluoroscopy up to the cisterna magna or the CPA cistern. When needed, we used the microwire as well. Then the position of the microcatheter was confirmed using um, cone beam CT, MRI, and uh, DSA. And then we were also able to fuse the CT images with the MRI images to make sure that the position of the microcatheter was where we wanted it to be. And when that was achieved, we infused the viral vector. So here again, it's a schematic. The sheep was positioned on a prone position on the angio table. We punctured, we navigated, and we injected the vector. And here we see on the left-hand side, the needle, then the wire and catheter going through the needle um, and navigating higher up into the CPA cistern. And here we see in the circle, the tip, I don't know if you can see it, the tip of the microcatheter, it's medial to the temporal bone. And that was our um, landmark. That's what we used when we navigated mostly um, with fluoroscopy. Here we have um, reconstructed um, images in different planes from the cone beam CT we did. And we can see again, the tip of the microcatheter and the location. Here's a 3D reconstruction we, where again, we see the tip of the microcatheter. And then we also injected uh, contrast um, to see the distribution of the contrast. So here's an example of a, an injection done in the right CPA cistern. The sheep is in a prone position, so the image is inverted. And we see how the contrast uh, nicely distributes inside the cistern, but also around the brainstem, it bathes the brainstem and goes anteriorly as well. And we can see the cast of the vessels, the cast of the basal artery and the branches. And here's another example, uh, injection from the left side. And again, we see the same um, type of distribution of the contrast. And if we look at the lateral view, we see the contrast pulling in front of the brainstem. Um, Images um, after contrast injection, um, cone beam CT again, MIPT images, we can appreciate nicely the distribution of the contrast. It's um, covering most of the CPA angle. And again, it's um, bathing the brainstem. And if we fuse CT and MR, we can um, even better appreciate the location of our microcatheter and the contrast um, distribution in regards to the specific brain, brain structures. If we compare the location of the cistern between species, um, we see that there's um, a lot of similarity. The uh, little asterisk 
the yellow one shows the location in human sheep and non-human primate. So in total, we injected eight sheep with a vector at very low rates. We did four um, sheep um, for the CPA and four for the cisterna magna. And after three weeks, we sacrificed the animals and we took sections of the brain and the cord and then immunochemistry was performed um, for the qualitative assessment of the biodistribution. And then uh, qPCR was performed for the quantitative assessment of the biodistribution. And uh, what we saw was um, that delivery through the CPA um, resulted in broad transduction of cells in the brain. We had extensive transduction um, throughout the brain and um, mostly at the um, motor and parietal cortices, the thalamus, the cingulate gyrus, the gray matter close to the corpus callosum and the cerebellum. And um, these regions were comparable to the CM, uh, sternomagna infusion. Uh, we saw that the striatum had um, a bit of higher expression from the CPA injection compared to the Cerna Magna. And um, regarding the vector quantification, um, we saw that there was equivalent biodistribution between the two different sites of injection in the frontal, parietal, and temporal cortex. Uh, we saw a 260% increase of uh, vector expression in the parietal cortex in the CPA um, cohort, but that was not statistically significant. Um, animals also showed a 30% increase in uh, mean vector genomes inside the thalamus when compared to the sterna magna. The occipital lobe was the only region that showed um, higher uh, biodistribution with the sterna magna injection and uh, the midbrain and striatum were comparable. When we analyzed for laterality, we saw no differences between sides. Um, the ipsilateral tissue trended towards higher vector genomes in most of the brain regions. And the only exceptions were the frontal and temporal lobes. We saw a modest biodistribution to liver tissue with uh, both sides of injection. Uh, the, uh, overall, the CPA delivery resulted in clear transduction of the brain cells, very similar to the sternomagna injections. In the cortical regions, thalamus, cerebellum, and cingulate gyrus, both techniques were equivalent. And uh, although cranial spinal cord regions demonstrated similar transductions, the lower motor neurons um, were more heavily stained in the CPA cohort. So compared to delivery via, uh, through the cisterna magna, administrating direct into the CPA cistern um, showed a very good broad biodistribution of the viral vector um, in the cortex, the cerebellum, and the spinal cord. So this approach could be useful in treating disorders that could benefit from gene, gene delivery to the brain by bypassing the blood-brain barrier. And in light of the favorable safety profile that we've seen in uh, the clinical practice with the eShunt in catheterization of the CPA, percutaneous endovascular injection into the CPA system may provide clinically safer, minimally invasive method of accessing the brain for delivery of gene therapies and other therapeutics. Now, I would like to um, take a few minutes and talk also a little bit about imaging of the CSF space because understanding drug delivery, um, in order to understand drug delivery, we have to understand how the CSF um, moves and how the CSF space works. And I think that we don't know that much about that yet. So up to now, there was no way to really image the CSF space. The available modalities that we have um, didn't have the resolution, but now um, we're able to do that. So lately, a OCT probe, which is 
dedicated for neurovascular procedures has been developed and it has given us the opportunity to navigate inside um, the vessels, the intracranial vessels, and um, take a look at um, the artery, um, possible devices that we implant, but it has given us the opportunity as well to take a look outside uh, the vessels and inside um, the environment, the perivascular envir environment. So we cannot, not only can we see 2D images of the space and the architecture and all the elements, but we are able to produce 3D reconstructions of the perivascular environment. Um, we are also able using this modality to do dynamic imaging. Um, so by positioning the probe in a desired location, we are able in vivo to monitor what is happening exactly what is happening um, inside the subarachnoid space. This is an example of a, a dog that we did in the lab where we placed two overlapping flow diverters in the basilar artery. Uh, we had no issues during the procedure and on the uh, imaging that we usually do, DSA and MRI, we had no signs of a subarachnoid bleed. But if you look at this OCT, you see that there's a lot of haziness around the basilar artery and branches. And that um, uh, gave us the, the thought that maybe this animal had an occult, a small subarachnoid bleed, which was not seen actually with um, the other imaging modalities. And OCD is very sensitive to red blood cells. Um, and last but not least, I would like to say that we are able to also seed the subarachnoid space with particles. And maybe that can give us some insight on CSF dynamics and CSF flow. Here we have um, used um, very diluted blood and then we injected uh, that into the fecal, um, to the spinal canal through a lumbar puncture, and we're able to see how the red blood cells are moving. And if we right. implement uh, additional methods, like um, here, for example, we have a particle image uh, velocimetry analysis. We can gather information about velocity and direction of, of particle movement. Um, so I think the opportunities are a lot. There's a lot to learn. And thank you very much. Thank you, Vanna. Uh, fascinating. Uh, when you describe CPA puncture, you're trying just putting oh, the needle, not putting any catheter there, right? Just a needle yeah. puncture, or you are leaving a catheter behind after you puncture for your CP angle injections versus cisterna magnet. So now for both locations, we, instead of accessing, like in the experiments that we performed, we accessed more distally somewhere from the spinal canal. And then we navigated the microcatheter there. There was no direct access of any of the two locations. And after we navigated the microcatheter, we released the, the vector, the viral, viral vector in each location. So microcatheter from the lumbar to yes. the CP angle. Yes. But the concept behind the e-shunt would be to leave it behind. And instead of having it, you know, the catheter and the jugular would be to extend it down to the subclavia and have a port. And now for gene therapy, it doesn't really make a lot of sense, right? We just did gene therapy because we have access to vectors and we can track the biodistribution. The real power is in ASOs, antisensible oligonucleides, and um, also siRNA therapies. So for example, Biogen has a treatment for SMA. It requires reinjection in the lumbar space every three months. So you can imagine it's an anesthesia procedure. These kids are spastic. Um, and, and by the way, poking every three months, you eventually get scarring. So the idea here is repeated administration through a subclavian port in an office. You know, 
Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Prashant, uh, our next speaker is uh, doesn't need introduction. He's been with us uh, coming here, I think, pretty much every year for the last 10 years. So thank you for your presence again, uh, Professor Waklu. Uh, what is exciting for us is that uh, uh, the field is still so young that uh, Dr. Lilik earlier, Dr. Waklu, are really the, uh, the father, uh, soon maybe we could call them the grandfather of neuroradiology. Uh, <laughs> so thank you again for being here. Instead of, since AJ is prepared, so instead of calling them grandpa, we're going to call the Pope and Maestro. <laughs> but you, you'll read as it should. <laughs> I don't feel insulted, to be honest. I still I run my miles. So, so first of all, I want to thank you all for attending this meeting. And what you hear is really, I mean, Vanya and Dr. Lilik gave presentation. They give normally in front of two, 3,000 people. So this is cutting edge technology, what you are hearing. I want to thank Eric for the brief introduction to save time, um, no, I'm making it between us. Uh, Ricardo, for putting uh, this meeting together with Eric and Nim Nima. Uh, I didn't see Nima this morning, but it's always fun to be here. So, so there were, um, there was a very famous interventionist who everybody knows in the room, who a few years wrote an article saying that we train too many fellows in our field. And I disagreed then. And I think that where the field is going, you heard from Vanya, a great presentation on the imaging side and vector delivery and drug delivery. And I truly believe that this field is just about to explode in different directions. You heard it from the structural heart disease from our cardiology colleagues. They went into electrophysiology. There are different divisions already, interventional cardiology, on and on and on. The same thing will happen today. We are putting through the femoral artery, artificial hearts into the left ventricle. It's a device. And same or similarly, we will move into the neuro field as well. So this provocative um, title, which was given to me, uh, by Dr. Hanel. He says, you can talk about anything, but he uh, he gave me this title. I have no idea about neurodegenerative diseases. Absolutely not. I'm going to specialize in Alzheimer's. Absolutely not. I may get it one day, but then I don't recall it anymore. But the bottom line is, the bottom line is that we understand the area very well. We know the surgical parts, the minimal and the imaging part. And there's a bunch of scientists and engineers who don't know that, but they need our help. So we should have our finger at the pulse what is happening. And I want to give you a small journey where I see this over the next 30, 40 years going. These are my disclosures. This was the last presentation I gave a few years ago about major improvements and advancement. It was on the hemorrhagic side, the chronic subdural, there was a lot of hype about it, the intracranial hemorrhage, aneurysm, single devices, and you saw from Dr. Lilik an amazing presentation. On the ischemic side, you heard the new drug, the new drugs that are coming, and a lot of hype about oxygen delivery. There are two major companies that are now uh, studying um, uh, in multi-center uh, trial, the use of oxygen delivery to basically expand the indication for a thrombectomy or thromboaspiration. And then you heard about the access to the CSF neuromodulation and pain therapy. Now, my wife is always tuned with me. She's a writer, but she reads much more than me. So every few weeks, I get something from her on the night table. And this is what she gave me. A recent article published March of 14th in The Guardian saying, and I'm reading it loud to you, numbers living with or dying from disorders such as stroke rises dramatically 
to 3.4 billion people, which is 43% of the global population. And this is critical. We are talking about more than 40% of the population will at certain point have some problems. Of course, it, it includes tension, headaches, migraines, and there will be a lot of discussion around migraine. How do we act on intractable migraines? It's a health issue. And alone in 2021, over 10 million people died from neurological disorders. Now, where should be the focus? Of course, prevention. Treatment will be our part and rehabilitation as well. And then long-term care is definitely our colleagues from neurology who are already doing something. But we are also working on that as well. So this is based on a study that were published from the Seattle group, the, the Global uh, Brain Disease Co Coalition and in Lancet Neurology just in March of this issue. And these are the diseases. I don't want to go through the details, but stroke is there, neurodegenerative disease, spinal cord, traumatic brain injury, Parkinson, autism, genetic diseases, on and on. So there will be an explosion where we will be involved at certain point and we have to be ready for that and not leave only to the basic scientists. Now, when you look, we are talking about healthcare industry and it's really now an industry where it's a food industry, healthcare industry, on and on. This is the projections from the business arm that big data, predictive health analytic contact tracking potential drug vaccine discovery will be leading, and then all other things where we are in our daily healthcare involved. So there will be enormous involvement from the business aspect in our society in this field. And this is the largest technology transformation in the history of the humanity. And you see what internet started, artificial, energy, artificial intelligence, robotics, genome sequencing, and blockchain technology. That's where we are spearheading. And you will see that. And you're already seeing that. Basque. So where did the journey start? Dr. Lilik, uh, and I am about probably two months apart from age, but we recall vividly when we started in the 80s to do the aneurysm and he showed very well, we had very limited tools, but this changed our field. Now we have a lot of devices on the aneurysm side starting in the early 90s until now, and they will keep improving, but that's not all. Today, this is the current OR reality. You have a stroke patient and you schlep all this machinery delaying the care. Now. How does Ridley see that? This is Ridley's Prometheus, how he sees the future of robotic surgery. You know all the scene, the alien, and I will not play the whole thing because it's cruel a little bit for the younger audience here. So, but this is, this is how the robotics, AI, and all the machinery will be working hand in hand with us. These were the prototypes. These are monstrous now. I was just recently, a few weeks ago, in Cambridge with Philips, and I've seen the new robotic systems. It will be surprising. In a year or two, we will have truly robotics. And when I look at these images of Anya and Matthew showed, they will be very helpful in the CSF space where it is about precision to, to basically navigate and help us. It's like with self-driving car. My son doesn't know stick shift. He doesn't care. He lives in New York City. He goes to Colombia, whatever he does. He takes the metro. He is comfortable. I'm comfortable with stick shift, but you have to learn and adapt. And that's what will happen with the robotic. This is a paper from uh, Toronto from Dr. Pereira, the early, early parts of the robotic, which didn't go very well, but it created the platform, the next generation. And I think that with losing skill and new technology, robotic would be an integral part of how we do medicine in future. There are some problems, of course, we want them to be disposable because of many certain parts have to be disposable. We need to improve our image guidance. We need to move from slowly operating room to the control room and then remote control. And with the operator skills diminishing, I think it's a great, great asset where our younger colleagues won't need to study too much and relax more. So there are other things, legal implications. You don't believe it? Ask the, uh, the senior people here who out there 
really can coil an energy to it properly. Nobody, because there was this idiot who generated a flow diverter, which you just throw in the area and it heals on itself. So it's like with self-driving car, guys. So these are the issues that, of course, we will be working with. And there are a lot of other things. I don't want to go into delay because we are running late today. But we use this platform. And in fact, we did one of very complex teleproctoring when we launched the Surpass Evolve back during COVID. And the proctor was Dr. Pereira, who had a lot of experience. And we did really a broadcasting engineers were involved from different parts of the world. And we felt that we were really working hand in hand in the room with our colleagues around the world. And it was an amazing experience. And Emmanuel Oruman Jr. partner put that in the paper. Now for all this advancement, of course, deep learning, or we call it machine learning, AI will be important. This is the saga of AI starting in the 40s, the dark area. And now you see how fast these things with the tools that we have at our disposal and the, the power of computing is leading us to really, to really expedite these processes. You use now in the daily operation, the, the power, this is I think Viz AI. There are a lot of other com companies that have embarked the journey, making basically foolproof. Many people don't need uh, know how to read an MRI. So they click this machine and it shows you the red spot is the aneurysm, period. So you don't need to go even to high school anymore. How wonderful. We can start from the beginning to party. Well, so the components that are coming together is imaging, material sciences, telemedicine, and all that. The only thing with Dr. Lilik said is the biology, which is still a little bit in the dark age because that's the beauty of the humanity. The human or the, the species, the living species, is so complicated that we are still scratching the surface. Let me give you some disease example where we have done over the last few years, a lot of stride. Yesterday you heard the ischemic stroke. I will focus a little bit more what happened this year at the stroke meeting and also the recent publications that have changed our field and will need more your help and also more education of newer generations of fellow. So let me go through chronic subdural hematomas. You heard this is, you won't believe it. This is not from Stone Age picture because then we didn't have iPhones. This is a picture from how surgery of subdural hematoma is being done. So they put this big, large surgeries, remove the clot, and uh, put this little uh, suction drainage, which hurts, you won't believe it. It hurts, I have a friend who had went through this and you get often complications and pneumoencephalon, but it still works. It's a great surgery. I'm sure that your fellows and residents love it. This is how the angiography looks and without going in detail and not spilling you the beans, Dr. Lidlik is already embarking a minimal invasive technology to remove this hematoma as well. But there were a lot of other trials that were basically leading to whether embolization of the middle meningeal artery that may be the cause for the bleeding would be helpful. And these were the major studies here that then showed that it's truly of benefit. This is how it's done. It's really a straightforward procedure, good for the robot to begin with, placing a catheter in the dural branches that supply this inflamed tissue creating this leakage, and then you inject liquid embolics that's shown here um, in the dark. You see the dark pictures there. And these were the three studies that were presented at the stroke meeting this year in Phoenix, showing the beneficial value of embolization over surgery alone. So either in combination with surgery or embolization alone, suppressed the recurrent rate and was associated better outcomes. So this was a breakthrough. They didn't get a standing ovation because we are used to innovative, successful ideas. At the first time when thrombectomy showed that it was, everybody stood, thousands of people who were standing at the stroke meeting applauding. Nobody stood there, but there were thousands of people. So this will change our whole approach to the disease. And I hope next year, Dr. Lilik will show us 
how to remove the clot even in an elegant way. The next thing that just was published, I think it's still online, is the removal of lobar intracerebral hematoma. It should be between 30 and 80. I wrote it yesterday night, so please apologize. It was very late. It should be 30 to 80 cc's volume. And it indeed showed a benefit of removing these smaller lobar hematomas minimal invasively. It's to be read in the New England Journal. Vania alluded a little bit on that. I think that image segmentation, image fusion here, earlier days when Matthew and I were working with Philips for AVMs is being revitalized because of all the things you are seeing, hematoma removal, navigation in the CSS, on and on. I will go quickly through that. What about implantable products? Stroke prevention products, you have seen already the benefit for patients with PFO, for patients who have what we call it, um, what is that called? Hidden stroke, occult stroke, where nobody finds anything. Those patients may benefit from placement of these sensors. They're getting very, very soon. Ah, that was the word, cryptogenic stroke detection. Now, there's a completely new field that's emerging. You may have heard it is called neuroprosthesis. How do we start understanding with sensors, the EEG, the electric signals that the nervous tissue is sending us? And this is the one of the first journeys here from Tom Oxley in Australia, where they created a little stent rod, which basically takes the signals from the brain, the EEG, signals from the brain and the person who cannot normally talk due to stroke or other underlying disease can now communicate with the world using the computer. So it's called the brain con computer interface. For stroke patients, for example, if you have the motor strip that's damaged, you can't move the left arm in this case. What you will be doing is you will be activating the ipsilateral motor cortex to move your arm or the prosthesis that's attached to you. This is the first patient they did, pretty breakthrough. And of course, there's a lot of imaging required to that out. This is a breakthrough of technology of brain computer interface. And this guy doesn't need introduction. He, of course, did it open surgically. He can put billions of dollars. Uh, he has the power and he will make it happen. It has already become a issue of national security. Governments are talking because if you have these systems in your brain, you can hack into the systems and siphon from our president probably the information to put in, which would be not so desirable. But theoretically, this is possible and people are talking about that. Now you heard about the Cerevasc implant. I thought this is a breakthrough. Adel Malik, Dr. Malik and Dr. Heilman were working with that system already in UMass a while ago in the sheep model. And you saw the first case being placed here at Baptist by Dr. Ricardo Hanel. Congratulations, Ricardo. Really excellent, well done. Now this, I don't need to repeat. This is the, the study that Vanya alluded to where they went with the microcatheter and delivered genes and drugs. We took a similar approach. We are doing development of third ventriculostomy. These are the catheters showing you in the sheep model, going through the floor of third ventricle using image segmentation. And uh, this is really very helpful. This is, I think from your lab, Matthew, these images. And we are working in collaboration with Philips on that. How can we utilize the 3D data set for all other usefulness where we are placing these sensors? Now we have taken it in a different route in the endosysternal interface. So we designed sensors that we are now testing in collaboration with the group from Baylor and Galveston with Dr. Khan and his researchers, and it will be published in Nature Biotechnology, where we have placed through the CSF space for for um, patient with OCD, depression, so in the frontal, orbitofrontal location, these sensors. And what we have done is we place them, we let the sheep survive 30 days later to see whether we can still provoke the same electric response 
when we stimulated. We had to make sure that there is no inflammation, no bleeding, on and on. But what it's telling you is that there is so much newer space that is being created where we can access the brain and safely with the image guidance, place these systems without harming the patient. This is the last part where I think where we should get involved at a certain point. Now, for Alzheimer's and memory loss, there is a lot of research going on around optogenetic. What is optogenetic? So we are understanding that neurons fire at certain frequency. And with buildup of plaques in Alzheimer's and other degenerative disorders, that frequency where the neurons fire basically diminishes over time. So some researchers are using light technology in early stages of research here in the mice model, where they shine the light with a frequency between 30 and 60 Hertz. And what it does is it basically creates an upregulation of genetics. I will talk about that in my second talk briefly. So what it does it in the, in the mice model, they're seeing that the, there is an improvement of memory in Alzheimer's mice model. I'm not an expert how that works with the Alzheimer mice model, but right now it's percutaneously placed uh, glass probes where then the light is shined in those areas and they have seen in fact some improvement of the memory, not so much about the plaque deposition. But now imagine you could do that through the CSF space and that would be probably more efficient and more promising. Here are more studies around that area where uh, for 40 hats, like I said, is used for optogenetic uh, gamma oscillation. Now, we have been introducing to Dr. Lilik's point, a new uh, system for regenerative medicine and that's laser light. Now, laser light has been studied vastly by Hamblin at MIT and Harvard, but it was very difficult to get the light into the brain tissue or in the vasculature, so in cavities. And Barry Lieber, uh, my partner on this journey is a biomedical engineer and we have been working for over 30 years now. Um, came up with this idea and we did some basic research and we believe that laser light may be, may be helpful to address neurodegenerative changes, maybe also in neurogenesis, neurosynaptogenesis for stroke patients and other diseases. I will later this afternoon show the principles of photobiomodulation and our first results with aneurysms in the preclinical setting. Where are we heading? That's my personal. I think that we are more and more to Dr. Lilik's uh, comment this morning. We are more and more heading towards personalized care, understanding uh, the genetics, understanding the epigenetics, as well as uh, the biology response to all what we are doing. I think this is a very exciting, exciting journey. And I wish uh, this is where I ordered a coffee. Some of you have seen that in San Francisco. So you talk to a robot. And you know, the only thing that happened during the whole action, when the robot gave me the coffee and I took the coffee, I spilled it in front of the robot. And the robot started laughing. And I said, what the hell? What is going on? I spilled the coffee because I was super nervous to... You know, like you said, I'm a grandfather. To talk to a robot, the guy said, with milk, without milk, with sugar. I said, okay, okay. And you order it. And the guy is giving you the whole thing. And I spilled the whole coffee. And there were humans around me, humanoid faces at least. And they started laughing at me. So, so this is really... Now, Michael Jordan shoes. I have one of them. I don't wear them. But I'm just saying... Am I ready to change to more comfortable? Yes, guys. So these were my old shoes. I don't wear them. They're super expensive, but worthless. So the bottom line is that we have to be ready for, we have to be ready for something new and we have to embrace it. It's like with self-driving cars. Thank you so much. I know, stay there, stay there, because I'm sure there are questions. Fantastic. Uh, okay, guys, questions? Anyway. 
I always love your talks. Thank you, AJ. I was just wondering, um, the system that you're developing to do the third floor ventriculostomy, I mean, that's an obvious first step, but are you thinking beyond that to, to use this as a platform to do other things? Yes. Um, I would love that you and I work again together and we are doing already on the imaging part. Um, so he is what we think. Third ventriclops, the third ventriclostomy is only a tip of the iceberg because we wanted to show the proof of concept. And now with the sensors where we are going on the surface of the brain, we hope for epilepsy where the deeper parts, mesiotemporal lobes, for biopsies, and Phil Purdy described that long ago. He couldn't take it through because the technology was not there, the imaging was not there, but now with the OCT and all that, I think we will take it to the next step. I, you know what? I'm not challenging Musk because he's doing his open surgery, but I think there is a room to go through the different parts of the CF, through the CSF, through different parts of the brain. We need only more imaging power. So sensors, receptors, biopsies, electrophysiology, on and on. on. What I was wondering though, I mean, I think Pedro alluded to it in his lecture, the, the really the last frontier in brain aneurysm, the thing that's this malignant fusiform basilar, and now you're right there. Is there something you could do to it, maybe with your photomodulation from the yes. outside? Yes, very good point. We are thinking about that, whether we can combine with drug delivery, like you're saying, like inhibitors of VEGF, because those large giant aneurysms, when you look at that, there's an inflammation going on, but also sprouting on new vessels, like in the eye with the macular degeneration where they you know, inject inhibitors for VEGF, we could think about drug delivery, what Vanya was alluding to. We could think about photobiomodulation, but we need, you know, instruments to monitor okay. that. MR is one of them, vessel wall imaging, but I'm sure that you with the OCT could help us a lot. We need only the inflammation to see on the OCT somehow. Yeah, I think that this is a, thank you so much for the talk. I, I feel that this uh, difficulty to navigate sometimes um, any thoughts on the steerability of these devices versus using magnetic fields from outside to then uh, yeah. steer? Because part of it is, it's always about access, right? So one right. thing is getting there and then what to deliver. But still, there's a challenge on this. Any thoughts on this? Yeah. What is the best way to do it? That's a very good point. We thought five years ago when we entered this field a little bit longer that we would be able to the conventional uh, stable catheter like Band-Aid or similar catheter, it didn't work. So we spent almost five years to figure out what the problem is. And the problem is the open space versus the contained space in the vasculature. So we have new concepts, we have new prototypes, we have design freeze, and we hope next year to show you for us patients. Okay. Uh, uh, that's that, a good point. Don't go anywhere. There's more. And this is for you and Matthew. Uh, you you show Vanya show an injection of contrast. The contrast stays on the system where you're injecting, but you show tissue with the with the drug or vector delivered to other parts of the brain that is above that. Would you increase concentration if your third ventriculostomy concept going to your drug delivery? Would you increase concentration of drug if you're delivering this high because the CSF will go down from the cistern then to go up to the cortical surface so to be absorbed? and on the spine as well. So does it make sense to deliver it higher than to deliver the basal sister? Ventricle to be specific. Ricardo, good point. We are thinking and we are talking to Uz Katal Chepe, who is a pediatric neurosurgeon and who is involved in Matthew's group. We are thinking to go through the uh, to the third and lateral ventricle, very easy to get into the lateral ventricle, to go directly through the ventricular system into the thalamus for drug delivery or caudate. So we are designing... Uh, uh, you know, tools to enter the brain tissue through the ventricular system rather than going, uh, you know, stereotactically downwards. Matthew? Yeah, <laughs> these are all fantastic questions and, and all these things. There's one paper in molecular therapy that shows uh, head down position increases transduction that's never been reproduced. So we don't believe those data. We have not tried, but that it, people, a lot of people in the field have investigated that. Um, what we can tell you, in AJ's point, he hit the nail on the head, right? The caudate, um, the thalamus, these are the, the striatum in general. These are very difficult structures for, for transduction. And so what we're doing right now in our clinical trials is we're doing by, actually, Oz Chateltepe does it. Um, we're doing bilateral thalamic convection enhanced delivery. It's the first time it's ever been done. And we're actually giving really, really large volumes 
and the patients are tolerating it. Um, Can you describe what you mean with convection enhanced? You, you stick a needle through the head oh, so directly, directly into the thalamus. Um, a... Yeah, you actually do it from a posterior approach. Um, we don't know the answer. Um, we have done a ton of work comparing intraventricular delivery. And by the way, all the neurosurgeons here who are doing omyelo reservoirs, I mean, everybody's like, oh, let's just do a omyelo reservoir procedure. The, the infection rate's like 20%. It's it's not insignificant. Um, and probably a lot of that is in the office when they're reloading the pump. But anyways, um, we don't know why. I think his strategy, intraventricular delivery doesn't get the same distribution that, that Vanya showed with the CPA or CM injection. And we don't really know why. It doesn't make sense. But going through the ventricle and into the brain structures directly is a minimally invasive approach to what we're doing uh, uh, kind of very invasively. I mean, Vanya alluded to this, but the truth is that a lot of concept like that we think how the CSF distribute is probably not fully really accurate. I mean, we have little data on this. So do you have it with tracing and all this? I mean, now that have you guys looking at the flow, what is the rate? What is the, because again, we have this kind of almost global concept that this movement, but the reality is that it's probably not what we really think it is. So any data on this? So there's tons of data on global, using MRI techniques on global uh, CSF flow patterns. And, and as we know at night, it's completely different than during the day. Um, so there, there's a, a circadian uh, component to it. Um, what is missing is what Vanya is working on now. And we really have very little data, but she's putting in a grant to, to expand that. Um, is the micro, uh, what's happening at the micro scale level. So we need a multi-scale model of CSF dynamics to optimize drug delivery. And I think that's the direction we're headed. A question for Vanya. In your um, visualization of subarachnoid spaces, do you see the G lymphatic system? No. Um... So is it a virtual space or is it a real space? So if you ask me, I will give you the following answer. I've read quite a lot about it. I've seen people presenting a lot of about it. I personally never understood where it's located exactly. Um, I don't understand. Um, I haven't seen it. I don't understand. I It's an idea for me right now. And to be honest with you, when I talk to people specifically and ask them, Okay, you present, you a lot is written. Do you know where is it? Can you pinpoint it to me? Can you tell me? Everybody says no, they don't know. Um so one of the ideas that we have and we would like to explore, and and um that's why we started the particle injections into the CSF space and we attempted and we tried to see can we see them with OCT. The idea behind that was to maybe um, figure out by following these particles um, where are where is the entrance of of these glymphatics. Um, so that was the idea behind it. Uh, I don't know if it's the right way to go because of the size. I don't know if the the the, um, the particles that are um, visualized by OCT which can't be less than 10 microns, let's say. I don't know if they're small enough to enter, to transition between the the, the, the CSF space and the glymphatic system. But um, we're still looking into that. Um, yeah, so that was Thank the you. idea. Thanks. Thank you, guys. Have you seen the glymphatic system? No. Do you know where it is? What we see is... If, if you reopen or you do a long-term occlusion of the carotid, after a while, there's a contrast that accumulates. And there's a lot of discussion that some of the contrast is in the lymphatic system, in the G lymphatic system, and other contrast may be leaking into subarachnoid space. And if you do a high resolution CT, you see some difference. And also the washout is different in its characteristics. But we saw that Pedro, you had recently a case where we were wondering where's the contrast, but I don't see it, you know, because you have the high power with the with the with the OCT. We can't see it. 
surgically do you see that now just one more thing that which i personally found very interesting in an article that i read i read that um there were some, some experiments done in mice um and they used tracers i don't know what type of tracers um and they saw that these tracers are transverse they go through all the subarachnoid, the core of the fibers that are inside the subarachnoid space. Um, so maybe it's part of it, it's inside the, I don't know, the meningeal layers, inside the meningeal layers of the, of the brain as well. Exciting. Uh, so we have an announcement. <laughs> Could be, yeah. Um, just really quick for the nurses uh, that are looking for to have a copy of their certificate for the attendance, you guys can reach out to me. If you are a Baptist employee, it will be directly reported to CE Broker. Um, so if you need it, just let me know. Perfect. Uh, so we're we're going to take a 17-minute break. We'll come back sharp at 10.30. Uh, this will tie up beautifully with the next uh, 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 talk that is OCT and, and, and then we have a pleasant surprise that you guys have never seen before uh, uh, Dr. Coelho hap where's, where's Giselle? Uh, uh, she happens to be Brazilian but uh, uh, this is not biased Pedro this is just mere coincidence but but you see where what uh, AJ show he, this ties into the uh, in the future and your alien analogy, I think, is very proper. So uh, don't miss this next two talks starting sharp at 10.30. Uh, we have an issue with the transmission of one of the talks. So we're going to have more time for discussion. And uh, hopefully we we'll finish with uh, Dr. Ortega and some posterior circulation animals if we have time before lunch. So uh, re 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 recharge and come back for exciting stuff at 10.30. Okay. <laughs> So we're not going to charge you. Oh, no, no, no. Come forward. Very good. Yes, no coffee. No. <laughs> if you don't mind, if I could put you back just a little bit, bit more on this end. Wonderful. That was it for the light. Wonderful right there. And just like that. Ready? Keep the smiles. Yes. And one more. 
Stay, stay there. I'm gonna go in between Brazilians here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh man. Oh, I am, in, I am in trouble. Here. Oh, 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 oh my God. Uh, my so, God. That's, that's that's my budget. Don't touch that. <laughs> One more, yes. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Nice. Very nice. So what? Do you need for a break? Yeah. Yeah. I I will I will look for that thing. Yeah. So <laughs> Right now, early this morning. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> United Nations. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. That's right. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Always. Awesome. Bye. Bye.
Good morning. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. If you could please take your seats, the program will be beginning in less than a minute. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, our program will be resuming in less than two minutes. Once again, our program will be resuming in less than two minutes.
Perfect. So, so uh, our our next session, and you saw some uh, some little pieces of this already on Vanya's presentation. We talked a little bit about it yesterday. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Victor Pereira had to cover call for uh, his partner. He could not be here. But between uh, Matt and Demetrius that did a lot of the preclinical work on this, and Pedro Lilic and Vitor Mendes Pereira from Toronto that did all in human cases with this new technology. Um, I think we have a great, uh, uh, I think we have a great opportunity here to see uh, what is coming next. Uh, and uh, we're hoping at Baptist, we're gonna be on the first batch of the US sites to have this technology available for uh, uh, a patient uh, uh, application. Uh, so Pedro, if you don't mind, join us here. And uh, uh, Matt is gonna uh, show, show us some exciting images and uh, then three of us will, will talk about, we have 30 minutes, guys, so we have to uh, be laser focused and go from there. Thank you again. Mic's on. Oh, here it is, okay. Um, I wanna stop here for a minute. Um, I think, uh, Ricardo did an excellent job the first day talking about the 10 years here at Baptist. And he said over and over again, it's a team sport, right? And I think anytime you're introducing what I think is the next evolution in uh, neurovascular imaging, um, every name on this, uh, 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 every name on this slide really contributed enormously to uh, the tremendous success, which I'm about to show. Uh, it's a team of, of physicists, engineers, and importantly, physicians who guided uh, this product development. So uh, with that, we'll get started. So intravascular imaging in the coronary system, we talked a bit about it um, yesterday. It's 30 years of use. Um, the American College of Cardiology has come out and saying, if you're doing a PCI, you it is Im uh, imperative to include that with intravascular imaging in order to make the procedure safe and effective. Um, cerebrovascular, so the existing system, the dragonfly system, it has a torque cable that spins inside of it. And that's where you shine the near-infrared light, receive the data, and construct an image. The problem is if you bend it just a little bit, that torque wire comes into contact with the catheter. It can't spin freely anymore. Um, so we wanted to design a system that could be used in the tortuosity of the cerebrovascular system. Obviously, it can't be very stiff. We wanted it to be compatible with uh, microcatheter workflow uh, to be able to image in tortuosity, obviously produce high-quality images in that tortuosity have excellent uh, spatial resolution. What we're going to show you is spatial resolution on the order of 10 microns. Um, it has to be reliable, obviously. Image um, different size vessels and locations, including the distal vasculature. And um, what we're showing you are data. We acquire 500 images in two seconds um, with vessels as long as 10 millimeters, um, 10 centimeters, excuse me. So here's the device. Um, it is basically what you're seeing in that picture. Um, you can see uh, the optical device, you can see the laser on, it's near infrared light. Um, it's very similar to a synchro wire or a standard 014 wire. It has a spring tip. This wire is not torqueable. Um, so we do deliver it through microcatheters. Um, and again, it images at 250 frames per second. The images are shown real time on this console. The console is actually connected to the angiography system. So you can see it uh, on the angiography. And we have a field of view roughly of 14 millimeters in diameter. Um, Vania showed this, so I think I can skip it. Um, this is the actual procedure. So this is Vitor doing a case. You can see he is uh, putting the wire through an O21 microcatheter. The distal position is up here. And you can see uh, the wire uh, coming into the field of view, uh, being navigated through that microcatheter. And here's a close up. And then what you do is you unsheath the catheter to expose the laser. Uh, and then you can do a pullback and the pullback is done like this. Uh, there's a, a, a disposable unit that is mounted on the table. You simply uh, click it in. And then uh, when you do the acquisition, you flush contrast and simultaneously, you can see here the contrast is being flushed. Um, and then you're gonna see the wire uh, pull back. So here's the tip of the wire. And as the contrast you'll see coming in, the wire is then automatically pulled back through this uh, unit here. It's called the pullback unit. So here's the contrast coming. The wire is then uh, rapidly removed. And in two seconds, you get 500 images. Um, we didn't do this willy nilly. We've been working on this for 10 years. Uh, in vitro, we've done more than 30 phantoms. We've done um, actually now today over a thousand OCT imaging sessions across rabbits, dogs, sheep, pigs, and non-human primates. Uh, Vanya has done work in cadavers. 
Um, we have 10 peer reviewed publications since 2019, and we've gotten millions of dollars in support from the NIH and the Massachusetts Life Sciences Initiative. Um, so you're looking from the inside out, you can see the microstructure, of the artery wall, you can see the internal elastic lamina, you can see the media, you can see the adventitia, and as Vania presented, you can see through um, the blood vessel and into the subarachnoid space. Um, these are just 3D reconstructions. Again, you can see all the layers of blood vessel. And I just wanna point out, this is a middle cerebral artery, a diameter about 2.5 millimeters, and here's the probe. So you can see how small the probe is. Um, and this is just magnified. You can see perforating vessels. This is a vein. We know it's a vein because it's uh, not contrast filled. Um, we can see the subarachnoid structures. Um, we can see nerve roots. Um, so this is one of the earlier cases. This was done in Toronto by Vitor. Um, this is, you know, the, the lecture this morning, the beautiful lecture about um, uh, uh, teaching primary care doctors about aneurysms. This is a case that's a little bit complicated. There's a strong family history of subarachnoid hemorrhage. The patient has multiple aneurysms, but this aneurysm here that we're going to focus on is only 2.5 millimeters. Can I see by a show of hands who would treat this? Unruptured. 2.5 millimeters. So no hands. That means nobody would treat this. When we look very closely, so here's the pullback shown in real time going from the distal middle cerebral artery uh, into the internal carotid artery. Let me show you some features. So now we're looking inside the aneurysm, and this is the dome. This is a hypocellular wall, right? There's no cell structure, and it's 30 microns thick. Now by a show of hands, who would treat this aneurysm? <laughs> I see hands going up. So if you believe the Helsinki definition, which is based on histopathology, um, this is what's called a type D aneurysm, and 100% of these aneurysms ruptured. The only feature this aneurysm is missing, according to that classification, is adherent thrombus. But remember, 100% of them were ruptured. So the question is, was that adherent thrombus there before the ictus of rupture, or was it there after it ruptured, likely after? So um, this is another, uh, so this case was treated with a flow diverter. We can see excellent apposition at the level of the aneurysm neck. Another thing I want to point out, with angiography, we say this is the neck. You don't actually know where the neck is. The histological definition of a neck of an aneurysm is where there's a rupture of the internal elastic lamina. Here we can actually see, see this very bright signal? That's the internal elastic lamina. We can actually see where that signal disappears and we know the true neck of the aneurysm. Um, and so this was treated with a flow diverter, like I said, excellent apposition. Um, this is Pedro's case. I don't know if you want me to talk through it or yeah, cool. please chime in if I say anything wrong. Uh, so this is a follow-up of an aneurysm that was treated with a, um, I believe this was a P64. Um, HPC, so it's a surface modified P64, and it has a very unusual appearance. This is something that's confounded our, our field for a while. This is rare, but you see a deformation of the braid kind of in the middle. And the question is, what's going on? We didn't, we never really knew. Uh, so we're going to look at this closely. Um, again, you see this deformation of the braid in the middle. Um, and here's what we see. So indeed, there's intimal hyperplasia. So we see tissue growing over the surface of the flow diverter. This is unusual flow diverters. Usually we elicit a minimal uh, hyperplastic response, but here there is indeed intimal hyperplasia, which is causing a narrowing of the vessel. But what's interesting is that we can see through the stent, it's a little bit difficult to see, but you see a concentric medial thickening. So the smooth muscle cell layer has gotten really thick. And we think this is what's causing compression of the stent, causing that deformation. Uh -huh. um, yeah. Can you can you show what you what you mean there? What where are you seeing that? So look at a normal artery. Right. Okay, here's a normal artery. Okay, it has an aneurysm up here, but this is a normal artery. You see how thin it is? It's about 100, 150 microns thick. Now, if you look through the flow diverter, you see how the artery is like 300 microns thick? So you have a concentric medial thickening, and we think that's what's causing can the compression of that? the stunt. Yeah, sure. So look all around here on the outside of the stent. The pointer, do you have their laser point? Uh, sure. So outside the surface of the stent, uh -huh. you see there's a medial concentric thickening. Like I said, it's a three times the normal size of the artery. Um, and I believe, Vanya always yells at me for saying this, I believe this is like a chronic vasospasm. It's a chronic irritation to the vessel. It's absent of inflammation. We, and I'll show you cases. We can see inflammation with OCT. There is not an inflammatory response here. It's a concentric medial thickening. And I'll show you on the very last slide what post-subarachnoid vasospasm looks like. It basically looks like this. Matt, we actually, Ricardo and I, we showed a case in some instances that there is actually clot in the, uh, the original placement of the flow diverter probably created clot in that area. 
and then there's a new instrument that grows over the clot. So that could be another reason why you could have a decrease in lumen. A lot. Yeah. Yeah. So there may be different reasons why this yeah. happens, but that's why OCT is so important to show that. Yeah. Because, because, because what, you, what, what you're showing here is on, on that blue line there, that's negative remodeling, that term for cardiology. So what you're saying is the negative remodeling is because of intim uh, a medial layer thickening. And this picture even shows it better. Um, I guess it'll lose it. He's up. <clears throat> this shows it even better. So you see the interval hyperplasia here, which is tissue growth on the surface of the stent. And on the outside, can you hear me? No, no, I can't. <laughs> on the outside, you see this is abnormal. This is three times thicker, the media, than it should be. So I don't know. Maybe it's a, a bimodal effect, right, where we have um, – um, a contraction from the inside, but we also have some external forces from the outside. Going to the to the your your question or your comment, I think that in that case is a chronic. So this is I think is something six months after. There shouldn't be a clot there now at that time. Yes, I, I think it's, it's I think it's media media uh, growth over there. But Pedro, the one we saw was interesting because the neo intima had already developed, so it was not acute. Also, in the case we saw, you mean the it, it was it was in the chronic phase, but there was still some uh, I guess uh, clot like material suggesting that that was there. And then it, it, the healing of the artery happened on top of the clot, and the clot never went away. That was between the intima and the and the and the, and the, and the yeah. This is uh, one of Pedro's cases: uh, a ophthalmic artery aneurysm that was treated with flow diversion. And this is the acute stages where he uh, deployed the flow diverter, and you can see up here malapposition of the stent. And there is a lot of evidence, not just from my group, but also from Mayo Clinic and Nijmegen, that shows malapposition is clearly the reason for delayed aneurysm healing. So uh, Pedro recognized this, and he did a microwire massage technique, and you can see the result here. He's dramatically improved uh, the apposition of the device to uh, the wall of the artery and uh, uh, the neck of the aneurysm. I would, um, like, I would like to point it out that in that particular case, even if you have that quality of the 3D or, or, or comping, uh, it, it's, it's not yeah, enough. Yeah. It's not enough. Yeah, yes, it's so, clear so. the difference between you know. Uh, let's let's pull. I mean, who's going to with this 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 one? Who's going to massage? Is it, most 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 probably will say no, no, or angioplasty. But if you do a OCT, it's clear the difference. And, and that's one thing that uh, uh, watching case with Vitor, uh, they do a phenomenal work with cone beam CT on the Philips machine, like you do. And even on the cone being CT, looks like it was okay. You do the OCT, and then you look back and say, "Ah, maybe you can tell us that." But if you don't, if you don't see with the OCT that the definition is higher, uh, you, you miss that. So I think yeah. that's a great, yeah. great illustration of that. In cardiology, this is actually pretty defined. You know, two hundred microns. This it, you do angioplasty selectively depending on how much of mal position you have. We don't have that yet, right, Matt? We don't know how much is acceptable, how much, obviously, if you have perfect, is the best. But... We have preclinical models with predictive that I can okay. share with you. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, we, we, want, we want it to be less than 50 microns. 50 microns. Yeah. Um, here you can see a case, and I can guarantee you we've done OCTs now for years, but in this particular case, there is thrombus formation over the, the jailed side branch that you can appreciate with that yellow arrow. Um, you don't see this on DSA. It's too small. And so uh, in this case, Pedro uh, gave a, a 2B, a 3A inhibitor to resolve that problem. So overall, we have enrolled 22 patients um, at different stages of the treatment. Um, we've captured uh, clear image segments, 45.8 um, um, uh, millimeters, uh, free of artifact. Um, essentially, uh, these results even surprised me. 97% of the images were readable uh, without any issues with blood clearance. Um, so we have to move quickly here. I think this is really interesting. This is acute ischemic stroke Matt, case. Matt, can I just make one more comment? And, and every time we did a case, we we're thinking, where would you use it? Because it's a new technology, right? We don't know where we're going to use that. Uh, so the, the question every case is, why would not use here? And, and in my mind, I think we're going to see that in the future. We'll talk about surface modification, right? It's very interesting. Patient, All these patients are P2I12 tested. We know they are on prasugrel, brilinta, or plavix, and the medication is working. You put a flow divert on this patient, some of them, nothing happened. You put a flow divert in another patient, now there's a tremendous platelet aggregation, like five minutes later. So 
I'll bet in the future a acute rupture, Pedro, you put your flow diverter and do your OCT. 10 minutes later, you do it again. There's no plate aggregation. I'm on aspirin alone. I'm out of here. If the plate is, because if it doesn't happen in 15 minutes, likely it's not going to happen. So it's going to be very interesting how that's going to change this monotherapy aspirin only for ruptures in the future. I think that could be the way to expose the patient to a cangrelar or other versus aspirin alone on the patient specific response to, to, to the, to the uh, implant that we're using. I think it's going to be very interesting. So, I mean, on, on that note, I know, Matt, you need to go, but we're going to get an extra time. Don't worry about it. <laughs> so, Matt, how, what is the time it takes for proteins to cover the flow? Level? Like, is it half an hour? Is it an hour? It's that usually you... within, it's in the acute period. It's within 30 minutes. 30 minutes. That's right. my experience. So that would be maybe the answer. But the question is, can you design flow divergers that, they would allow that to happen even faster, right? And so the shape of the, the strut or the maybe even the surface modification will be with that intent to, to make accelerate the protein coverage of that device so that the antiplatelet, you, you have a safe time that you can check five minutes, 10 minutes. If there's nothing there, no antiplatelet, uh, no platelet aggregation to it, then you're safe, you know, you'll be... I just want to point to the, the, the comment of uh, Ricardo. I think we, we, we were running a, a, a protocol with Han Henke's uh, mon monotherapy on aspirin and two groups and plus well. And we waited one hour, every fifth, we, we did an angiogram every 15 minutes. And it's interesting because even after after half an hour, we got we got thrombos. And the patients were very well uh, antiplatelets and drugs with very fine out before. Yeah. So fifty percent of those cases got clot after thirty minutes, but that's why we stopped. And I forgot to mention, I, I don't know if how many people know this, but Ricardo Demetrius and I kind of grew up together. And um, our father sitting here, one of our fathers, AJ Waklu, always taught us from the beginning: you have to go in with a plan A, B, and C. And I can tell you, with this information, we had now a plan D. Um, it dramatically changed uh, the way we thought about the case. But um, here we're showing, this is kind of an unusual case, 40 year old uh, male comes in with a fever, having a left uh, MCA syndrome. Um, and we kind of thought this is unusual. Is there an underlying vasculopathy? Is there a uh, dissection? I mean, this is kind of an unusual case. So uh, Vitor went ahead and he did the OCT. I'm gonna skip through this because I think you guys get the idea. And this is the real time data. So we're pulling back, I was shocked. This is an occluded artery, and we were able to clear blood distal to the vessel with our contrast injection and acquire artifact-free images. And this is just, um, I can show you the slides. We know based on the optical characteristics, this is just a red clot. It's a cardioembolic clot, probably. Um, it, it, you can see the reason I know it has a lot of red blood cells is because there's a big black shadow here. Erythrocytes, as Vanya shows, really attenuate the light. Um, so we could diagnose this. There was no underlying dissection. The vessel wall is healthy, um, no vasculopathy, normal arterial wall. Um, and then this was treated with two passes of a solitaire device. And then post thrombectomy, we can see a really nice result, a little bit of residual thrombus here uh, that was deemed here at, at uh, the origin of a perforator. You see a little bit of retained red thrombus um, and then one small intimal tear, which we know happens uh, with stent retrievers. It's not um, a shocking result. Um, and this patient did well. Um, here's Pedro's case. I think this is fascinating. Um, this is a patient who came in with a right uh, MCA occlusion. Uh, you can see uh, pre-treatment, uh, there is a DWI lesion, as, as Ricardo showed us yesterday. Maybe some of that can be recovered with a successful recanalization. Flare imaging, there is a mismatch. So the um, idea of doing the thrombectomy was uh, confirmed. So they go in, they did uh, a CAT6. I believe Pedro Jr. Pedro treated this Jr. case. Yeah. yeah and did uh, four passes. Uh, this is the first pass, not getting an acceptable result. Continued with a second, third, and even a fourth pass. At that time, um, um, they thought, okay, let's stop. Uh, the, 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 it was a ticky 2A result, but uh, they didn't think continuing to do thrombectomies would be successful, so they stopped the case. Um, and here, six days later, you can see that residual uh, stenosis or luminal narrowing. Uh, uh, Raul made a very good point yesterday that not all uh, stenoses are ICAD. So, but we thought, what is what is the underlying etiology? Anybody have an idea? Nima, do you think this is a dissection? Do you think, you know, four passes with a trevo, that's not an unreasonable thought. Do you think it's intracranial atherosclerosis? So here's what it is. OCT pullback. And then you can see the culprit. Did this patient have AFib? 
Pedro? Do you remember? No. This is a retained fibrin rich white thrombus that's just adherent to the wall. This really surprised me. I didn't expect this result. Um, essentially, what Pedro Jr. had done with his Trevo is drill a hole through a very difficult clot. Um, and uh, I don't know if you had these information at the time of the procedure, if you would have dropped a stent or what, I don't know what you would have done. But I, I do think it informs your next move. Um, it's kind of atherosclerosis. Um, I, I'm going to say something a bit controversial. I don't believe in vessel wall imaging. Um, you call vessel wall imaging when you have a 400 micron uh, voxel. We've just shown you that the artery wall is 100, 150 microns. So you're not really imaging the vessel wall. You're imaging some contrast maybe, and, and the mechanisms of contrast retention are complicated and they're not so straightforward. There's, it's multifactorial, so it's not a very specific assay. Um, I think what we're showing you here is true vessel wall imaging. And working with the group, we did this in cadavers first. And what we did was we looked at different kinds of plaques. Here's a fibrotic plaque. Here's a lipid pool with a dissection. This is a calcified plaque. OCT is fantastic for looking at microcalcifications. And what we did was we had a blinded pathologist who also did all the stains and they confirmed what the plaque type was. And then we compared it to our imaging and we had a one-to-one -one correlation. Um, this is a carotid, I, I believe, I don't know who did this one, but uh, you can see it's a ruptured plaque. You have some nasty thrombus being exposed. Um, and here's a, a calcium crystal that's protruding into the lumen. Um, We've enrolled six patients at various stages in their treatment, either before, after, or uh, during follow-up. Um, and I'll just show you a couple of cases. This is uh, Pedro's case where they did a drug-eluting balloon first, and then they put in a, a, a metallic stent, a Pegasus, which is a self-expanding stent. They did a six-month follow-up on the patient. You can see residual narrowing. Um, and the question is, what's going on here? So again, an OCT pullback. Uh, this is real time. You can see the stent. And if we look at some of the details again, uh, we're seeing this is a great picture of it. And, and I guess, Ricardo, you would still call this negative remodeling. Again, a huge um, uh, plaque component behind this that's compressing the stent um, on the follow up with uh, some intimal hyperplasia, but actually quite minimal. Um, so this is again that negative remodeling case. Uh, here's a second case. Uh, this is a patient who was refractory to, to medical management had multiple lesions, had a proximal carotid lesion, had a cavernous segment lesion. Uh, here's that cavernous segment imaging, um, pretty tight stenosis. Uh, so we did the OCT, here's the pullback. This is before treatment. You can see the ulcerated plaque. You can see the components. I'll highlight some of those features. Um, so here's the uh, plaque ulceration. Uh, this is lipid pool. Again, we know that because of the optical characteristics. Here, this is really important. You see these, these are foamy macrophages that have actually ingested some of that lipid. So they're casting a shadow. They're foci of, of uh, inflamed macrophages. Can you show the pointer? Because we don't see your... Oh, I thought, I'm sorry. I'm just sitting here. Sorry. No. So these yellow arrows here, these are pointing to foamy macrophages. These are the lipid pool. So again, here, over here, macrophage, lipid pool over here, plaque ulceration here. Um, this was unbelievable results. So we did the angioplasty. The angioplasty, oh, by the way, this patient, you know, Ricardo, or Rolo, I'm sorry, I thought I told you this yesterday, but this is the MCA. And you can see there's a, a wall disease, it's a fibrotic plaque. It's non-stenotic, so you would never see it on a CT or an MR. Um, but this is indeed extensive disease. This patient had disease uh, all through their intracranial vasculature. Um, we are excuse me, Vitor did the angioplasty. And what was interesting is we started the pullback post angioplasty in the MCA, and you could see debris of the plaque floating up into the brain after the angioplasty. Um, you can see really nasty appearance. The plaque is ruptured. There is an intimal dissection. Um, and then here's post stenting. And we really thought based on the vaso CT that this was an excellent result. So here's the vaso CT. The stent was completely collapsed. Only uh, the last cell of the stent, this is a wingspan stent, was completely collapsed. Um, wingspan. Wingspan. You can see here that the stent is underexpanded, and then you have plaque components actually protruding through the stent. So these are floating thromboembolic complications happening. Um, so Vitor saw this, said this is completely unacceptable. He dropped the flow diverter, um, and he was able to expand that collapsed stent, getting a reasonable result in plaque coverage. Patient did well. Um, 
Here's just a couple of cases that I wanted to show. Again, Roel made an excellent point. Not all stenoses are ICAD. Um, so the top picture is post-subarachnoid uh, hemorrhage vasospasm. You can see, again, the appearance of that. You have concentric thickening of the media, which is uh, collapsing the vessel. The internal elastic lamina has become like a serrated knife. It's it's um, not supposed to look like that. You see it's like a serrated. It's got lots of undulations. And then this is a case Vanya did where on this DSA and a rabbit model, we saw something a little bit strange. Um, in the subclavian artery. Um, and so she took an OCT image of that. And you can see there's clearly an intimal tear um, into the media as well. Um, and then a couple of days later, there was a stenosis. Uh, this is the true lumen. This is the false lumen with blood products inside of it. Um, so not all stenoses are intracranial atherone. I'm just trying to show a couple of examples of that. And that's actually the last slide. So I did well. You did awesome. I got through 70 slides in... in 13 minutes. So. The, I think the question, though, that I, it's very interesting. We have uh, technology to look at impedance of uh, clots and things like that. Compared to imaging with uh, OCT, what do you think is going to be, you know, because it's that's a that's probably the gold standard for in my mind right now. But can if we were to go, you know, into what is the next level below that? Do you think that uh, that would be a good solution to it too, or no? You know, this is a very fundamental question. I'd like some of the gray hairs in the room to answer it. Um, well, not so many gray hairs left, but <laughs> <laughs> it's it's happening to me too, AJ. I'm not. Sure. Um, anyways, I was in Montreal with Jean Raymond. And I showed some of the preclinical data. And Jean Raymond, for those of you who know him, he's a philosopher. He's a thinker. And he said, Matt, you're showing me things that I don't want to know. I don't want to see this because I might actually do something to the patient that might not be in the patient's best interest. You're showing me too much. It's too much information. For me, that's – and I love Jean. I'm not saying anything wrong about him. But to me, it's like putting your head in the sand. Like I'd rather know what's going on. I'd rather have these details um, because I think it does inform decision-making. Now, do we need clinical data? Long term, yes, probably, but I think we're showing that it's incredibly safe. That's the the most important observation. That that was the point of doing the study. And in Buenos Aires, it's on protocol as a research study. In Canada, it's a special access product. Um, but we're collecting the data, and and I, you know, Pedro is the one who's done half of these cases. What is your opinion about the safety? I mean, it's a very safe. Technique. It's very safe. It's very safe. It's like micro micro categorization. So yeah, like you go with the twenty one M two M three without any problem. And they, and they slide very nicely inside. So I think first first question is is very safe. Second, I rather want to know because I have to speak with the patients. So I rather know what what's going on inside. I, I in that regards I disagree. I think we have to know because for the first we were searching for that. We we know that we didn't see the the wall and the interaction between our devices and the wall. And now we are able to do it, and we can fix it some of those in real time there. But I think the, the on on the journey though, since we still have to go back to the impedance question, but I think the one issue here is this: we have to done uh, dragonfly. The, all the coronary OCT doesn't translate to what this uh, uh, version of um, we call HF OCT or the uh, OCT for neuro. The, the we even use the Gentuity product cardiology version for a carotid OCT image. And it's not that uh, easy to do. Uh, the, so the fiber breaking and the tortuosity that we found uh, was definitely uh, much more of a concern. So I think that this is uh, just for everyone here. You can't just wait until the neuro CT is ready because the cardiac products, even with Sprite, the company that uh, Gentuity and, and Dragonfly, uh, Abbott, they're not ready for neuro. So I would say... This is really reproducible using the, the the neuro system, the 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 microcatheter navigation and the moving of this fiber is very much like a neuro and the vascular procedure. So you're not doing anything different than what you're used to. If Guys, you, okay. just go ahead. Man. No, for me, it's a tool, and um, I remember when rotational angiography was introduced, and wow, it saved a lot of time, right? Because you could find the working projection for the aneurysm after just one injection, and you could see it was a uh, cone beam CT in the angiosuite. It was a tool. And these were readily adopted 
without you know much thought behind it. Uh, this is just another tool that gives you incredible amounts of information about the pathology and about how the device is is fitting in relationship to that pathology. So, so we, we had uh, Santi talk about yesterday MT twenty twenty right the disparities and where do you expect the cost of a single uh, use uh, uh, Sprite and OCT is going to be two thousand, three thousand, five thousand because. Uh, again, Raul was just talking about this. This could well be a diagnostic tool, right? Is this atro? Is this vasculitis? Is this RCVS? You you do an angiogram. You alluded to a uh, vessel all image. There's no answer from non-invasive. I need to do an invasive. Your angiogram has this budget. The device costs this much. So. That's what it is. It's an endovascular biopsy. You have a. Uh, you are in the micron space here. So so I think from a diagnostic standpoint, right? And that's actually nice to see that because we, we the non-invasive imaging is growing a lot to the point that, uh, yes, we, we all have to be prepared. Uh, we have to be constantly asking what is, the what is going to be the value of diagnostic and geography 10 years from now? with the CT and MRI advancements and God knows what's coming. This is a game changer for diagnostic and geography. Yeah. And I think instead of biopsy, we we'll use the term histology. Yeah. That may be a better way to yeah, describe exactly. that. Yeah. But you know, for, for cases like ICAT, it will be not only diagnosis, but maybe we will make a change in the real time with the patient. Uh, uh, so uh, so for, for, for that, I think it's a real game, game changer. Uh, absolutely. And then you, you it's funny when you talk about the bioimpedance uh, wire. Yes. Because, yes. As, and, and I have told them about this, there is a company, a French company called Sensom, has a very neat device. It's a 14 wire, micro, a 14 micro guide wire, and you can measure bioimpedance and very good about discerning Red clots, white clots, mixed clots. Uh, there is a uh, great interest in the whole ICAD uh, diagnosis as well with it. And I think it's very exciting. But this is another dimension, yeah. right? You, 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 you actually get more information. It's a very similar profile um, to so, what they are offering. It's actually a very similar procedure because yeah. it's the same thing. You have to go with the micro guide wire and then pull it back. Um, so Demetrius, I intentionally didn't answer your question because I think this technology obviates the need for bioimpedance. Yes, but the question is, is an entry level, the costs, and maybe there will be the different layers of this, right? So I was also trying to avoid that question. <laughs> <laughs> so Matthew, you know that I was on the fence with the high frequency OCT. Two brief comments. I think when we start using that more and more in the clinical realm, we will find new areas where it will be useful and other areas where I think we will drop it. For example, clot. Characterization of clot will move into more and more non-invasive image. Got it. On the CT, you will probably characterize. It. Your lab has worked. We worked on that. Philips is working. Others are working on that. There, I think... Time is of essence. I think we won't use it for that. But there are other areas like ICAT, and there I disagree with Jean Raymond. The reason is that we are doing that is we are creating another set of data. And when we are moving into precision medicine and into individualized care, I think this kind of information will help us with ICAT, will help us with other observations in the clinical realm where this is super useful. So AJ, I'm seeing more information is better. If you have family history of aneurysms and you do a pre-screening OCT, all your vessels, and you go with your primatils, the light treatment on areas where there may be lack of media before the aneurysm shows up. Yeah, he, so he somebody told sense. me a similar comment like you are doing, Demetrios. He said, can they shine the light with OCT? I say it's a different technology. Oh, no, 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 that, no. No, I'm just clarifying for the audience. Yeah, yeah, OCT yeah. is an imaging tool, light based. Yeah. And what we are doing with photobiomonitoring is a laser based technology, different pair of shoes. But we can combine it to your point in the same session.
Well, they because both... you can find the, the weakness Correct. before you develop an aneurysm, perhaps. Right. In, the they... same, in the same time. Exactly. They both they both use lasers. They're just using different frequencies, but um, yeah, and wavelengths. Um, just want to point out what the big hurdle right now. And Ricardo, I don't know if you want to comment on this, but the big hurdle right now is that you're generating 500 images in two seconds, and you've got to read them pretty fast if you're going to make procedural uh, decision making. So our big effort right now is to use artificial yeah. intelligence technique, just like everybody else, yeah. to automatically segment the images and point the physician to to look at key features of what they're what what's being seen. March will come and stay tuned. We'll be here again next year. Thank you, three of you. Would you like me to give the lecture on lightsabers? Uh, that, that's for the lunch break. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Phenomenal. Uh, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of uh, serendipity in life. Uh, when, when the stars align and people connect, uh, we're working on a different project, and Vitor Benalla is one of our uh, then research now clinical fellows. And oh, I, I know this girl in Brazil that she can she has a very cool model uh, for for neuro uh, simulation for endoscopic work, etc. And mere serendipity, uh, uh, Professor Giselle Coelho was interviewing with a dear friend that the guy's going to meet this afternoon, and he's, many of you know him, David Freeman, that has a totally back to the future star even the name of his fellowship is is futuristic star x is a fellowship that he developed to connect robotics uh uh ai artificial uh, again all these things one year fellowship and uh, giselle was applying to that and she was in town for that interview and we happened to bump at each other Victor said giselle is here she brought the the models want to meet her and then I, i'll go learn what this this girl has done what this uh, 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 Brazilian female power has accomplished on her young career uh, from a fellowship with Consenso de Rocco in Roma uh, to learn uh, endoscopy for pediatric patients, to turn that into how can I develop a model of a baby that I can uh, decrease my learning curve, and from that, how I can replicate and reach the world without leaving Sao Paulo. Uh, she's moving to Jacksonville. So uh, how I can reach the world from Jacksonville and uh, drop all the barriers. I don't care about the flag. I, she tells me, uh, I work with Harvard. I work with MIT. I work with Baptist. I work with Mayo. So everybody's welcome. How I can make the world a better place through uh, simulation, innovation. So I think you belong right here to this discussion. Very excited to have you here, Giselle. Please, please uh, join us. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you so much. Uh, good morning, everyone. First of all, I would like to thank the invitation to be here. Dr. Ricardo Hanel, really thank you so much for this huge opportunity and also for kind words. Um, I would like to talk a little bit about brain surgery training from avatars, right? And to start talking about it, uh, I think it's important to have the definition uh, metaverse. We can hear this word, but it means, right? Meta is everything is beyond, right? And the verse, the universe, the real world. Then the connection between the metaverse is between what it transcends and the real world. And the meta health is the metaverse and healthcare field. And some definitions are important just to understand how we can handle these technologies, right? The virtual reality, the aumented reality and the mixed reality. When you are talking about the virtual reality, we have completely digital world. We don't have the connection with the real world. And when we have the aumented reality, we have the holographic image, but you can see the real environment that you are, but you don't interact with the image, 
right? You have the digital and the real world, but without interaction. When you have the mixed reality, you have the digital, you have the real world, and you can interact with it. And what will be the, nowadays, the meta health uh, enabling technologies to go beyond, right? And the cutting edge of the mixed reality simulated surgeries is the holoportation that we will talk about later. And also the holoportation and the ultra-realistic tattoo response with simulators. And the value proposition of this project is to become great opinion leaders, great professors, eternal, right? And to use the analyzed knowledge to train professors to lead in the excellent performance in the operating room. As Dr. and I start talking, I have this idea, I had this idea when I was a resident just to reduce my learning curve in endoscopy because for the first time that I used the neuroendoscope inside a baby's head, I have never trained it before, right? And what would be the best way to train before to go to the real patient? That time, it was 2009, it was only possible to train assisted with another professor, but in the real patient. I wrote a project initially just to create a box that I could navigate inside with the endoscope and to have the three-dimensional understanding, right? But we could uh, improve a little bit more. When I come back uh, to Brazil, because I was in the fellowship in Rome that time, when I come back to Brazil, I noticed that they, they were many uh, talented uh, plastic artists there, and we create the model, the big model, pretty realistic, right? And with the same consistency resistance that is possible to navigate inside is the main anatomical landmarks. And, and also during this training, I noticed that to apply, to combine the virtual reality to understand the procedures, which would be a great tool to improve the learning curve. And then we created the neuroendoscope virtual simulator first. The idea is the trainee we will have the notion of the pathology. Here in this case is a hydrocephalo, right? Hydrocephalus, and you can define, for example, what will be the entry point, what will be the important landmarks, how to be your skin incision. This will be visualized three-dimensionally right, using the virtual reality. The idea is to prepare the trainee uh, to have the bidimensional view, but also the three-dimensional uh, anatomical understanding. Here you can see the basilar artery, oh, sorry, the basilar artery in the brain, uh, in the right side of the video, that's possible to note the, the important landmarks during the procedure to perform the third ventriculostomy. So we created also the endoscope, neuroendoscopy physical simulator. And we can see the, the first version, right? The second version and the last, last version, we have boys and girls because the idea is to continue the, pro the project and to have gender specific pathologies. And we create this model based on the real patient image, CT and MRI that we combine it. We printed, but the most important is to have the complete tactile feedback in realistic. It's not possible to 3D print it. We have to have the handmade process. Then plastic artists were trained to create and to work with, with each part. And we could also to obtain the radiological interface. Here is the CT scan of the baby simulator. It's pretty realistic and it's possible to navigate during the training too. So inside the baby simulator, we can see the choroid plexus, the anterior septal vein and the thalamus straight vein is the, the mammillary bodies, the third ventricle floor. And it's possible to perform the third ventriculostomy exactly with the surgical tools that we are using in the real patient. And here we can see in this baby, we can see also the basilar arteries, the, the basilar artery and its branches. After the, the third ventriculostomy, we'll be able to, 
insert the endoscope and to see the anatomy of this region. And now, so in this baby simulator, we have a fourth ventricle that's possible to navigate inside. Here we can see the basilar artery and it's this bleeding effect, right? With the trainee uh, damage for some reason, right? For technical uh, training, this artery, it will bleed as in the urgency and emergency situation, it's possible to simulate too. And this baby also has a tumor in the pineal region. Then it's possible to perform the biopsy. And all the time, you will be this bleed effect just to train the, the resident how to handle, right? And also to put the ultrasound aspirator to remove completely the lesion if it will be the case. We can see the, the aqueduct there, right? About 2 p.m. in the video, we can see the, the aqueduct and you can go through with the flexible endoscope and also to navigate inside. Uh, this is, was nice because I could reduce my learning curve significantly. And then I start to apply to my residents, right? And I could notice that they improve it too. This is, was an um, important tool uh, to try to spread and to train better the future neurosurgeons, right? Uh, I was really honored to be in the cover of the Child's Nervous System Journal because this little baby was the first uh, baby for pediatric neurosurgery training, realistically. We published this book too, about the, the simulation, uh, how is it will be the future in the role for this kind of training, right? And this, another paper, it's important too, because by the first time we evaluated how the trainees could improve using this simulation, the physical simulation. And here you could see uh, after 10 times that they performed the neuroendoscopy navigation, the third ventriculostomy, the biopsy, the tumor biopsy, after six time, times, they reduced significantly the learning curve. This is interesting because we compare the trainee, the trainee with himself because it would be the comparison for the first tentative against the 10th tentative. And we could notice the reduction for everyone after six times. It is interesting because independently of the how you have practical skills, well developed, you can improve, right? With the, the realistic simulator. Uh, we are honored to, to receive the, by the first time in Brazil, right? The Young Neurosurgeon Award for WFNS in 2015, because it was the first time that we have the mixed reality simulation and to bring to neurosurgical education as a way to reduce, reduce the learning curve in a safe way, right? And we start to validate the technology for many, many courses in Brazil, right? To use the, the virtual reality first, and then the trainees start to practicing the physical simulators. Here, Dr. Chinali in Brazil, teaching the neurosur young neurosurgeons, the neurosurgeons that don't have uh, experience with neuroendoscopy, and also if you're residents. It, it works for any categories, right, of training. And nowadays, we have had some course around the world, Italy, United States, Indonesia, Argentina, Uruguay, in Peru, doing the same, right? Trying to promote courses that can reduce the learning cur curve safely. So let's start talk about a little bit about Dr. Benjamin Worf. We are talking about hydrocephalus. In 2005, uh, he decided to combine the third ventriculostomy and the choroid plexus cauterization. And he started a brilliant work in Uganda to train pediatric neurosurgeons there. And he developed this technique. And the past, and this technique will be able to replace the shunt in many, many babies. And he started the work in 
in Uganda in 2005. In nowadays there is more than 10,000 babies operated without shunt, right? They are shunt free because of this uh, neuroendoscopy procedure. And he trained during six years in person there because he lived there to train these neurosurgeons. And now the neurosurgeons train, are training another neurosurgeons in the all African continent. It's a huge project. And he, he decided to create then the NeuroKids project. The NeuroKids project is a project to train neurosurgeons around the world to use his technique to save lives and to avoid chance, right? The project uh, is uh, nowadays uh, in the, the, for 2024, 20 partner centers in 15 countries. And I received his tra training in 2022 in Sao Paulo in a public uh, health care system uh, at Santa Casa in Sao Paulo. And until now, we operated 56 patients with 92% of success without shunt, right? They become shunt free. This is really important uh, watershed for our hydrocephalus treatment, not only for the outcomes of the patient, but also for economic, especially in low income countries, right? As Brazil. And he, uh, he, went, he goes to the place training person the neurosurgeon, and after uh, he leaves, he start the remote presence mentoring. Then you operate. I operate with him ten, 10 patients, and after more ten with, by teleorientation. It is an inter interesting uh, project that you can improve and to use more and more to train another surgeons. Uh, Last year, I started to train another neurosurgeon in Amazon region with the same purpose. And the big question, we have uh, 500,000 hydrocephalus and spina bifida uh, affect, affect more than 500,000 babies every year. This is a huge number. And looking at the, oh, sorry, looking at that picture, we could not see, he arrived there, we cannot see what was the reality in Africa, right? Macrocephaly babies and in a condition that is possible to treat uh, efficiently, right? And he changed this reality in how to, how we can expand and spread this project and train more neurosurgeons around the world in an efficient way, because Dr. Orff is only one right, and how to spread his knowledge. So the idea of the avatar creation is to become him eternal and his technique, and it's important for us to learn with who create the technique, right? And we start this project, this is a camera in partnership with uh, MIT, right? It's MIT Nano, the, the program, and Dr. Worf was captured. Here is a camera with 360 degrees to capture his uh, physical aspects, right? Because it's important that his avatar would look like him. And this is a synchronous mode. The synchronous mode of the project is the way to create him, to recreate him in a digital world. And all the characteristics, right? The phys facial expression, and the way that he speaks, everything was uh, recreated. And also this mo model, uh, we decided to capture his movements and exactly the way that he is operating is possible to teach now all the neurosurgeons, right? Digitally, then we have this capture of the movements and to track to his previous avatar. And this avatar also will, will be equipped with artificial intelligence and machine learning with a bank of questions and answers. And Dr. Worf, it will be possible to answer questions during the training, right? Even with when he is in vacation, right? And he will be able to teach. So here we have his model, 
the baby holographic model, baby model, and here you can see inside the, the baby's head because it's possible to zoom in, zoom out, right? And to see how this, uh, this training can be uh, reproduced. And the idea is to have Dr. Worf as a teacher and the baby simulator, the physical one, then the student can uh, hear, uh, hear his instructions and to perform the procedure in the physical simulator. But some cases, it will be important to have Dr. Worf in person, right? If I have a challenge case, if I have um, a difficult or I would, have, I would like to have him with me in person. So we also create a synchronous mode of the project. And the context is to use the holoportation for this. The holoportation is a cutting edge technology that combines 3D capture technology with real time communications. It's a high quality 3D models of people to be reconstructed, compressed and transmitted anywhere in the world instantly. Of course, we have to have an excellent connection, right? Bandwidth to be possible. So uh, the first holoportation described it was uh, done by NASA, right in 2021, where a doctor was holoportated inside uh, a rocket to talk to the astronauts there. It was amazing because they proved the concept that the holoportation is possible and it can be applied uh, in the next years. And here you can see the doctor there, right? Uh, and the communication between them. And we try to do, and we perform the, the first holoport, intercontinental holoportation last year in Brazil. We connected in Sao Paulo, in Boston. Dr. Worf was in Boston inside the MIT Immersion Lab, and I was in Sao Paulo operating the baby simulator. And the idea is to have Dr. Worf with me, oriented me step by step of the surgery. Using the augmented reality glass, I was able to see Dr. Worf in my operating room, and he was able to, to see me, the baby, the screen, and everything. He was possible to walk around me. It's his view, not my view, right? And he was, we are so happy because it was possible to have this kind of communication, 5G from Brazil and from the United States, with minimal delay. It was only three milliseconds. So it was really a clear communication between us. Uh, this video will sum up a little bit better what we did. I think there is a sound, please. Uh, please, I think there is a sound in this video. Guys, there's sound on the Ricardo Thank sound you. on the ele tem perguntas e respostas, então ele tem um banco de perguntas e respostas criado pelo próprio professor, em que o aluno vai receber o óculos, vai receber o bebê simulador. A partir do momento que ele coloca o óculos, ele vai ver o professor Benjamin Worf com a técnica, com a prática, mostrando como que, que deve ser realizada a endoscopia. And now we've popped into the ventricle. We're looking at the right foramen of Monroe. Uh, anterior on the screen is uh, up, posterior is down. 
e ele vai realizar a endoscopia no bebê simulador de acordo com as orientações do professor. Se ele tiver dúvida, ele vai perguntar para o avatar e o avatar, buscando no seu banco de dados, vai ser capaz de responder para ele em qualquer idioma. No futuro, nós vamos criar várias possibilidades de vários idiomas. Então, o professor Worf vai poder falar em mandarim, vai poder falar qualquer idioma mesmo. What is the ideal candidate for choroid plexus coagulation? The most important one is the combination of this with ETV in infants younger than one year of age, because it greatly increases the success of ETV in these young patients. The CPC should be performed always combining it with ETV. Professor, qual é o índice de falha da derivação ventrículo peritoneal? Mais da metade dos pacientes submetidos a derivação ao ventrículo peritoneal podem falhar pelo menos uma vez em cinco anos. O modelo assíncrono é esse, em que o professor é gravado e ele vai ensinar os alunos com o um simulador físico. Então, nós temos o professor, que é um avatar, que é a imagem holográfica, com seu banco de dados, com inteligência artificial e machine learning, ele vai ser capaz de responder as perguntas em qualquer idioma. Essa é a fase assíncrona. E a fase síncrona? A fase síncrona é ter o professor no Brasil, mesmo ele estando nos Estados Unidos. O que, que significa? Ele vai ser capaz de estar na sala conosco, andando, tendo a visão da cirurgia e falando comigo ao mesmo tempo, me orientando em tempo real. Então, ele vai conseguir andar, ele vai conseguir ver como eu posicionei o bebê, no caso, vai ser o bebê simulador. Então, em tempo real, ele vai estar comigo na cirurgia e falando comigo, movimentando. Então, o movimento que ele fizer lá vai ser replicado aqui. Muito bem, como está o paciente fazendo? Dennis, this aula is sad. Everything was fine. Thank you very much for your precious help. A gente vai transportar o professor com toda a sua técnica, com a sua interação em tempo real, além do continente. Em tempo real, eu consigo discutir o paciente, a gente consegue fazer juntos a cirurgia, mesmo a 4, 5 mil quilômetros de diferença. Então, de forma assíncrona, os médicos podem repetir o procedimento quantas vezes forem necessários, para que ele se sinta seguro de realizá-lo. E de forma síncrona, operando casos complexos, por exemplo, tendo grandes professores presentes com essa tecnologia de holoportar, estarem presentes em tempo real. Dr. Worth now is uh, fluently in Portuguese, but soon it will be fluent in many other languages, right? And uh, how to apply this high technology to change uh, the realities, right? We start the project, we name it the Amazon Region Project. The Amazon Region in Brazil is all this green area. Brazil is a big country, right? And as a big country, we have big challenges. And we have many Brazils inside Brazil, especially the Amazon Region, that's the green area. We, the, we have a region is a huge undeserved area. Then we have scarce resources and we have uh, many challenges to face when we are talking about healthcare there. And we decided to start for this region to reduce the learning curve in the surgery safely and to start to apply the project there because there we will have the more difference, difference directly of this project, right? And the idea is to increase access and improve the quality of life, of care, and connect with global partners to benefit both the hospital and children with hydrocephalus and spina bifida. The idea of this project is to connect the many Brazils and to reduce these inequalities, but the concept is worldwide, right? We can reduce these inequalities around the world now, not only geographically, but also economically, to provide the medical assistance and the medical education is the same quality uh, in comparison with the, the countries. And we start the project there, training the residents with the rigid neuroendoscopy because it's the first step before the flexible is to use the rigid. And we start the training with Dr. Worf, his avatar was there, right? Training them and they, they put the glass they looking at Dr. Worf performing the surgery and he could uh, reproduce. And the, here's his avatar, just to see the idea of the dimension, right? It's exactly our size. And the idea is to operate here physically with proper tactile feedback 
and to look at the hand operate the holographic baby. And we could note the reduction of the learning curve because we evaluated these uh, trainees just to see how the avatar method was uh, proper or not, if they could understand what he's talking about. And the reduction of the learning curve is really good and could reproduce the first paper that we published 10 years ago about the reduction of learning curve. So it's pretty effective as well. And we were in this uh, MIT News, right, talking about this technology because it's a pretty much disruptive. And I'm really honored to be here to share with you because uh, we have Brazil, uh, a huge country that we can modify many lives, right? And many lives, not only to think about Brazil, but in other countries around the world, to connect what is the best in the world and what we can uh, improve, right? And to promote this difference. And the training with avatars. Uh, to, to conclude, right? To improve the perception of realistic two-dimensionality and visual, visual feedback. And it's possible to record the activities. So we can evaluate the learning process with precise metrics and to evaluate this reduction of the learning curve. We are working also in another project to evaluate the videos that are recorded. Then you can have the turning point where the trainee is prepared to perform the surgery in the real patient and with precise metrics. It's a self-directed learning with key opinion leaders as professors. And it's also potentially scalable. Once we have the good connection, thinking about the holoportation, but if we don't have the good connection, we can scalable the asynchronous mode right now. And the idea is to reduce the goal, right? Is to reduce the global inequalities in education and medical assistance and to promote the knowledge without boundaries, geographic or economic. And more important, I think, is to become uh, great professors eternal, right? And you can have the opportunity to learn uh, with them forever. And about the holoportation, the holoportation brought the VR and AR to another level, combining both modalities to produce a platform offering dynamic 3D holographic presence and end-to-end -end system of high quality, real-time reconstructions of spaces surrounds people. It's possible to share all the, the informations, right? It's possible to interact and also has the emotional interaction between remote renderings. Uh, uh, remote settings, uh, settings, sorry. And it's possible to promote and to improve this communication. And also is a, it will be for future, a good factor to reduce these inequalities. And the future perspectives of meta health is to create new avatars, to teach many techniques in neurosurgery, but also for another medical specialties, right? The artificial intelligence using many languages for now. And to improve the avatar interaction and interface of the surgical training, we can improve, right? This is just the, 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 the first one. And the AI bank with new questions and also to put inside the AI bank, AI bank in this case is a private bank. It's important to emphasize because to avoid any kind of wrong informations, right? And, um, and in the future, it will be possible to add scientific publications uh, in this bank. And also, it's to be possible in the future to evaluate the long-term memory and the learning outcomes, right? With pre precise measurements and well-defined well metrics. So the mixed reality simulation can contribute for improving the anatomical understanding, the surgical skills, and must be applied for the best performance in widespread surgical training. Uh, this project would not be possible without having uh, with me a dream team, right? We are working together uh, this year during 15 years to get this, all this piece together right, and the possibility to, to use this technology to, to reduce these inequalities uh, worldwide. 
And thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> Well, Giselle, you should high five yourself because this, this is totally, totally awesome. Uh, I, I, Dr. Lopez is raising his hand here. This is a great work. And okay. quick question: this. So, the when you do the um, the the intervention, the video and the experience that you have. Uh, is it something that you can do? It's a pre-recorded, like if you from different clinical settings, you have this scenario, and that's why you show is a video comes in, it's like a basilar bleeding, for example. Mm -hmm. That video is something that you had from a data bank and that gets imported to the experience. And you can choose, for example, I want a rupture of the basilar artery or I want a clean procedure, nothing happens on this one. Is that something you choose the scenario up front and then we'll show that uh, experience for you? Or it can already real time change based on uh, uh, what you're doing. How do you decide the outcome, what's gonna happen on that video? Yeah, this is a good question. Yeah. Uh, we have now uh, the, the pre-recorded video yes. showing the step-by-step -step of the surgery. The urgent and emergent situations, for example, they are explained how to handle this, but we cannot, sh we are not uh, recording yet the complications, but yes. it's a good idea. Okay. The possibility to select, for example, yes. right? Ah, oh, now I would like to see the complications, how yeah. I would ha handle with it. Yeah. yeah, this is a good a good idea for the and, future. And then the other thing that I was wondering, the validation, for example, when you said, that, well, we built the head of the baby and we had the haptics, the feeling of going through it. How do you do that uh, validation? Is it through pressure sensors in your hands, in gloves, or is it in the device, the tip of the forces on the device tip? That you're measuring how do you validate that part this is a good good question we try to use the sensors yes. to measure this uh, on the device or in your hands and on the device on the device but okay. also in the simulator just to see how strength you put yes. right but it was not so possible because the sensor are not um proper measurement because of the water inside yeah and what we did to validate and to say, oh, this baby is uh, ready to train the residents. We validate with the more experienced neurosurgeons, not on Brazilian, but the pediatric neurosurgeons, the, the great names, uh, they tested the, the physical model and they answered a, a questionnaire I see. about it's proper or not. I it's see. important. So that's to interesting. Improve. Because that is the same yeah. stroke. The way we're doing the, some of this is that uh, we have a challenge of trying to figure out uh, the, the opinions sometimes varies a lot to get that you know but but i think that if you have the ability to measure in real cases the hand pressures that you're doing then potentially that could translate into a very good experience to the haptics of that but yeah. it's a big challenge a great work thank, <laughs> thank you. you yeah uh, it's I, a big challenge and that globes is in developing already yeah. The, the, I, I know he has a lot of he has a lot of questions. Yeah, I've always been like that for twenty years. I'm kidding. Uh, uh, we have uh, we have one here, and then we have uh, Dr. Aldana there. So please go no, you, first, please. Dr. Coelho, thank you. Great talk. I, I just had a quick question in terms of um, potentially using this to train non-surgeons to do these procedures, and and I, I know it's going to be a lot of controversy. In our institution at UCLA, many nurse practitioners, three or four actually do brain surgeries. They do shunt placements and they actually train the residents. It's the other way around. So mm -hmm. I was just looking at the um, uh, statistics and uh, in Uganda, there are only 13 neurosurgeons and, and the country has 47 million people. Just check, somebody can validate me in Google or, 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 or whatnot. So is this a system you envision to use potentially to train other people? Yeah, I think- Like that are not, the, these 13 surgeons are fully trained neurosurgeons in Uganda, but but those guys know how to do this. Yeah. So how, how can you improve this uh, outreach by using this kind of technology? Uh, I think we can we can establish uh, many models of the train of training in this place, for example, and also to stimulate uh, young people to become a neurosurgeon, for example. Right. It's important to show that there is a way to improve. There is a way to improve without causing any kind of dam damage for patient, right? I think it's the, the start with models to be an idea, 
because the, the regions are completely different. For example, when we start the Amazon region, we need to start in a different level that we, we start in the south of southeast of the country, right? Brazil, talking about the Brazil. So to create the models uh, specifically for region or for that needs, I think it would be the best approach to apply I this. I think you went five layers ahead, right? You're just like you're in a game, you hit that coin, you go five above. Uh, I think uh, Dr. Aldana will make a comment here, but what Phil has been working on this, training physicians, not non-physicians, because again, that's your jump there, Dr. Aldana. Right, that Giselle, uh, again, amazing work. Um, okay. uh, so uh, this this has you know, move the uh, simulations for, um, or simulators for, for hydrocephalus light years ahead. I remember um, uh, 10, 10, 15 years ago, making my own simulator with a bucket of water and, and a membrane and, and, and doing that to train other people. Um, uh, I have a, a technical question and I have many other questions after, um, and I have a comment to, to answer your, your, uh, your question. Um, uh, one is, um, uh, so you mentioned that, that, that the avatar can see what you're doing, look over your shoulder, and and see how how give you feedback on on how how you how he's doing that. So so that that means that there are cameras around the area that 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 track his movement, right? Um, yeah. Uh, so so the question about scalability would be, um, you know, cost for for that whole setup, and 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 how 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 will that not break the bank of the of the uh, of the low income country that you're trying to train. That, that's, that's one question. Um, uh, and then the, the comment for you is, is um, uh, um, you know, in, in the World Health Organization, the different levels of, of uh, hospitals um, uh, that, that are able to perform different levels procedures. So for neuroendoscopy, this would be like a level three or four hospital that requires not just surgeons, but the whole, physical staff, ICU. So, so you can't just uh, um, uh, just train anybody out in the field to do it because um, uh, you know you would doom it to 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 failure. So, so I would think that the the space for this in 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 that type of situation would be the the more uh, life saving basic stuff like um, maybe uh, 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 EVD placement or you know. Uh, epidural hematoma um, evacuation, those sorts of things that can be done out in the field, and then and then uh, the 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 uh, the more um, uh, intricate procedures like this have to be done in in a bigger center. Yes, yeah. thank you uh, so much for your question. Interesting question because uh, to acquire this image and to holoport for holoportation, you have to have at least four cameras, right? And as you connect cameras, that you can capture your data and then to transmit your 3D uh, volumetric data to another country or another place. Uh, to reduce these limitations, uh, we are working on a solution with the cell phone. <laughs> and then we have until now uh, the possibility to have this communication, this exchange of data using only one cell phone for a while, but we are working in a possibility to have soon the connection, uh, the connection and interaction between the cell phones. Then the cell phones will be the Azure Connect cameras in the future. This will be possible to scale up. So once we, we will have the cell phone uh, technology solving this problem, we will need to, to think about another uh, challenge. It will be to have the connection, the similar connection between countries and between places, not to have a huge delay and to improve this connection. But I think it is not, it's not a big deal with, right? We can put uh, big industries of telecommunications to try to solve this. The most important to have the, the technology uh, possible to be used in cell phones soon. Cross the fingers. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, guys. Just phenomenal, Giselle. That's phenomenal. Thank you. Guys, we have to break. Uh, Giselle will be here all day, so feel free to uh, talk to her and interact. Uh, we're going to break for lunch. 1 p.m. Her <laughs> avatar, you know, her avatar is available for life. Forever, <laughs> not for life. Uh, 
1 p.m. sharp. Uh, we have uh, we we'll start with innovator in uh, cerebrovascular ward. You can guess, uh, but don't miss that. It's gonna be uh, super nice. Uh, and then we'll go for the rest of the session. Uh, unfortunately, there was a, a communication problem with Professor Alberto uh, Gil from uh, uh, from Spain, so we will have to cancel that talk. Uh, we'll, we'll make it happen again soon because uh, there's a phenomenal new technology coming from the need of uh, endovascular treatment improvement on AVM. Uh, so that that got unfortunately got canceled. Um, so enjoy your lunch, and uh, we'll see you at one p.m. Thank you. Starting stuff. Yeah, yeah. <laughs>
Lunch time, guys. <laughs> Professor, how are you? I'm good to see you, Archie. Oh, how are you doing? I'm doing well. I'm doing. No, no, you look the same. Come on, you get ready. Yeah. No, I, I like you. I have more green. Oh, You have to look for that. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Well, let me give you some restaurants. How about okay, yeah. Um, uh, but, but I, I will, I, I will send it to you. I will like yeah. you. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Uh, so excited. Me too. I'm ready. Oh, 
Testing, one, two, testing, one, two, testing.
it much easier to swallow to say okay i'm gonna honor uh the uh honorary consul of ukraine in argentina uh that's that's serious pedro is honorary consul of ukraine in argentina has done phenomenal things especially now in the wartime to his uh country uh we talked a little bit earlier when uh, when we introduced him uh pedro did his training neurosurgeon he was in route to be a pediatric neurosurgeon uh with professor raul correa Carrera. Uh, and then he moved to Canada uh, and went to work through a guy that I unfortunately didn't have a chance to meet. Uh, but I always heard our mentor saying he tried to have the kindness of uh, Charlie Drake with the uh, hands of Ghazi Azargil. Uh, so Dr. Drake was uh, Pedro's uh, first mentor in vascular. And uh, Dr. Drake was a giant. The guy still has the highest number of posterior circulation. Maybe a Chinese guy will beat that. Highest number of posterior circulation. And it was in a beautiful book uh, on that. Uh, from that, uh, Pedro went to UCLA, where he showed you earlier. Uh, we give uh, Fernando Vinuela uh, credit. But there was a lot of work from uh, Guido and Ivan uh, Sepetka behind GDC. So he was there when GDC was developed. And he took that to his home country, and the rest is history. There's a whole list of one of the first stents on intracranial circulation, first flow diverter, and, and goes on and on and on. And to do this, we talked about that earlier, in a country that doesn't have the resource that we have in the US and, and some countries in Europe, I think that just enhanced the magnitude of uh, what uh, Pedro has accomplished. 
uh, again, I, I, growing up in Brazil, I saw Pedro's work uh, from very close. And my early dream was like, I want to train and go back to Brazil and do what Pedro did in Argentina, uh, came to uh, this country and never went back there. So, so uh, 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 hats off to you, my friend. Uh, very, very proud of uh, Eneri, Sagrada Familia, and to, uh, everything that you built over there. You're a true inspiration for a lot of us uh, that come from outside uh, with a little flag and built here or built there. It doesn't matter where you're building. What it matters is you're making the world a better place. And I think everybody in this room, uh, I, I'll let Eric and Nima talk, but I, I think everybody in the room acknowledge that and sees that in what you're doing there, what you built that. You train, I, I joke that Pedro trained half of Brazil, Jacques Mohet trained the other half. So we have these two schools of, uh, of a near intervention in Brazil that come from this uh, two phenomenal uh, people. So, uh, Niemeyer. I just want to say, uh, again, thank you for coming. I know there's many, many things you could be doing, and you're using your time and teaching us and talking here, and uh, I appreciate it. Yeah, same here. Thank you so much. And, uh, you know, it's, we are talking about this a bit earlier. I mean, I, I train in Montreal, and, you know, you – you know, we don't realize we're getting older, but at the beginning of the field, when we're getting interested in endovascular, uh, you know, you hear people like when we had discussion meeting, you know, people say, oh, Dr. Lilik did that and all this. And it's it's amazing because, I mean, obviously you're, you know, super active. You saw all the evolution of that. So, again, thank you for sharing that. Thank you to pushing again the frontier and from being with us today. Favor maestro. We, ha we have a little something for you, or two little something for you. Uh, this one is more formal. So uh, that's, a, that's a little brain with light. Uh, you, you, don't, you, you, want, you, can, you can open if you want. But that, that, let me hold that for you. because the, 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 Oh, my God. It's and and the real. second one is something that I know you have already, but, but it's, on, not, it's not... Is not truly yours. You I'm so, so, uh, so uh, this came from FIFA. Where, where I asked them from? if they could deliver the original one. They told me that a guy named uh, Leo Messi is holding something. Uh, yeah, but uh, they, they sent us the replica. So you can put that oh, in your you office. Do? And uh, we, we, we truly know you are a champion uh, for our field. You have yeah, moved forward so many times. And I know you're doing again. And uh, and now what? for you, it has uh, it has become a Tell me what family business with Pedro, Ivan, Pedrito. Oh, so okay. this is goes to That's you and the you whole Lilic job, family. Thank you, you for all you do, my friend. Make it up, right? We're going to take a picture here with the Pedro in the center. So, and uh, Introduced to you, maybe uh, I'd like all the facts okay. that you come, so let's take a picture with El Campeon. Muchacho. Played your video to everybody. <laughs> okay, I'm televising now. So we can kneel here in front, like uh, Demetrius Raul. <laughs> Oh, oh, here we go. Oh, I'm surrounded by Brazilian, <laughs> sorry. Yeah. Thank you very much. You see that other computer? You see it? Can you see it? <laughs> yeah, let me let me uh, send you the link. It's a lot easier. Yeah, yeah let me get a... Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. Excuse me a second. <laughs> so where are you physically now? Uh, San Francisco. Oh, right now, what part of the city are you at? Iran was there, but right now, because we just know each other very short time, it's just related on my piracy. So maybe you want to probably know each other better, I will tell you more of it. <laughs> So uh, we're going to continue the afternoon. 
uh, uh, we know uh, AJ already uh, touched upon the subject earlier, but uh, that's very intriguing. And, and it's funny. Uh, this guy, again, is the father of a uh, flow diverted that impact tremendously what we do. And one day out of the blue said, oh, I have this new idea. What about if we shine a laser light at a certain frequency in southern aneurysm and trigger healing? I said, when you find time to think about that? No, I'm working on this for 15 years now. I said, OK. Uh, uh, that's what he's going to show us. Uh, uh, laser peeling for aneurysm. No, I'm kidding. Please. I have to say, I'm lucky that India doesn't have a soccer team. You give me a video. Um, they would crush well, it. Here we go, here we, go. <laughs> we have only, okay. you know, we do gun shoot and all that you know. things, but nothing major. Uh, uh, Naval's going to bring the Cricket chat. World Cup next year. You know, a population of 1.5 billion. Uh, well, I'm sorry. We are cricket players, you know. I don't know, you know, those guys who wear white and run back and forth between two poles. That's okay. Okay, I'm trying to get this. No, but because, to be honest, uh, my parents told me not to leave the room until I don't come out of the room with a degree. So that's how we are raised. Um, I would like to share with you our early data. I'm trying to send you the link. Congratulations, Dr. Lilik, again. Yeah. Early data on something uh, we were contemplating when we were still in Miami at the University, Barry Lieber and I have been working um, on this concept mm -hmm. since 2004. Uh, but more recently, we had uh, two members join us, actually three, two from BASIC is Yumi Utaki and uh, Skip Greenfield, okay, so, both uh, what, cell biologist what, and biomedical uh, engineering, Tim McSweeney, who is in the charge of commercializing the product. These are uh, the disclosures. Some of the yeah. parts of the research was funded through R01 grants. Yeah, now, this is nothing that unusual. Florida. You have heard over the last yeah. several decades yeah. that yeah. endovascular yeah. treatment is taking yeah. over yeah. for treatment yes. of brain aneurysms. Okay. However, yeah. there is a problem with brain oh. aneurysms, you know, I, uh, I, despite the you, implantable devices you that have uh, seen a major okay. leapfrog. So for okay. bifurcation, we are thinking now more and more on endosacular flow di disruptors like Dr. Lilik showed us uh, with okay. some Do good results. And line? also uh, the flow diverters oh, and yeah. stent stent coiling have been um, introduced. The problem remains with all the implantable products that we would like to see a scarring yeah, yeah. at the You'll neck say, of the uh, aneurysm and healing uh, remodeling so well. of the artery well, uh, before an implant fatigue just, occurs. These implantable the devices are it's given energy the when they are stroke. produced. Once they are placed okay. inside the artery, okay. which each pulse cycle, they okay. experience forces okay, that nice leads to Bye. fatigue and loss of their energy. And then they end up uh, showing deformation and what we call compaction. This is a patient that was treated for a big aneurysm and another ruptured MC aneurysm. And you see here what we call deformation of the material from higher energy state to the lower aneurysm recanalization, same thing here at the neck interface. So when we summarize the experience over the past several decades, not more than 50% of the aneurysms are really over a long period of time completely obliterated and require retreatment. Now, there's a complex healing process that leads to aneurysm obliteration by using these devices, starting from hemostasis, clot formation, inflammation, proliferation, and remodeling. And that takes months to years, depending on the biology of the patient. What we thought a while ago, how can we in situ change the biological path? There are other researchers who take stem cells from your body, prime them outside the body for cancer treatment, but also for healing, and they inject it back in your body. What we thought of, how do we bring it in situ at the place where it's of uh, importance? These are the summaries. Uh, from our observation. But there were some other findings that are interesting coming from other researchers here that found out that when we use flow diverters, age matters. When we get into the retirement age, somehow 
and Bismarck knew that somehow our immune, our response, regenerative response decreases. And we saw the same thing with our own other system here. That's a sense study where the red bar shows you patients older than 65 and the blue bar shows you patients younger than 65. So there was no difference between patients that are 20 or in their 30s as compared to patients who are older um, than 65, sorry, younger than 65. But as soon as we reach the age of 65, there's a 20% drop in healing response and the senior population does not catch up. And we know that from other surgeries or implantable products in the coronary literature as well. And yet, as this graph from the Calmes group in May, at Mayo Clinic shows that there is an increased treatment due to demographic shift. And these data are only, uh, these data are a little bit older from uh, 2017, but the recent data shows the same trend that we are treating more and more senior population because of the, 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 the health care structure, demographic shift, but also that we are feeling better when we are getting older and older and we have to do justice. So when we introduce photobiomodulation, we think it's a, it's a disruptive technology. It's a revolutionary uh, technology because we are bringing um, regenerative medicine into the neurovascular realm. Now, the proposed mechanism for photobiomodulation has been described through basic research. And that goes back to Hamblin, who used to work he retired now, he's back in UK, used to work at MIT and Harvard. And what he found out that certain wavelengths uh, help the regenerative processes through a mechanism I will show you in a graph. Now the problem was with his word, uh, with his research that he created that helmet based on the photobiomodulation for patients that came from war zones, post-traumatic syndrome, and they thought that the wavelengths and shining of the brain would help them with their depressions, with their post-trauma. The problem was that he didn't realize that wavelengths, like the laser, does not go through the culverine. So he had no way to figure out how to carry the laser energy in situ to the cavities of the body. And that's what Barry and I start working on. We met also Hamblin, a great mind and a great thinker. And this is basically the concept of light. And that goes back to what I earlier said this morning, that optogenetic has been well shown in animal work. So there is a, not only an increased calcium flux into, into the cells that creates upregulation of ATP, but it seems to be that there are certain cytochrome in the complex four of the mitochondria, we call them cytochrome C oxidase, that are impacted. So what it leads is to upregulation of protein synthesis, but also upregulation of genetic, quick genes that are released, yeah. we call them the micro -RNA, that are basically participating in regeneration in upregulation and very, very controlled upregulation. So all this has been described. This is nothing new. What is new, what I'm sharing with you are the findings uh, that we have now in preclinical and clinical data. Laser has been used in other, other areas of the body, especially in peripheral. You know, this is a capillary hemangioma treated uh, with laser light. This is an ulcer. You see that in dentists offer generally around 800, 840 nano. And so ulcer treatment for foot in diabetes foot here, a cavernous angioma, on or not. So it's nothing new as we know. So we started first doing some cell culture studies with our uh, biologists with our cell biologists. We do single test uh, cell type testing here, endothelial smooth muscle cells and fibroblasts. Then we do co-cultures in Petri dish. Everything is done in Petri dish. So the idea is to do that because we know that these three cell cultures in conjunction with the pregenitor cells or the circulating uh, cells coming from the bone marrow uh, that they start differentiation and do the reparative function. So we define the therapeutic wavelengths and the dose and energy using this. And then once we have reached that, Basquiat, once we reached that, we went to the standard uh, elastase aneurysm model. You saw that from Matthew, and we did some preliminary study 
and more recently the GLP study, and I want to share with you that. So there are a few parts to this whole thing. You have the laser box, the source of the laser. Then you have the diffuser at the tip of the um, microfiber. It's a tiny microfiber, an optical fiber that carries the laser from the box. And then there's a cage, which is non-detachable case at this point. And that centers the tip because the laser tip gets fairly hot. So there has to be a saline solution at a certain rate that cools it down. Otherwise, uh, you would poke a hole in the artery. So these are the components. This is a rabbit uh, that we treated for, for internal thoracic um, artery to see whether it could be applicable for middle meningeal artery embolization and shining of the dura for chronic subdural hematoma. And we saw suddenly the light shining through the body of the rabbit, showing you how strong these lasers are. So everybody got kick out of that. And I thought maybe I should put the picture here. So, so here is the aneurysm, elastase aneurysm. It's an arterial uh, wall that's important. Here's the cage. The pulsation is so high that you won't see the cage. This is the tip of the diffuser, and we are shining the light here. And these are the results in the sham population, the aneurysm. At, this is at one week follow-up. We know at that time no aneurysm closes, really. You see the aneurysm here. There's some tissue growth. Sorry. There's some tissue growth in the sham, so non-treated uh, rabbits that had only flow divider. You see some amorphous clot here, but no real endothelial, the endothelialization of the flow divider, neither in the proximal part of the uh, aneurysm nor in the distal part of the aneurysm. And the aneurysm stays open at uh, one week follow up. Now, this is with a wavelength three. We did several different wavelengths. And what you see now is at one week with wavelength three, you have already significant amount of cellular growth covering the struts of the fluid diverter proximally to the aneurysm as well as distal. That's an important aspect because people ask, well, the aneurysm could close, but the device is not covered. So can you take the patients off dual antiplatelet treatment? And therefore the group here from Salzburg, Professor Monica Killer, his team did a great job. They dissected the vessels all the way proximally as well as distally, showing basically the energy or the signaling process goes beyond the area. So it goes beyond the area. It's a complex signaling like Hamblin described. It goes beyond the, the aneurysm neck. It goes into the parent vessel. This is no wavelengths. You see the black lines as struts. Uh, and there's some biofluid, maybe some earlier cellular growth already happening. This is a clot inside the vessel. And this is wavelength three. Wavelength one didn't do anything. It looked like the left side. That's why I'm not showing it. But wavelength three, you see there is a multi-layer cellul cells that are growing at one week already in the vessel wall itself. So we see application for coronaries maybe, for carotid stenting on and on. Again, magnified view, you have red cell clot. These are red cells. These are the struts. This is a laser way, laser cutting of the specimens. It's a special uh, cutter in Germany. And these are the wavelength three specimens showing you enormous abundancy of endothelial cells that are covering these struts. So there is something going on. One more time, wavelength one, like I said, there's almost no reaction and wavelength three. So there has to be a specific wavelength that is absorbed in the mitochondrion. It's an electron transfer, like I said, a cytochrome a C oxidase within the mitochondria of a eukaryotic cells in the human body. Now, when we waited 10 days results, these are 10 days results, these studies were done at UMass, we see without light therapy, some biofluid, some early cells, but with light therapy, amorphous clot, and already early signs of endothelial coverage. And this is 10 days results, and here you see scar transformation, endothelial coverage in the specimen that is treated with photobiomodulation or the laser energy, and on the left side, this is the uh, this is the flow diverter without uh, the energy. Now, we did some immune staining, and I can show you the data. Oh, by the way, people asked us, well, what about coils? And we did the same thing. This is bare coils, and you see here the amorphous clot you know, forming around the, the coils. These black dots are the coils. The aneurysm is, sorry, the aneurysm is open. So there was no, no effect 
on the coiled one. But when we did the laser treatment, we see already an endothelialization uh, with the with coverage of the coil mass, but coil compaction. So we need a matrix at the neck of the aneurysm that will allow us a proper sealing of the aneurysm. We then did the staining, and the staining showed that this is without flow diver without uh, light therapy on the left side. Oh, this is moving on itself. I'm sorry. So, so this is without light therapy to your left, and on the right side, this is light therapy um, with the flow diverter. This is a marker for smooth muscle cell actin as well as CD31, which are basically the precursor cells for smooth muscle cells, fibroblasts, myofibroblasts. So things that develop collagen and smooth muscle cells as well as endothelialization. And what you see on the right side with, with the light, you see an abundancy of positive cells within the clot mass, but also enhancement of the entire vasculature around the aneurysm for both, for endothelial cells, uh, endothelial progenitor cells, CD31 positive, as well as for smooth muscle cell actin, and almost no cellular activity in the specimen that was not irradiated with the laser light. So there is something going on. These are the, 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 the aneurysms with the coils where we did the laser light. And as you can see, there is an endothelialization here covering. And these are the bands, cellular bands that we saw on the, on the uh, alpha actin and CD31 staining. So what we are doing is, at least in the animal so far, we are reducing the process of healing from several weeks to six months down to several days uh, to a week. And that looked very promising. So the next step was, okay, let us do a replica of human uh, aneurysm to see the safety of positioning, all that. And I want to share with you these replica. This is a superior hypophysial aneurysm. And then we had several others, uh, and I want to show you how it looks. So this is the blood flow. The flow diverter basically uh, is placed already, and the microcatheter is jailed within the aneurysm. And this is the laser light uh, with a special filter in front of you. And this is without the filter. You can't see into the laser because you will get blind if you look at it for several minutes. So the energy, as you see, dissipates also to the adjacent vessel walls. So this is where we are standing. And I have the good news before I came to meeting. I was with Dr. Lilik and his team. This is Pedro Jr., of course, Dr. Lilik, you saw that. And our whole engineering team together with the Sagrada Fami Familia team. Uh, we did the first three patients and we hope to report soon uh, the follow-ups. This is how it looks. This is a supra uh, ophthalmic or supraclinoid aneurysm. Here, the laser probe inside. And this is a catheter for flow diverter. And this was a larger posterior communicating artery aneurysm with a PCA. I want to thank Dr. Lilik for, uh, for doing all the work. And you are really, you're an amazing, amazing person to work with in all. So in summary, we think that photobiomodulation uh, expedites and support complete healing in our preclinical data set. We think we are introducing regenerative medicine in the body, in the human body. And I think we need to have a detachable scaffold that combines photobiomodulation for inner healing. And I think that it will be useful in lar large and giant aneurysm. We are very ambitious. Like I talked to you this morning about optogenetic. We think that we could eventually take this technology for neurodegenerative disease or for stroke treatment into the human body. Of course, such a journey wouldn't be possible without all the sacrifices we make not me, but the family. And these are my two boys. They help and give me a lot of feedback. And my wife provides you, provides us and me with love, but also with the literature. So I'm updated for, for these meetings. And she's a terrific writer and reader. So I want to thank Veronica and the boys as well. Thank you so much for your attention. Congratulations. Uh, we could we could sing, uh, play that song from Britney Spears to Pedro. Oops, I did it again uh, uh, with uh, with AJ. That's brilliant, guys. Thanks. Looking forward to see the results. Protocol, are you planning any earlier image? What, what is your protocol? So Dr. Lilik proposed to do a 
early in geography and he did it and except one aneurysm which is 80 percent closed the other aneurysm didn't change so i think your plans are to do a follow-up at one month okay. i think one month follow-up Rahul, please are we getting oct yeah well i asked the company for oct but unfortunately currently it's not available Sandy, Sandy. I mean, really, really fascinating and uh, looking forward to see more. When you look at the histology, the regeneration is mimicking the, it's a, it's, you're getting it faster, but are you getting the same histological regeneration in the remodeling with the same layers or you have a hyperplasia of the stimulation uh, in the endothelium? So that's a very valid question. Are we seeing a hyperplasia that could lead to narrowing? So in the rabbit, I, I can't tell you about the humans. In the rabbit, we have done now over 250 rabbits. So when we do follow up, we see this coverage, which is in micro scale, multiple layers, but it's not that it keeps on progressing to intimal hyperplasia with occlusion. But it is multiple layers of cells, of uh, endothelial cells. So there is a reaction that go, plays a role. Is Will it lead in a patient to secondary occlusion? We don't know that for now. That would be speculative. It, the, thank you so much. The, the, do you think that, um, let's say if you get a chronic a case that was already treated six months ago and you don't have an occlusion or one year or three years, can you do the treatment multiple times or can you, is it an additive effect or it's a one time and that re biological reaction happens only one time? How, do you see that happening or no? Uh, again, Dimitris, very good question. So we have developed a technology where we have a balloon. We are in fact hoping that we don't need to go inside the aneurysm to trigger the mechanism, but we can shine the light from outside because Dr. Lilik asked me, he has some patients with stent coiling that recanalize or flow diverter that don't close completely. Could we go with a balloon outside the artery and shine that? That shouldn't be difficult because the balloon has fluid, so it's optical clear. As long as we have fairly good optical clearance, we can do that. We can go also again and shine again. So it's Stockhausen effect. So you can basically add treatment yeah. if there's no response later as well. It All things that are very interesting but right now we don't know it and it, it, it's interesting because in um the parallel on radio search when we have a embolization of uh, avm with onyx is there a reflection when you have already a device in place that could uh hard to control where you beam where the light goes or because you have a device already in place does it make a difference you think or no so for stroke we have developed a probe that has a mirror so it reflects away from the dura because we don't want to sh shine the light on a stroked area for synaptogenesis or neurogenesis so it has a mirror but in the csf space it's easier to rotate the devices now i do not think at this point we are ready to do in one direction um, the reason is you would have to create a window on your optics we don't have that right now Right now, we are shining the whole area. We looked into the brain because that came up. Of course, the laser doesn't go through the tissue. We know that. But FDA will definitely uh, ask us for that. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Lilik and his team did brain scanning on the patient. We don't see any edema or any negative effects. So. Of course, sorry. Sorry. For research purposes, have you uh, considered getting a biochemist to look into the biomechanics of the actual treatment and what's implication and the uh, of, of the laser itself within you talked about the photons and uh, yes. on the effect of the mitochondria yes so this is very important so uh, this slide i showed briefly so there has been a lot of basic research from various places that have looked into certain wavelengths and photon absorption in eukaryotic cells in the mitochondria. So it looks like it plays a role in electron transfer in cyto cytochrome C of the mitochondria. So what it does, it, it is like in optogenetic, but these are all my studies, not a human, of course. And what they have seen is similar to optogenetic that the frequency creates a expression of 
gen genes, very quick genes. And we are finding more and more that genes are not static things, entity, but they express protein synthesis on and off very quickly. So we hope that we will bring that also for stroke patient one day. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you, AJ. And, and before we pass the torch uh, to uh, uh, Dr. Naval and the critical care section, we have our last uh, talk uh, on, on, on this block that is uh, uh, Professor Lilik is going to talk to us about uh, CSF uh, diversion via endovascular route. So uh, thank you, Pedro, again. And uh, uh, the mere coincidence, we did our first case at Baptist uh, this week, uh, guided by another Lilic uh, by Ivan. So uh, thank you again. I think it's going to be very it's, interesting. That was uh, the actual actual version of Lilic, much better. Uh, thank you. Thank you again, guys. Thank you, Nima, Tinko. Thank you, Eric. Uh, thank you, Ricardo. First of all, for bringing me to Jacksonville. It has been a fantastic opportunity to learn for me. And of course, to share some of the excitement that we have in our field. Uh, I think I was very lucky in my life to be to be in the right place at uh, the right moment. Uh, I was in London when Drake was there, three giant animals per day. Uh, very difficult to duplicate, probably. And uh, also, I was uh, my first residence was uh, a pediatric neurosurgery, so I had a very nice talk from Giselle today. That was fantastic. Uh, I was I was very lucky, but but I, more lucky I was because I I met uh, fantastic uh, in my journey uh, on interventional neurology, endovascular neurosurgery, or interventional neurology, whatever you want to call. I I met uh, very good friends, and I always learn. So that's uh, that's important for me. Uh, this is my disclosure regarding the Cerevas talk. As I told, I was uh, my first residence in Buenos Aires was a pediatric neurosurgeon. Uh, so I, my VP Shan was in my daily practice, I must, uh, I must say. As you know, it's a disorder of CS uh, absorption, and we have a current standard of care is the VP Shant, which is uh, very well known, but there are not that much more new things during the last 60 years, uh, probably. Uh, there are several types. I will, I will try to speak with you and show you my experience with communicating hydrocephalus. VP shunt failures we heard before uh, is something in between. I think somebody missed. Uh, there's a pen drive here. Uh, sorry, I, I think the failure of uh, of uh, VP shunt is around forty percent the first year, around 50, 60 percent during the first two years. So there is a lot of room for improvement on on, on that. Uh, we can have a proximal. We have we can have distal a disconnection of failures. Uh, we, you can misdirect catheter or you can induce uh, some hemorrhage. Yeah, also some distal problems and and the, and the abdominal region. Uh, so again, uh, somebody have a fantastic idea. Uh, People from Tuff University in Boston, Adel Malik and, and Carl Heyman have the idea. They went through the process, they grow the idea, the process, the idea, and they came up with the endovascular solution for non-vascular problems. You know, we are very common that we try to fix everything with, uh, with vascular solution for endovascular problem. But that's, to my knowledge, this is the first time that we can fix non-vascular problems through endovascular ways. Uh, so this is, uh, we are going to speak now in a few minutes about Ishant. Ishant uh, is, uh, we have external, we have internal shunt, but it's a, Ishant is a, is a unique. Uh, this is the paper that uh, wrote by, by Adele and, and Carl and was published already, uh, the transdural CS shunt for hydrocephalus. Uh, that's very small valve mimics uh, arachnoid granulation, try to reabsorb uh, everything like, like for the biomimetic way. It's very small, it's only 3.5 centimeters in length, and it's connecting IPS with the CP angle sister. 
Uh, what we aim into? Well, there is no borehole and, and this uh, and this occasion. Uh, we aim for less infection. There is no posture driving over drainage, which is important. There are not disconnections because it's only one piece. Uh, and of course, the, 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 the hospitalization is less and less, is one, one point half days. Uh, and, and up to today, we don't have a real complication. And there is, most important, there is no growth related revision. So there is a lot of, of, of anticipated, and this is the idea. I mean, the, the, the pilot idea comes, where is the place where you have closest a, a blood and CSF? Well, the inferior petrosus sinus, IPS, and the CP angle. Uh, you, if you can connect them and the base of the skull, this is, this is it. Um, so they design it, that's, this is the shunt. It is uh, between here and there, 3.5 uh, centimeters, 35 millimeters. This is the distal portion. Uh, with the anchor, which goes inside of the subarachnoid space, uh, is three millimeters and eight. And this is the proximal portion. This is a, a marker, and here is the valve. That portion goes proximal uh, inside of the jugular vein. Uh, so this usually this is the procedure. The video is accelerated for uh, for timing. Uh, but this is the first portion. The first portion is an anchor. An anchor you can manage to go with this. Uh, with this rectangular guy where it's not a circular guy where uh, and goes to the cavernous sign ipsi lateral or contralateral I, I prefer actually go to the contralateral uh, so once you have that anchor in place uh, you comes with the second portion which is the catheter itself it's a four french catheter uh, that allow you to go and puncture the dura at that time and deliver the device inside of the inside of it's easy like a uh, in the cartoon, uh, it's not that easy, guys. Well, the this is the this is the ishan. This is the body of of, of the ishan. This is the subarachnoid portion, and this is the proximal portion. Uh, so the idea, the mentors come from Boston. Those are the people who were involved not only in the develop and the invention, but also in the develop of all the all the device, all the system. And those are my people from Buenos Aires. Uh, we went during the COVID time. We went to. We were lucky because we took a flight from uh, Buenos Aires to Santiago de Chile, and from Santiago de Chile to Boston, uh, in the unique way because everything was closed. But we managed to go there, and we did our uh, preclinical work, uh, in vitro study, cadaver work, everything in Boston. All team was was there. And I just to show you, this is the cadaver. Uh, you know, this is the way that we puncture uh, and the needle is out of, of the internal uh, conduct. And if you can see, no shunt is here. We just puncture the dura. The shunt is there. And we are getting out of the IPS at that uh, at that level. Uh, how we can prove that it worked? Well, here you can see the dropping of the CSF, in the sheet from, from the, um, from the, the mag cisterna magna in that particular model. Uh, so it's work. So again, Two components. One is the anchor. You go very distal, you anchor the system, and through this anchor, you come in with the second, with the second device, which comes with the needle inside. It's a small catheter, needle guard to protect to protect the needle. And when you withdraw uh, the markers, the needle is exposed. When the, the needle is exposed, you bring everything down from the IPS and you advance the system to puncture the dura. Uh, I strongly recommend to have uh, somebody from coronary in the room uh, for the interventional cardiology. This is a, this is the real real moment. Uh, so again, the needle is already protected. It's here in the back. It's protected for this needle guard. You have to align both market, distal marker, and proximal marker. What you align to two markers, the needle is ready for puncture, uh, and you must advance at that time. When you advance, uh, you deliver the, the device. Um, and after you have to withdraw everything slowly uh, and, and release release everything and the level of the jugular valve. What do you need? Well, we always do a venogram. What does the venogram mean? To the 27 catheter that we implant first, we do an uh, injection, either an APS or, 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 or even sometimes in the jugular valve, and you see both both IPS, nicely both APS, coronary sinus. I'm used usually go from 
one side to other side, try to avoid the, 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 the position of the six, six nerve. Remember the six nerves is, is nearby there. So I'm crossing the line, I'm going contralateral usually. So in that sense, I am I avoid am I avoid him, uh, I avoid it. Uh, and, and here you have the venogram. So you have the IPS from one side, IPS from the other side. This is the place that you must avoid. The, the sixth nerve is 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 there. Uh, usually, I am using now the nine French and seven French like a guiding uh, catheter. I do I sub overimpose the convincity with the venogram and my 3D row mapping in, 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 in our suite. So you have your target, you see the target, and you advance towards the target. Uh, so there are two things essential. The combine is essential, and the over post put image on the, on the 3D on the room. Uh, of course, the challenge was to deliver that very small uh, shunt inside of the brain uh, through the endovascular approach. Uh, that was... Uh, Characterized very nicely by by the tough people, they they did uh, 36 cadavers and they they characterized very nicely the anatomy of, of the school base. Uh, as, as you probably know, because you are most of you are neurosurgeon, is very is is not straightforward. There, there is a lot of variation and anatomy uh, at, at that level. Uh, so again, distal location, proximal level, those are the IPS. We usually choose the best diameter that we have, uh, the best anatomy. Uh, the important thing, we have to minimize the risk of the patient. How we can do that? Well, we have we got a rate out of the inadequate uh, patient anatomy, meaning narrow or tortuous venous vasculature, small CP, cistern size, you need at least six millimeters uh, for the puncture. Otherwise, the brain stain will be very close to you. So between six and ten is is the safe is the safe way. Uh, we have to rule out the presence of the arterial small arteries or neural structure near the the penetration site. So uh, how you can do that? Well, you have to do MRI before and you have to do CT before because sometimes the IPS is in, inside of the bone. It's not outside of the bone. It's inside of the bone. So you have to rule out that with the with this scan. We present all the work to our regulatory body uh, and mat uh, that allow us all those, those innovations to, to, to make, to go through. And they approve the first protocol. Uh, actually, we have three protocols of with Cerevasc. The first one was for a communicating hydrocephalus uh, for subarachnoid bleeding. Uh, that was the first, it was called ETCHES. The second one was an NPH. And the third one we're working now on, on IAH. Uh, looks very also very promising. So any single bleeding uh, post aneurysm that we insert the AVD and we have ICP more than 20 millimeters of mercury for more than 15 minutes or more than 25 for less than 15 minutes. That allow us to go inside the, the protocol with the with other uh, inclusion criteria. Uh, the first question that you probably have, have you followed those patients? Yes, we have to follow those patients for two years. So since we start, we follow them, we implant them, and we follow them for two years in our in our study. Two very important things, as I mentioned, the convincity, the convincity that you overimpose with the 3D uh, and, and, and make your, your target. Uh, and also pre that, also the MRI, it's very nice to see the, the anatomy, the anatomy of, of the IPS, the anatomy of the CP angle, and the CT that confirm that there is no obstruction. Uh, this is an example. You need at least six millimeters from there, from the IPS to the brainstem, and you have to have a look because sometimes the contralateral verb is going to the, to the system. You have to avoid that because uh, you can puncture that. Uh, it's not a good idea. Uh, and this is the overhand. The, the Petrus bone overhand is very important. You have to rule out that with the CT basis. And this is very good position. Here, you will not get out of the bone, uh, which is important. When we have all the information, we send all the information to the, to the people in Boston, and they do a volumetric reconstruction, which is based on MRI and, and, and they superimpose CT bone image. Blue is the IPS and the cavernous sinus, and red is the arterial tree. So 
we, we are sure that there is nothing there. When we were ready, we go and, and try to, uh, to implant the work. So this is the first case that we did in human. Uh, people from Boston came to Buenos Aires. They review everything with us. And we already published that uh, in journal Neurointerventional. That was a, a lady with the with the MCA aneurysm that we call. Uh, we treat her. Uh, she developed after ten days a, a, a deficit. We implanted AVD, and uh, we include uh, on on that. You see, during the clamp test, we have to reopen very quickly because the pressure goes very 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 fast, very high. So we leave everything open until the day of the procedure. The day of the procedure. We close the we close again the EVD before we do the cases, and this is the case uh, with, with very good distance between on the right, very good distance on the left. We choose the right uh, because also the the diameter was was much nicer, and it looks uh, it looks that was a little bit more easy. Uh, and this is the, again the multi the multi parametric reconstruction would overimpose the image that we rule out any any vessel there. Uh, the convene show us uh, very nice the anatomy, so we overimpose the convene uh, with uh, and with the three D, and we have the target side. This is the target side, so we have to advance and hook the the interdugal catheter at the level of the emergency of the IPS, and after we advance to the contralateral side, I deliver the anchor, came back and go for the target. Uh, this is the first generation. There is very few change regarding the second one. Uh, here you have to align distal and proximal marker as we did. When you align both markers, the needle is ready to go and you advance to puncture, to puncture the dura. Uh, there are some, uh, some very uh, good points in safety. Uh, you need to separate the needle. The needle has to separate from the flat rail. The flat rail goes in this direction. The needle goes in this direction. Uh, so when you when you have that uh, done, you are ready to advance and puncture. Um, here the, the the needle is there. I am advancing the device. The device is sitting here inside. So I am advancing the device. Now the device is out in the subarachnoid space, and you see very nicely in the video how it drops inside of the CSF. Uh, that re reassures you that uh, you are in you are in, in good place. Um, so. This is some of the changes that we have with the generation two. I must say that they react very, very fast with the problems that we have before. Sometimes the procedure was a little bit long. Today, I, I, I saw Ricardo did a, a case and I think 45 minutes, something like that. Uh, so, so the generation two is much, much better. You see how I advance in the device. The device is already there. I'm taking out the micro catheter uh, down. So this is the... To be sure, I, I always do a lot of convene. Uh, I like to have my my device out of the IPS. The IPS is there in this coronal view. The device is outside, is outside, so I am very happy. Uh, sometimes you can see the, the, the body of the implant sitting, uh, going down. This is the distal, and this is the proximal portion going down to the jugular valve. Well, probably the question that you, you have at that point, how you prove that it works? Well, it proves because you have the AVD uh, already uh, closed, and you see how how the drops here. I implanted the device. You see the dropping of the of the ICP, and it's sustained for thirty six hours. Uh, so so that was the the proof that that uh, things work as well as the monitor. You have the monitor there, and you drop from twenty eight, twenty six to six, less always less than that, and. Just to show you the video, a very short video uh, with the real, uh, this, this is the real patient. We made, we made that video after. So I am retrieving everything now. I'm going to the target place. The target place is, is there. The, here is the flat rail. Here is the needle. So now I am I do a contrast injection, making sure there is no extravasation. Before I puncture, I reverse the heparin. I inject protamine. And that time I'm ready, I am advancing Sorry, I am advancing. Uh, was a little bit fast. I am advancing the malicot. Your malicot has a very small distal a mark and a, a bigger proximal mark. Now it's going. I'm advancing now. You see the marker there, probably. 
So it's already advanced, it's in place. And of, and of course, After, after the training, you need to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. Yes, yes, you can feel it when you go to the Dura. Um, so this is the proof of the concept. We were able to drop the ICP and it remains like that. What not only in that case, but also in the this is the draw of the first eight patients. Uh, you see the, the pressure is always uh, we drop the pressure on any single in any single patient. So in Argentina, we have those those uh, uh, three, three protocols. In US, they have the, the NPH study that is running actually. And there is a second study that haven't started yet with uh, in, in the bleeding cases of, uh, of, of superalbumin bleeding cases. So we have a total of nine cases, uh, eight of uh, eight were implanted successfully. I have to withdraw one to do, do, to do one in, in infection that I have. Uh, we were not sure, so we decided to take uh, to take the the device out. Uh, probably, probably you are curious how I can do that. Just just with a lasso, uh, or with a I did. I think I did with a solitaire. I I used the solitaire. I I grabbed the the proximal part. I took everything out, and the patient went fine. So, we I think we in that particular cases we achieved some important milestone. We proved the concept that is possible. We, we, we prove the concept that we can control with CT or with MRI. Uh, the, the placement is very stable. We always using uh, used to see better with CT and MRI. And of course, I think the value, the tremendous values you saw in the in the in the in the Matthew talks. I mean, the value of that is not only for hydrocephalus, probably probably implication for access platform for delivery genes or whatever you want inside inside of the brain. So just to show you the, the some changes with the generation one, everything that I show you now was was generation first, and this is second generation. Uh, the shroud, which is a hypotube that compress compress the the real valve, is is uh, has a, a, an approximal implant that give us more, much more uh, release, more safe, uh, and the and the constraint. It, it it really gets very nicely the tube and separately very nicely. So you just have to pull and everything is out. It's much, much safer in that in that regards. And this is some minor changes. I mean, the needle now has a mark, has a superior mark that tell you if you are in the right direction, you have to always be, always be superior with the needle uh, when you puncture the IPS. So uh, what about the NPH? Everybody in this room is very happy with the endovascular treatment of stroke. Now, after all those trials, we are very pretty sure that we can we have a role in, in endovascular treatment of, of, of strokes. But what about the chronic phase of stroke? What about those pe people who have a vascular dementia uh, to, because they have a NPH uh, or they have some vascular cognitive impairments? Uh, so are, are we going to play a role? You know, the vascular dementia today is, is the second most common cause of, of dementia after Alzheimer. So maybe we can do something for that, that particular of, of I call reversible uh, dementia. This is not new. Uh, that was, uh, it's very well known in the literature uh, by, by Adams and Hakim, especially, especially Hakim, that was a pioneer of treating with, uh, with the VP shunt uh, NPH. And uh, we share with uh, with MPH a lot of vascular risk factor. Most of those pa patients are hypertense, uh, uh, and they have another another uh, factor that we had in common. Uh, so you know very well, as probably better than me, that normal pressure hydrocephalus has a triad of, of things. There, is a, there are cognitive dysfunction, uh, some impaired gait, and some urinary incontinence. And this is a typical view that uh, you have. Uh, uh, the Evans, the Evans index is a little bit higher, and also there is some colossal uh, impairment. Uh, so we receive the green light for our body to do an NPH study using Cerevas in Argentina. And again, has to we has to go to the a lot of testing, uh, tax test, incontinency test, uh, MoMA MoMA test for cognitive dysfunction. Once everything is done, we puncture, we see the we see the, the, the pressure, 
and we, we could qualify. In that particular protocol, we follow the patients only for one year, not two years like we did in, in, in HS, in the bleeding cases. Uh, and this is this is uh, one of the of the of the patient that has gait instability, urinary incontinence, and MOCA 23 over th over 30. So here again, the target is in place. The needle is vertical. Remember, you are coming in this way, backward, and that point you see you, you see the, the the needle is ready to puncture. So at that point, you advance and you deliver the shunt at the CP. Uh, uh, angle sister, and see here you can see uh, the the in, in in the CP angle you see the malicot and you see the proximal part sitting and and the, and the jugular vein. How do you test that is working? Well, in the first cases we did cisternography. Remember uh, that very old thing. Uh, we inject some uh, some gadolinium, and you see how the how the uh, how it, the gadolinium drops through the shunt uh, to the toward the jugular valve, valve like in that, that particular case, or you see much better in the axial view, probably there. Uh, the malicot is high potence. You don't see the malicot really with gadolinium. Uh, so the patient usually improve. I, I, I show you the, the table, but uh, this, the, that particular patient, 90 days improve gait, uh, the incontinence, and also the, the cognitive impairment. In that part, we have 13 patients enrolled. In Buenos Aires, and all of them we implanted successfully. What happened with the follow up? Well, this patient, the number five, it didn't improve really at 90 days, but you see what happened with them at, at 180 days. Really improved. I keep, keep sustaining the improvement in incontinence, uh, cognition, and gait uh, on all those that they already reached 180 days. Uh, what about the stage in the hospital? The media was 1.7 days. Uh, we don't have procedure related uh, problems with those patients. Just to show you one of the of the tests uh, that we did, uh, left and right, and the patient really uh, improved um, after after the shunting, as you can see. Sometimes those cases are really are really dramatic. The last thing that I want to show you, we did uh, one case, and we have two more patients waiting uh, for AIH. Uh, this is an interesting, very interesting case. Uh, he was uh, carrying the disease since six years. Uh, he was getting blind. Um, uh, he has multiple lumbar puncture. The only thing that he asked me, please don't give me, don't do it, another lumbar puncture on me. I don't want to have any, any, any more anymore. Uh, he has diplopia at that time. You see the the MRI showing some flat flattening in both uh, and optic nerves. Uh, empty cella and Meckel cave uh, a little bit bigger than usually. Tell you true, I, I thought that was uh, some stenosis in the veins. Uh, so I, I searched for that. I measured everything was no gradient in any any single sinus. So the venogram was done. Uh, as you can see, both sides were very good one. Uh, and again, we choose uh, uh, here. You, you see the malicot is in the subarachnoid space. And here is the device. And at 30 days, you see how uh, gadolinium is coming out of the proximal portion of the of the valve at the level of the jugular valve. Uh, so that was the proof of the concept. This is the the MRI um, uh, five months. He he really we changed uh, his life. He said that uh, he was very happy, uh, no more migraine, and he see see so much better. He improved his vision. Uh, Yes, it's just a short interview. I'm not sure it's going to work. It's... Uh, so I think that was the first report that we we saw that we can also can have a place to treat AIH. Not only like primary objective, but maybe some of those cases that we have to retreat it because we didn't cure them with the stenting. Maybe some of those cases require a stenting and 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 uh, cerevasque valve. Uh, so I'm um, just to conclude. I think the CP angle to IPS uh, shunting is is feasible. Uh, it decreases really the ICP. I, now is there are several centers. Ricardo did. Uh, uh, we're very happy. Uh, first case in in, in Florida um, can be very safe. Uh, perform it uh, under image guidance as you as you saw. And this approach provides. 
uh, percutaneous access platform. I think this is very important. Uh, the ISHAN was stable and we can follow them with CT and MRI. Of course, uh, everybody knows you are sitting there and thinking, guys, it is very preliminary. It is preliminary. We need more data uh, uh, to be, be uh, to have a clinical validation. So you already saw the future direction that uh, already show you Malik uh, is working on that uh, with, with Matthew Goni's group. He, he already, there are several things that we can inject. I think the, uh, the, the importance of that, uh, you can have a, a, in some part, a, a, a small thing to inject things and you can repeat the injection over the time, which is also, I think, I think is important. Guys, thank you for everything. Thank you for having me here. And uh, this is my team in Buenos Aires. I'm very grateful to, to all of them. Uh, as I said, I hope to see you in Istanbul. Very nice place. Come join us from the 7th to the 10th of May. We have a WNC. If you if you miss that, you, you still come to Buenos Aires uh, in September. Uh, I give you the opportunity. This is our course in September, springtime, very nice. Uh, is, is the weather probably is not nice like in Jacksonville, but not bad. Uh, so thank you for your attention. Sure. Uh, of, of course, uh, you would expect a, a question from me, uh, one who deals with hydrocephalus every week um, as a pediatric neurosurgeon. Uh, I have a reverse course with you. I, I um, uh, trained in Miami with Roberto Heros, uh, but I decided to be a pediatric neurosurgeon. Now I came to Jacksonville and, and Ricardo has turned me into a semi-vascular uh, pediatric neurosurgeon. Um, but my, my question for you, obviously, the, your cases are, um, uh, they look, the hydrocephalus looks to be obstructive in nature. And um, uh, uh, I'm just waiting for, you smart people to uh, tell me that uh, maybe we can do a trial in, in children. Um, uh, there's there's uh, uh, obviously much a much, much bigger patient population that this would benefit from. So um, uh, is that uh, being thought of? Uh, you know, um, uh, I know you're talking about exciting things like drug delivery and stuff, but, but I think there's a lot more to do with hydrocephalus. Well, yes, thank you for the question. Yeah, yes. Uh... Uh, so you, you start with the neurosurgery, you become pediatric neurosurgery right after. I think Ricardo convinced everybody, you know, this is a problem. Uh, but uh, now the question is, the protocol is very strict, 18 years and old. Uh, of course, I think with the time being, some communicative hydrocephalus should be treated under 18. As a matter of fact, after I start to speak in meetings, uh, I, I got uh, some application for, for children's, uh, with tuberos, uh, tuberculosis, uh, and, and, and after after that, uh, some uh, hydrocephalus, communicating hydrocephalus. Um, but today we are just facing, uh, and the protocol is for for adults. But I, I I'm sure that we play a role. I mean, uh, the, the device is very short, but the communication will be not bigger than than 30, 35 millimeters, even uh, in, the, in the older population. So I think. From that, uh, I, I won't see any any problem for that. Probably you 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 were you were doing some atrial shunts, or no? So you are familiar with with those those shunts. Um, this is a kind of variant of 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 that, but uh, just a single connection inside of the brain. It's very promising. I think I think uh, uh, Pedro, you, you can speak more, but I think the company has to pick a target, and they are. They're going, so we, we had two protocols in the US. We got approved for subarachnoid hemorrhage and NPH protocol, but the company decided in, in, in Argentina they're doing uh, all three in the United States is NPH only. So they're going to complete a certain number of cases and then they're going to present the data to the FDA. Don't know that, but there's a good chance the FDA is going to say you're going to have to randomize against VP shunt to get an indication to us. Uh, so that's going to be interesting. I think we have a long road up ahead of us, a couple of years to study this in a specific uh, uh, disease that will be NPH, and then from that open the door for other. Once it's approved, then, but I think we're a couple of years away from that, giving our regulatory pathway. 
Yes, they will need more data probably. But now there are several centers that they start doing more cases and Matuk is doing a lot of cases. And I think uh, you will have more more data very, very soon. I think we need that because the numbers are very scattered and we need bigger numbers probably. But so far, it's not bad. I have a quick question about um, uh, the superacnoid hemorrhage patients. How, how, uh, what's the diameter of the draining catheter and have you encountered because you're waiting for seven days, then you do a clamping testing, and if it goes above the numbers that you presented, you just uh, automatically do it. Have you had any clotting of the uh, of the catheter because of the thickness of the blood at that time? Yeah, well, that was one of the things that we were really afraid. Of. The tube is very small; it's one less than two millimeters. Uh, so, so the it's very, it's very thin. The rate is ten cc per hour at a nominal pressure of between five and 10 millimeters of mercury. Uh, so this is the rate. Uh, so once you have a flow, uh, permanent flow, the clotting is, 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 is unusual. We have only uh, one clotting, uh, late clotting 10 days after at the, at, at that, at the level of the jugular belt. Uh, distal, distal is interesting because it was distal to the, to the proximal portion of, of the device. Uh, but we are not using any antiplatelet drugs. Uh, we don't, uh, we put that patient in anticoagulants and, 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 and the thrombosis clear uh, right after. But this is one of the concerns, you, you're right. I, I had one more question. What, what prevents a reflux like, like with Valsalva or, or, or whatnot uh, of, of the venous blood into the subarachnoid space? Good question. The valve, they, they, they have a valve. Proximally, you have not only the marker, but the valve. You have a very slit valve there that prevents for, for reflex. Uh, they, they, this is something that everybody told. I mean, what happens if you have a patient that has a valve salva uh, or, 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 or cuff? Uh, but really, there is a valve there that prevents reflux inside of uh, in the reverse way. Uh, slit valve five five millimeters of mercury. So anything that is above five would drain, but doesn't allow. So one way, right? So it doesn't let you reflux. only one way. Yeah, today. But to inject things, you will need two two ways. But it's the next step. Thank you. Hey, good afternoon, guys. So for all of you that stayed into late Friday afternoon when there were a lot of things to do outside with the beautiful weather, I want you to know that I appreciate you. Uh, so we're going to start the neurocritical session, uh, slight change in program. We're going to start with Dr. Blanco. Uh, Dr. Blanco uh, grew up on the streets of Colombia, not literally, metaphorically. <laughs> he did his medical training in Colombia, uh, did his PhD in neuroscience in Germany because he's a world traveler. He wanted to explore new worlds, I guess. Came back to the US, did his residency in neurology at the Cleveland Clinic and uh, did his fellowship at Johns Hopkins, which is where I first met him. Uh, I always try to tell my fellows when I train them, you know, you don't have to have all the answers. You just have to ask the right questions. It was hard with Manny though, as I'll call him uh, forever, because he uh, had all the answers already. Uh, I was the one left with the questions and it made me realize I had to go back and read so I could try and impart some knowledge. Uh, he is one of the smartest graduates that ever graduated from Hopkins. Uh, among his many accomplishments at UCLA, where he's been faculty for a decade now, uh, was training our very own Dr. Chamesani. And just for that, he deserves a significant amount of applause. <laughs> and so welcome, Manny. We are proud to have you here. Thank you. Thank you, Niraj, and thank you to the organizers of the meeting, Dr. Hanel, the Neurological Institute. Um, okay, let me uh, go ahead and see if I can get my presentation going here. And I think it's right here. So it should be... Projecting? Not yet. Try again. Oh, 
Okay. I see it here, but I don't see it up there. So let's see again. Oh. It was there for a second, right? Hey, there we go. <clears throat> Wonderful. Okay, let me just see here. And I'll probably do it from the keyboard. Wonderful, thank you, uh, Dr. Naval and the organizers. Uh, yeah, we are going to uh, switch gears. Well, I, I wanted to say that, yes, we, we tried to train Dr. Chamasani and he clearly is an amazing neurointensivist. Um, Glad to be here. Thank you for the invitation. So what I will be talking about will uh, essentially be some of the dilemmas we face in neurocritical care. And, and two of the um, topics that I will cover essentially will uh, include some, some TBI dilemmas and, of course, intracerebral hemorrhage, which is more pertinent for the audience, uh, given, given your interests. Um, so we're going to talk about some of the, of the issues we've been facing the last uh, 10, 15 years some of the progress in the research. And then um, I will um, dive into some of the recent trials and some of the upcoming innovations that are already happening in, in neurocritical care. So um, we're gonna go quickly here that um, through a quick case scenario, this is a young patient that came with a rapidly declining GCS after a motor vehicle accident from 12 down to 10 with um, essentially fixed pupils on arrival to the ICU. Uh, I'm sorry, to the emergency room. Uh, one other passenger was essentially um, uh, undergoing CPR, uh, didn't make it through through the whole thing. And then this is what we found on the CT scan. So so when you ask anyone what to do in this situation, you may, you may find a myriad of responses here. Um, and what you see is really a brain occupying lesion, a, a subdural hematoma with brain compression. So most likely most people would say, well, this is something we could, we could rush and evacuate. But when you, when you see somebody with that exam, um, essentially there, there could be some dilemmas. I mean, is this somebody that is salvageable, is not salvageable? So what we did in this case really is we, we placed the patient on the brain code protocol, gave some hypertonics, and within 15 minutes, we saw responses in the pupils. And after some nihilism in the emergency room, this patient eventually made it to the operating room and got the surgery they needed. So this is the CT scan five hours post arrival. And right here is really the time course over the following 48 hours, meaning that um, this patient really woke up even by the end of day one, by the end of day two, the patient was weaned off of the ventilator, he was extubated. And the following day, the patient was essentially ready to move out of the ICU. And so, so that's a straightforward slam dunk case. You, you're, you're gonna all agree that this is a surgical emergency, the patient will be decompressed, but then things get more complicated when you see something like this, where you have uh, multiple foci of brain hemorrhage that are clearly traumatic uh, in multiple locations, or when you see something like this, where you're trying to determine what to do. And that's, that's where the dilemma begins, where we don't really, until recently knew exactly what to do, how to manage these folks. And we did have some guidance from, from the Brain Trauma Foundation, but it's really one of those situations where uh, the emergence of clinical trials has, has really helped uh, uh, with the dilemma. So this is data from the decompressive, the DECRA trial in the uh, early um, 2011, when basically we achieved a pretty good biological uh, improvement of intracranial pressure after the compressive surgery. What you see in these two lines here really is the ICP waveforms for the standard of care group, which is the non-surgical group and the decompressive group. So pretty good biological endpoint. And these patients were uh, um, essentially developed some intracranial hypertension for some time. But when we jump to the outcomes, really what we saw was a no change in the ordinal um, outcomes. There was no benefit when you compare these patients um, craniectomy versus standard of care in terms of the distribution in the MRS, uh, uh, I'm sorry, in the Glasgow outcome scales. 
So this was one of the first trials that gave a lot of frustration to the community. We were, of course, uh, disappointed. And then we saw things like this, uh, hypothermia and temperature control for, for traumatic brain injury. Similar story, a good control in the temperature, basically in the hypothermia group, as you can see on this curve, right here to the right side. Uh, let me see if I can point actually at it. Is this a laser pointer? Uh, right here, controlling the temperature, but really not much of a an improvement on, on the actual uh, outcomes when you actually look at the modified ranking score. So again, second disappointment, a lot of frustration. And similar to this situation, we, we were facing the intracerebral hemorrhage story. So this is a classic hematoma. It's a small basal ganglia hemorrhage. You would say maybe not that small, probably closer to 25 ml in volume. The question comes what to do. I mean, there is going to be a debate. Is this something we're going to rush to the OR? Well, we, we have some guidance. Um, there has been some improvement of uh, the evidence in terms of what to do with blood pressure, but Dr. Naval will, will give that talk, so I'm not going to step into that. And then the question comes, what, what to do when you get something like this, right? I mean, this is a question of, is this a survival hemorrhage? What is the volume? What is the uh, you know, prior functional baseline of this patient? What are we going to do? So one of the first trials that really opened the field of the neurocritical care um, uh, array, uh, expertise in terms of management of these patients was really trying to stop the uh, hematoma expansion that occurs early in these patients. And this is data from MIS, uh, from FAST trial, which was the uh, phase three uh, randomized clinical trial between TPA and uh, standard medical care. And despite having had a good biological effect on hematoma expansion, unfortunately, the Kaplan, Kaplan Meyer curves didn't show any uh, significant improvement when you look at the actual um, survival rates for placebo, 20 and 80 micrograms per kg. So you can see those here. There are disappointment. Again, the field was really beat by all of these trials coming and coming. And so when you look at surgical history, really the idea of removing the blood out of the brain is not a new idea. This has been going on for about, what, 50, 60 years now. People have been thinking, you get a brain hemorrhage, well, the patient is disabled now, we have some, some mass occupying lesion, what is the right thing to do? And so it is not really until recently when we start seeing these surgical trials, Stitch 2 is the one that I just shared, that we, we started understanding a little bit more the biology of the disease. So... So here, uh, this is data from stitch one, actually. This is the first stitch trial, surgical decompression for these types of uh, um, intracranial hematomas. This was a huge effort, large uh, multinational center trial aimed at evacuating the blood. There was really a lot of leniency as to what the interventionists could do, the surgeons could do, and different than perhaps the, the endovascular trials, where you have a specific protocol and a specific things that the surgeons, the, the interventionists can do, even the devices. In this type of surgery, there was really an open-ended type of, of intervention. So not surprisingly, um, the benefit in survival was really not that, not essentially, no, no significant difference between early surgery versus standard conservative care. So again, stitch two really was um, a more sophisticated trial in the sense that it allowed us to really select those patients uh, narrow the time window for evacuation, talk a little bit more about the technique, what to do, a little bit more standardization. And, and that being said, uh, again, we, we had this sort of survival uh, difference between um, early surgery versus standard of care type of intervention. So as you can see, the significance was not there. But there was a very important thing that this trial gave us, and this is where really the field starts changing. After again, yet another disappointment, and is that really perhaps some patients may benefit from some interventions versus other patients. And I think that's been one of the common themes also for endovascular trials. You have that dilemma of, you know, what is the real mechanism we're trying to address? What type of hematoma are we trying to evacuate? And really, is there a biological impact of our intervention? Let's say when you put somebody on a certain drug or on a certain uh, physiologic control measure, what is the impact of that intervention? And that is important because depending on the degree of biological impact, perhaps you're going to have a different uh, calculation for your, for your sample size. And so really is the impact direct or indirect in the sense of 
comparing, for example, a surgical trial to FAST, where FAST was really trying to control the expansion of the hematoma, where STITCH is really aimed at evacuating the hematoma. So I would say the impact of something like uh, factor seven is perhaps an indirect impact versus you know evacuating the hematoma, which is really taking the bull by the horns, right? And so here, should the intervention would uh, be given to everybody? It's another dilemma. Perhaps this is one of the reasons some, some trials work and some trans, trials don't work. What is the time of the intervention? What is the right time to do this? And finally, what are the outcomes that are we looking at? I mean, all of these trials have really been focused mostly on mortality. And only recently we have shifted the attention to us towards truly a functional outcome, which is at the end of the day, what people really, those who survive care about, right? How am I, how am I gonna be, is, is how functional can I be? What is gonna happen to my, to my daily living? So now with TBI, they have the guidelines. Uh, this is just a picture to show you that the Brain Trauma Foundation guidelines recommends that we keep the CPP right here between about 50 to 70, meaning that that's, that's what the guidelines say. Oh, okay, so it must be true. Well, guess what? There are many patients who live with a CPP where their uh, optimum number is, is, is way higher, perhaps in the 80s to 100s. And that can be elucidated by looking at numbers like the PRX, which is really an indicator of endo uh, intravascular or cerebral autoregulation. Now, this study is interesting, even though it's not a large scale study, but this is the type of research we've been seeing lately, where you can see the PRX. The PRX is again, a curve that indicates how the patient is autoregulating through different ranges of the CPP. In different colors, you see different phenotypes of that PRX. For example, this patient in blue right here has a very low PRX, meaning that it's, it's really the, the, co the correlation coefficient between uh, intracranial pressure and the blood pressure. And, and that being said, th this is the kind of patient that you would say, well, this patient is auto-regulating. Therefore, those patients perhaps are healthier when you look at them physiologically. So in this study, really what we saw is that there was really a difference between different phenotypes, not only in the autoregulatory curve, but also in outcomes. So that is starts telling you something that really perhaps not all interventions should be the same for everybody. We should understand the biology, try and understand how the patient is behaving, and then determine perhaps what interventions they need. So that, with that being said, um, one of the recent studies that really shifted the balance towards more physiologic control before offering an aggressive procedure is the, the um, um, rescue ICP trial published in 2016. And so really what this study did for TBI was to stratify the patient through different degrees of treatment, stage one, stage two, and stage three. So these are the things that doctors can do through stage one protocol at this particular stage. We're gonna control certain basic things like analgesia, head positioning, uh, central venous pressure, all the things that are considered to be tier one, therapies or interventions. And then in stage two, you start doing more neurocritical care, putting an EVD, controlling the ICP, controlling the temperature. And only when you have gotten to this point, when you have maximized all of those therapies, only at that point, the patient became a candidate for either decompressive surgery versus something uh, like pentobarbital or uh, barbiturate coma. And so that perhaps is one of the most important contributions of this study is giving us that idea that you cannot just go in and decompress every single patient that has intracranial pressure. There is a phenotype that may benefit from it, and that was the key with this trial. So what you're seeing here is really the number of patients in the surgical group that actually ended up having a, uh, included surgery in the in this study. And then uh, when you look at the medical group, clearly there was one third of the patients, 37%, still had surgery, which means that even though they got randomized to the medical arm, after some time, somebody said, okay, the patient's gonna die unless we do surgery. So we need to talk to the family and they went into the surgical arm. So even with that crossover, 37% in the medical arm, the outcomes were actually quite impressive. So what you're seeing here is the uh, GOSC, which is a, 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 an ordinal scale for outcomes in black, uh, all the way down towards the left and then red, uh, red and green, blue towards the right. You see the, the surgical group attributed mortality of about what? 28% versus about 50% in the in the medical arm. And that perhaps is the one thing that this study showed. There was a mortality benefit. Now, now you have a phenotype. We have a patient, we have a set of things that have been tried and failed. This patient is getting the compression. This patient is gonna do better. I mean, eventually survive. Now, the, the problem with rescue ICP, 
Now, this is the 12-month outcome, is that really, when you look at the ordinal shift of those who survived, there was no true significant difference in how they did. And there was perhaps some trend towards the surgical group with perhaps a little bit more patients in the, in the um, highly disabled uh, range. And, and then the distribution of the ones that did better, obviously there were some people with some moderate to severe disability. So that has been an argument and it's an ongoing debate. You know, is, this is essentially a life-saving procedure, but we still don't have something that will save your life and make you substantially better. So here's where other things like brain tissue oxygenation have come. Usually we place these probes in the ICU. This is a CT scan showing here an oxygen probe right next to an EVD, somebody with uh, intracranial hypertension after TBI. And what this preliminary study from the uh, Lausanne group showed is that if you actually retrospectively looked at a cohort of people who had these Lycox probes placed, and you actually look at how they did before and after craniectomy, those patients who actually had an improvement in the brain tissue oxygenation, which is the empty circles here versus the black circles, those actually seem to be the ones who ended up doing better. Meaning that, okay, now we have a brain tissue oxygen monitor, you get that decompressive surgery. If your brain tissue oxygen numbers improve, that, that perhaps is an indication that that, that tissue is viable. Now, this was not a retros uh, this was not a prospective trial. This is still has to be uh, obviously looked more in detail, and there is actually an ongoing trial looking into this. But that's again yet another indication of a goal directed therapy that could potentially be implemented. So, the Boost Two trial, which uh, is already finalized, is a phase two study looking at patients who were managed by looking at ICP only versus ICP plus PVTO2 uh, optimization really was done to determine a few things, safety, feasibility, and whether this could give us some hint into the outcomes of these patients. So right here you see basically four phenotypes, phenotypes A, B, C, D. Type A is somebody with normal ICP and normal PBTO2. That's really the perfect patient. You don't do anything with those patients. You monitor them, you just follow them longitudinally. The second phenotype is somebody with high ICP, but normal PBTO2. So those patients will require a smaller control, head optimization, position, et cetera, all the maneuvers you do in the ICU. And then C and D are the phenotypes where you either have normal ICP and low oxygen or high ICP and low oxygen. So I would say phenotype D is the worst case scenario. It's your ICP is high and your PBTO2 is low, your oxygen levels are low in the brain, that patient is in crisis. So in the boost two, things like these were seen. For example, this is somebody, that line going up and down right here is the brain tissue oxygen. The green line is the areas where the patient's actually having a normal PVTO2, which is considered to be above 20 millimeters of mercury. And every time they went down below 20, something was done. The blood pressure was increased, oxygen delivery was increased, ventilator was adjusted, whatever. And then all the time that the patient spent below goal, those were the times when interventions were being done. Again, this was a phase two trial, and these are these are the GOSC for six and um, six months at the top. I, I'm not going to talk about the DRS, but it's another uh, uh, clinical outcome. But really, for those who really were managed only based on ICP, even though this was a feasibility trial, there was a higher incidence of mortality on those on those patients. Now, again. The purpose of the study was to show whether this was safe, this was feasible, can we do it in the ICU? The answer is yes. Boost three is happening right now. Uh, enrollment in the, uh, init was initiated in 2019. Completion date has been delayed, of course, because through 2020 through 2023, almost all of the enrollment was halted. But now, probably within the next two or three years, we're gonna see finally the results of the uh, Boost three study. But just wanted to bring you up to speed with that. Now, what this has led to really is this type of agreement that there is going to be some algorithm to manage intracranial pressure. This is for TBI, of course, we're not talking about ICH yet. Now, now we have some protocols that are essentially goal directed. We have some guidelines as to what should be done first, which is tier one, what should be done next, which this is tier two. I have some examples here, controlling the PCO2, controlling the blood pressure, perhaps using more sedation, more paralytics, temperature control, CPP optimization, so on and so forth. And so that is the type of result of this kind of goal-directed study. Now, with ICH, again, the ultra-early hemostasis story has not ended. Now we know FAST was a negative study. Now we know if you give the same therapy to all comers without, without any sort of uh, stratification, perhaps the patients are going to do 
differently depending on their phenotype and that in average is gonna manifest in the outcomes. Now, what do you do for this type of hematoma? Well, I mean, it depends where, where is the hematoma? Where, how early are we? Are we already in the post-expansion phase or not? So the whole idea of ultra early hemostasis was really to control this differential expansion that occurs in the very few hours, early hours within three to six hours of arrival to the emergency room. Now, from data obtained from the first study, we learned, and Stefan Mayer had already projected this about two, 14 years ago. Stefan had said, if you pick a young patient with an ICH that is relatively small, at least not too large, 60 ml is still a large hemorrhage, and you catch them relatively early with minimal IVH, maybe that patient will benefit. And that's what he showed in his uh, secondary analysis for FAST trial. Now, this is what led to the ongoing FASTES trial, which is happening right now as we speak. So FASTES, if you look at the actual inclusion criteria, what does it say? Well, actually, uh, yeah, that slide uh, is not here, but I, I'll tell you the inclusion criteria. The patient should be younger than 70 years old. They have to be early within 120 minutes, and the hematoma has to be exactly like Stefan said, less than 60 mLs. Now, we're enrolling patients for FASTES, Obviously, we don't know what the results are going to be, but now we have one specific phenotype we're pursuing here, and that is the ultra, ultra early, rather smaller hematoma, still big, but not as big as in the FAST trial, and now we'll see what the jury says. I think we're gonna have the same issue again. This is one factor. This is hematoma expansion, and this is where surgical evacuation really, really comes into place. Now, this is one of my favorite slides from all time in terms of ICH biology. This is from the Cincinnati group. Uh, basically showing here that uh, if you uh, distribute the hematoma size, each individual dot on this table is, is the size of a hematoma, the volume in mLs. And right here, what you see is really the, um, the uh, GOSC for these individual patients where the high number is dead, and then the lower numbers are really um, basically um, mild to moderate disability. The larger the hematoma, the more likely you are to be dead, right? I mean, that makes perfect sense. That's obvious. Now it's obvious, but back in 1990, it wasn't obvious. And so coming from this data, really there has been a lot of motivation to really actually not just like stopping the expansion of the hematoma, but getting rid of the hematoma. So the MISTI-2 trial was a phase two study, feasibility. We participated as one of the uh, basically few centers with neuro navigation and uh, ICU evacuation. So these patients would come to the ICU we will place the catheter at the bedside. What you see here is really a um, um, brain lab reconstruction here of a 35 ml hematoma. So in this type of uh, brain lab navigation, left is left and right is right. And what we're doing here is we're drilling a hole into the skull, trying to deliver uh, a catheter at the core of the hematoma. This is um, the, the neuro ICU team here, myself and Dr. Yang placing this catheter. This is from the training slides from the study. Basically, you use this neuro navigation device, the brain lab that most of you are familiar by now with. It utilizes radio frequency to um, essentially localize the uh, position of the patient in space, three-dimensional space. You place the AVD based on the neuro navigation. And then the first goal is to really remove as much blood as you can just by suctioning the blood with a syringe and then delivering the catheter into the brain and through that catheter delivering a thrombolytic like TPA. That's what the phase two trial was. So this is the example of the type of blood you get with just inserting an EVD into the hematoma. This was again, uh, one of these early cases showing the initial size of the hematoma, the catheter in place, and then uh, a few days, this is a CT scan almost every 12 hours. So this would be about three days from insertion of the EVD to uh, removal of the EVD or, or prior to removal after three days of TPA administration. This would be the plot of that hematoma. Um, this is an interesting phenomenon that has been seen is that these hematomas actually are not a static entities. They actually expand a little bit at first and then they retract. Even if you don't do anything, they retract a little bit by themselves, which is what you see here on this case. And that natural retraction occurs because of, of the changing environment inside the hematoma. And then each time point right here is really one of those CT scans measuring the volume and then the final volume, which is about less than five females. This was one of the early cases for MISTI-2. The hematoma was not entirely engaged by the catheter. So we ended up putting a second catheter next to the hematoma. And then through that second catheter, the hematoma was delivered out of the brain. Now, the nice thing about MISTI-2 is that it gave us the rationale. It gave us 
some understanding and, and, and what Dan Hanley showed really here in this graph, the left hand, the left hand side graph is the, the medical management, right hand side graph is a minimal invasive procedure. That line right there is the biological threshold where he estimated would be ideal to have these hematomas to about less than um, you know 20 ml of volume. So with that in hand, MISTI-3 happened and MISTI-3 was already published in 2019. Uh, same idea, this is one of the cases we did for MISTI-3. So this patient has two catheters, one for ICP control, one for the EVD uh, uh, hematoma evacuation right in the core of the hematoma. You see the dates here, October 18th through October 25th. So this is seven days. The protocol was really only a 12, uh, three day, 12 doses, uh, one milligram e every eight hours of TPA into the core of the hematoma, followed by spontaneous drainage. So this patient probably had that catheter for three days and then subsequently was removed, but this is the seven day scan. So nearly complete evacuation. I would say probably there is some blood here in the residual area. Now, MISTI-3 didn't make the cutoff for mortality, uh, for, for outcomes, but it did show that perhaps only for survival, there might have been a signal. That being said, because the primary outcome was really a uh, uh, modified ranking score, combined ordinal shift. The mortality outcome was a secondary outcome. This was deemed to be a negative trial. But hey, it's the first time that actually we could actually say, well, if, if you bring the hematoma to a certain size, maybe those patients, maybe they will benefit. So data from MISTI is shown here. Each individual color is the threshold of uh, hematoma volume. So green are the hematoma. Each little dot is one patient. And in the, in the X axis, you're actually seeing the the case number, so from K0 to K340 something. And then uh, blue would be hematomas between 10 and 20 ml. This is by the end of the study. Um, then uh, orange is hematomas that were about 20 or 30 ml by the end of the trial, the administration of TPA, and then in the red, hematomas that really didn't respond or re-expand it. And so that's important. Most of the patients were actually within the target of 15 ml or, or less, which is that green area right here. Now. This study from, I think, a year ago, uh, two years ago, is, is basically the comparison between MISTI and STITCH trials. One of them is minimally invasive. The other one is surgical evacuation, craniotomy to remove the blood. Remember the, the second study that I showed earlier on. So what they showed was something quite interesting. When you look at the data side to side, the MISTI data here, this line right in the middle shows the probability of a good outcome. So for the MISTI cohort, the probability of a good outcome increases significantly if you remove the hematoma to a volume closer to 20 ml, 25 ml, to about 70% chance if you get closer to 15 ml. For stitch, the best would be probably close to 65%, that you would have to have a nearly complete evacuation via the surgical approach to do much, much better. So again, two different studies, different cohorts, different patients, but the idea is the same. It seems like randomizing the patient is not enough is one of the messages here. You really have to randomize and actually accomplish the end point. And the end point is obvious, it's remove the blood. It's not enough to just go in and try. You have to try and get it done. <laughs> so that's the main message from those two studies. Now for IVH, similar story, we had a trial, clear IVH, which is really a different entity, but diff uh, similar idea. And this trial, basically thrombolytics were giving into the intraventricular system versus saline uh, pushes. And um, this trial didn't show a significant improvement uh, in mortality. This is the Kaplan-Meier curve, 0.06. So it didn't really make it through the cutoff. But what we saw really is that if you engage the hematoma, this is a 3D reconstruction, red is the clot, and those blue lines right here, and here are two, two endovascular uh, um, uh, in, intraventricular catheters, those two catheters are really engaging the clot. And one of the findings from clear IVH was that you really have to engage the clot and the more blood you remove, the better the patient does. That being said, the study didn't pass the p-value test. Now, just uh, as I was flying in, this is the uh, data from Gustavo Pradilla and his group in, in Emory. Basically, they published this in the New England on Wednesday. They've used a, a minimally invasive technique where basically the idea is to use this uh, plunger device um, uh, manufactured by, by the sponsor of the study where they will really do a small burrow on the, on the cranium. This is not a bedside procedure in the ICU. For this, the patient 
patient has to go to the OR. It's a surgical procedure. And then based on the size of the hematoma and the depth, they will really do what they call a uh, basically uh, a dissection. Uh, trans the, the correct term is really a transfascicular dissection through the white matter tracts to get to the core of the hematoma. And then through this plunger here, manipulate their devices and transaction the blood. And that being said, I mean, this is again a surgical procedure, but very targeted. This study was concomitantly going when when MISTI was initiated was completing. So they had the advantage of time. And one of the findings here that I want you guys to be aware, we're gonna be digesting this trial in the next probably few weeks uh, as a group, as a whole, is that most of the patients in this study were low bar hemorrhages, meaning that these are not necessarily deep, deep hematomas in the basal ganglia. Indeed, as they were enrolling, at some point the interim analysis indicated they should stop enrolling deep hematomas and keep enrolling superficial hematomas because there was a futility in point where they didn't see a difference for deep hematomas. And so they kept enrolling lower, 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 lower hemorrhages. But the good news is that they were actually able to show a significant benefit in not only survival, but in the ordinal shift of the outcomes. So the study concludes that there is a benefit in outcomes that there is definitely a difference in mortality. And as a whole, the evacuation of the hematoma did help functionally these people. Now, here is something interesting. This is the average hematoma volume at completion of the procedure, 14.5 mLs. Dan Hanley had predicted it had to be 15 mLs. And so these guys were actually hitting the landmarks. They were hitting the, the metrics. And I think this is one of the good things about Enrich because I think this trial is going to lead to a lot of discussion. It is leaving one of the most important things, uh, one of the most important questions still open, which is what should we do with these deep hematomas? So we're gonna probably have to dissect that more carefully. But again, um, I think this is gonna be one of those trials that is gonna give some, some time to talk about. Now there is the MIND study. I'm not gonna spend too much time because MIND is actually halted. And when a study gets suddenly halted, it could be one of two things, either great news, or terrible news, and so we don't know what what it is. But I think I I, I get I I have a guess. They they use this device. Um, is that it's a penumbra device basically uh, to um, emaciate the hematoma, evacuate it with a suctioning pump, and this study mostly included uh, deep hematomas like basal ganglia as well as some superficial ones. So okay, we have some we have some not perfect success, but some advances in the last I would say five years in neurocritical care and and. Uh, only talking mostly about ICH here. Some of the tips that I have for evolving trials are that at least for TBI and ICH, biology is now helping us guide practice and understand what is the best surgical approach. That's number one. Now for other things like TBI and cardiac arrest, we, we need to really focus more on neurological metrics. It's not enough to say, well, the patient had VFib arrest, give them temperature. Everybody 34 degrees. I mean, those trials have been uh, obviously given more and more disappointing data lately, partly because we haven't really defined which phenotype we want to target. And I can tell you, I we, we just enrolled the first patient for the ice cap study, which is endovascular uh, um, uh, temperature control post-cardiac arrest. It was a 91-year-old guy. When he got enrolled, everybody was, oh, why did you enroll this guy? You know, he's 91. Come on, VPA arrest. Guess what? The guy woke up, right? I mean, the moment we looked at the EEG, we immediately saw good reactivity. The patient's pupils were fine. The brainstem was intact. So again, the phenotype really, really matters. Okay. Finally, just to conclude, the question is, must be meaningful, number one. Second, there needs to be a biological mechanism. If you don't have one, you're in trouble. Why is this supposed to work? Three, phenotype is all, meaning that you need to choose the right patient and you need to stick to your protocol. And then probably you can adjust it along the way. And then in terms of study design, let us focus on prospective studies. Big sample sizes are the way to go. Clinical trials should incorporate clinical practice parameters. Basically, things we're doing in real life. We have to be able to incorporate in the trial what happens in the ICU. It doesn't help us if the trial has a fantastic intervention and a beautiful protocol if we're not going to be able to implement it in the ICU. And then look beyond um, survival as the primary outcome. We have to look at probably functional outcomes, uh, quality of life, efficiency of care and cost. I mean, those are all things we should be looking into and we should not get stuck with mortality. 
And finally, investigator networks are the way to go. Working together, working across centers, stop working alone and aim for large scale collaborations. Thank you very much. Can take a couple of questions, anybody? Questions? Yes. Anyone? Oh, I heard questions somewhere. Yes, Dr. Rajay. Right here. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for this excellent overview and critical overview. I have a question. Yes. When we do the shift analysis in all these trials, have we compared whether one population versus the other based on the phenotype does better when we send them to the rehab at six months or a year? So, so all of these trials are six months and 365 days. MISTI has data 365 days. They did see a small benefit in mortality again, but it's, it's really hard to see the signal in the ordinal shift because when they design the trials, they have to commit. Are you going to dichotomize the better ones with the, with the less, uh, with the more disabled ones? Or are we gonna do individual like, um, uh, analysis of each individual ranking? So it seems like there is a signal, but all of the secondary analysis that shows some degree of improvement need to be validated with a randomized, with a basically a new trial. There needs to be a MISTI-4 at some point. And so there has been some signal, but we have, a, we have to be very, very careful with secondary analysis because they are essentially post-hoc analysis and we should not be using that to guide practice. So. Yes, there has been some signal. I think one of the reasons in REACH, which is the study published two days ago, was able to get through successfully is because midway through in their internal analysis, they realized that one of their groups, the deep lower, the deep uh, basal ganglia hematomas, was not really doing that much different amongst each other. So they stopped enrolling that cohort and they kept enrolling the lower hemorrhages. So it seems like at least for the superficial ones, we have a signal and we have a positive study. For the deep ones, we still don't know what the best option is. Thanks. Hey, Manny, I have a question for you. Actually, yes. a couple of questions and comments. Yes. One, I think as we've become gradually more and more desperate, I get the sense, right? We've had all these negative medical trials, all these negative surgical trials. You brought up fastest. Fastest, if you're looking at the patient population that Stefan brought up, patients that did better after Novo 7 or activated factor 7, which was age less than 70, ICH volume less than 60, IVH volume less than 5 cc's, who got the medication within two and a half hours, that formed 19% of the total patient population in FAST. Right. That's less than one out of five. So you're doing like a tiny post-hoc analysis and then hoping that that trial eventually someday gets completed. So I, I don't know if that's something that we can then extrapolate to other patients that don't meet those criteria, right? Right. That's, that's, you know, that's a very good point. I, I think I think one of the biggest problems is I, I wanted to share. If, let's see if this goes again. Uh, OK, this is what uh, uh, Neeraj is referring to. This is the subgroup that Stefan Mayer predicted with benefit. And that's the, the, the group at the top here. Less mortality, more functional outcomes. So, yeah, I think one of the problems that fastest is going to face is the hematoma expansion has been halted. And now what shall we do about the blood? And we sort of all know that the blood is the big picture here. That's the real big elephant in the room, right? And so I, I think that's going to be the main factor. But now coming to your point, let me show you. Oh, well, actually, you know, I'm going to show you the actual paper. The, 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 the randomization algorithm for Enrich and for MISTI, they basically screen 12,000 patients to include 300. And so you're absolutely correct. When you're doing these trials, let's see if this is going to go up again. Uh, if not, yep, you guys don't see my screen. Let me show, just give one more shot here. Oh, you see it. Uh, okay, good. Let me show you here. Uh, it's exactly what you're saying. Um, when you start with the, with the actual enrollment here, um, this is enriched. This study just published two days ago. 11,000 patients. And all of these people got excluded. Basically, some of them were too old or too young. Uh, secondary cause, the volume didn't fit, blah, 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 blah. 300 patients get randomized, right? So I think you're, you're talking about that. But I think that's that's what I think we should do with trials. We should, I, I think you have the dilemma of the clumpers and the splitters. Perhaps we should do what the endovascular trials did, focus on one vessel and run with it. Then we can take care of the other ones later. Two is, uh, you know, uh, we found statistical cheats, right? So, you know, we used to go with modified Rankin being dichotomized, 
And then we were like a lot of trials are negative. And then as happened, actually Interact 2 was one of the trials where halfway through the trial, they changed your primary endpoint right. and maybe did an ordinal scale. Ethically, a little, you know, questionable to do that. But now a lot of trials do the ordinal scale where you look at modified rank and shift. Now we've gone from that to utility weighted modified rank and you call it patient centric. But really what you're asking the patient is, are you depressed? Are you anxious? Are you in pain? Right. And we're missing using that. that criteria to show the difference between two trials. And so even though trials are negative with modified Rankin, whether ordinal or dichotomized, utility-weighted modified Rankin now is showing positive results. So I feel like we're indulging in statistical manipulation to get the answers yeah. that we want. And again, I'm, 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 right. I'm fine with it. Yeah, and, Rich, and Rich actually had a, exactly what you just said. It's, it's a utility-weighted ranking. So what that means is really it weighs towards more, more towards um, um, the, the overall distribution of the different scores. Yeah, there is a lot of, I, I agree with you. There, there is a lot of stuff missing here. We don't have any, I think the most important thing is quality of life. I mean, some preliminary data from, from small series have shown that even people that have some degree of moderate disability that you would consider to be unacceptable, like my five ranking score of three, actually are happy. No, I, I actually agree with you 100%. Right. Yeah. But then we need to go back and look at those trials, like you yes. know, Destiny 2, for example, where, you know, we say it's a negative trial. We shouldn't do hemicranies on 61 to 82 years of age. But if you go and ask the patient, the modified rank in four, subjectively, they're happy with being alive. Right. So maybe we ought to revisit history a little bit because maybe there are negative trials that are looking at these different endpoints. That's why I don't have an issue with it. I just feel we should be consistent. Absolutely. You can't say previous trials were negative. You changed the endpoints well. and now you say these are positive. Absolutely. I, I agree with you. We we have to, and fortunately, fortunately, even for the stitch cohort, Many of those people might still be alive, and for Misty, definitely they should be still around, and there there should be a, uh, you know, we should look into that. We should look into their quality of life and and, and see see if there is a signal there. Yeah, but but uh, you you show that, but it went quick there, right? So on Enrich, forty six percent of the patients are independent. Yep. On the surgical group versus twenty yep, five on, on the. And if I'm not mistaken, even with that gap, they did not run a statistics for obvious reasons. Right. So, but th there is a 20% gap, right? So this is 46%. Uh, uh, this, I... this, this is from here. But the, yeah. what, uh, Ricardo is referring is for this group right here. They modify ranking 0, 1, and one 2, and two yeah. plus versus the controls yeah. 0, 1, and 2 right here. So there is a big, yeah. But they, even with that gap, intentionally, uh, we were part of it, Richard. Gustavo yeah. and the group decided not to run a statistic because we, you know, what it's going to show. Right. So, um, I, 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 I think it's it's a uh, it's a very orphan. All this, all the procedures that you show are surgeries, even if it's a, a little catheter or not. And we changed the name of our society from uh, American Society of Neurointerventionalists to Society of Neurointerventional Surgeons. Yeah. So the interventions are surgery. You can poke a vessel and you can make it bleed. I think right. that. Small catheter, bigger catheter, port, no port, uh, but it, but it's it's a very very mixed bag. I love. I, I took a picture of your slide because I, I I share the same. We tried this in many different ways. I, I can tell that uh, Chimai Sen will be texting us. Okay, look at this hematoma. Take it out. Neuraj the same thing, and we have a very proactive. But there are centers where still I'm not sure if it's gonna move the needle in people doing surgery for that because. Right. Uh, so it's been interesting how, how, how the population of neurosurgeons slash neurocritical care are going to react to and reach. I'm not sure if that's going to move the needle or not. Right. I, I, I actually think that um, you can look at this study in two ways. They're saying it's minimally invasive. It almost looks like this population is very similar to the stitch population, and it's actually a modified stitch protocol. And I, I obviously... I, I'm pretty sure the, the authors will have to speak for themselves, but this is, again, basically a superficial clot trial. Oh, one picture just to clarify one thing, but please, I, I, please. I have, but Manu, I have a, a question before yes. um well he puts the computer, the, you know the way I interpret these ICH trials is you have two injuries you have the primary injury which is primarily a mechanical injury that happens during the bleeding and right. then you have a secondary in and that's why 
you want to try to avoid uh, growth. You're going to try to impede expansion of the hematoma that is associated with worse outcomes. And then you have the secondary injury that probably evacuation is going to help tremendously because the pathophysiology occurs after all the broad products are break down and you have the inflammatory process. Then I'm going to ask you a challenging question. And then Raul is also there. Maybe he can even answer too. Do you think that we're going to... The way I see this disease is I think there might be some similarities but what we have done with acute stroke, not only in the sense that we need to get a homogeneous phenotype, as you said, but perhaps timing is important. Perhaps uh, you need to go evacuate before there is a hematoma expansion and before the secondary injury occurs. But, but Santi, this has been done, right? Again, if you go through the 53 trials that uh, men, you can answer that, this has been done. There's a Japanese trial, they operate within like three hours or something. So, fail, yeah. fail, 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 fail. So, so I, don't know, the, I don't know the answer. In, in the MISTI slash study that I showed, one of the graphs actually looked at the timing and they have an inflection point for both studies. And it actually comes down to about 48 hours. 48. Most likely what's going to happen in the future, and I am just making a non-database prediction here, is we're going to end up giving clot stabilizers early on, letting the clot cool down, and then going in to remove whatever is left. The it, problem, it, Manny, though, is stop it and spotlight did happen, right? So we did those studies looking at the spot sign to predict yeah. which ones are going to expand because we thought there were too many patients who were getting hemostatic agents that wouldn't have expanded anyway, so it diluted the effect. But even stop it and spotlight were negative. So, I mean, there's a lot of potential, I agree. It just doesn't seem to, you know, work out in clinical trials. Right, and the, all, 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 all the issues come down to how much damage do you do in order to reduce the residual clot? So that those are all questions that remain and that falls into the biological, I think, aspect of the research going on. Thank you, guys. Thanks. Well, uh, so, so very quickly, first, congratulate many for the great lecture. I'm so happy that uh, I stay until this point because this was a wonderful overview. And uh, just want to add a few thoughts here. Uh, if I could just show this one slide, it would be great. Um, so I, I think MISTI was essentially what IMS3 was for us. And... And reach is what Dawn was for us. And, and uh, I can tell you that, uh, so, so Dawn was designed, okay, with overselection as one of the possibilities because you couldn't have a trial, another trial negative. When you designed Dawn, there was no proof of thrombectomy being beneficial even in the early window, right? It just took a, a while to get done. And uh, I, I think if you look very carefully at IMS3, you can come up with scenarios where IMS3 showed a benefit. As you said, in the right phenotype, if you recanalize and all that, I, I really love what Manny said. It's not enough to randomize to the treatment. The treatment has to be successful, right? And you saw that in thrombectomy. When you did IMS3, you did thrombectomy. However, you were successful in the thrombectomy in, uh, uh, in less than a majority of the patients, and that wasn't enough. The other thing that I think we, need, we should learn from this parallel is not only the, the final success of the treatment, but the speed, right, that you accomplish that goal. You said you have to remove the blood, but how it, it, do you have to remove the blood over the course of uh, three, seven days right, as you show with the non-invasive evacuation, with uh, out the place and all that, or it's much better to have a more complete and fast removal as you had in Enrich. So I, I don't think Enrich was positive just because the adaptive design, it was positive because you had a more complete and faster hematoma evacuation, which pretty much mirrors what happened in thrombectomy. It was all about the speed and the completeness. In terms of the um, of the the comments about the uh, utility weighted, I, I took a little bit of a point. I gotta clarify this because Dawn was the very first trial in stroke to use utility weighted MRS, and we struggle with that. It's novel. You're gonna get criticized. I guess we still are. Um, and the reason why Enrich Enrich pretty much took the statistical plan of Dawn 
and put that in hemorrhage. Utility weighted MRS, adaptive design with population enrichment with the same group, Barry Consultants, who are the masters of Bayesian adaptive design. If you're going to do a trial in 2024, talk to the Barry Consultants. Bayesian adaptive design is the future. And uh, I fully agree with you, but there is no magic. It's not dishonest. We don't know the phenotype, right, Nani, that it's going to benefit. We start with all the potential phenotypes that can benefit, but during the injury analysis, we can then enrich the population and leave behind those patients that don't have a chance. The most trial try to do that also using the playing the wind strategy. You saw that very few patients got argatrobran, more patients get a fibatide because argatrobran was leading to bad outcomes. So why are you going to waste more patients in a bad strategy? I have no doubts that's the future. It's not a statistical magic, but here is a defense that I want to have. And maybe if you can remove this. Yes. So one of the reasons, okay, uh, why thrombectomy studies became positive, and by the way, it doesn't matter how you look at them, they are so powerful now that they are positive with any endpoints. But it is more patient-centric. We start with dichotomized outcomes, right? So you have all this range going from going back to normal all the way to that, but then it's our or nothing. How is that fair, right? That... Uh, being dead or walking independently is the same. That's completely unfair. You're, you're not being fair with your uh, randomization, your treatment, right? You are missing the opportunity of showing that all these transitions here carry a value to the patient. That's where the original analysis come. Okay. I think we all can agree that original analysis is a lot more fair then dichotomize, and then you say, ah, now they made up this utility weighted. Let's make the following exercise. I'm going to give you one point. You have one point only to move a loved one across the MRS range. Where you would put that one point? I bet you that you would not put that one point from a six to five you probably wouldn't put that one point from a zero to one, right? But chances are you do a four to three, a three to two, or a two to one. It is pretty obvious that this is not a linear scale. Every point, it's not worth the same. So you can't give that same merit, right? We were actually cheating. We were using original shift analysis by collapsing five and six. Do you remember that? That was a, a, a way of giving some weight to the MRS. So there is no magic there. Just think about you have a family member, you have one point. You are not going to distribute that one point in the same way. You probably would say, I would use in this transition or that transition I wouldn't spend that one point in the five to six or, or zero to one, right? Um, a five to four, it's a pretty good place. You can see 3.3 difference, a four to three, right? These are big transitions. So it, it's not an ordinary scale. It's the same problem with aspects score. Are you telling me that one point in the cow date is the same one point in the posterior limb of the internal capsula or in the motor cortex or in vernix. It's not the same one point. So we treat it as a linear scale, but it's not a linear scale. It's not, the weight is not the same. So I just want to make this because I, I'm very, um, by the way, the trials I'm doing now, I'm using ordinal shift because I got so tired of being criticized of the utility weighted, which I, I think it's a better way to do it, but everybody complains. It's complicated. You are doing magic. I think you are just really being more patient-centric. Just want to make that point. And again, excellent lecture. We have to go to the airport now, but just want to say it was wonderful to be here. Learned so much over the last uh, uh, two days. Looking forward to being here again next year. Thank you.
<laughs> we all know shift happens. <laughs> I love it. That's so fair. A summary. So to get back to the the comment I had earlier was that you know there's huge one difference here because like people keep saying like we hear, hear those comments oh this is you know nobody's taking care of intracranial hemorrhage I mean there's a huge difference for is that this is a disease that if somebody bleed in the hospital somebody has an intracranial hemorrhage in front of us right now it, the the huge difference with ischemia is that there's a concept of penumbra. I mean, if you blow your frontal lobe with bleed, the damage has occurred. Uh, and yes, some people are more fortunate, probably the way dissect the fiber, you know, maybe more splaying some of them and all this, but the damage occur acutely. The only place where we could really help there is the prevention of the cascade and the inflammation around there, which obviously surgery could help by decreasing the blood, but we're still limited, I feel, in... in uh, in, in in what surgery could accomplish and thinking that you know a, a time would make a difference in that i mean it's pretty simplistic i mean there's nothing magical happening between 30 45 minutes and uh you know a couple of hours probably in a few days yes there's more degradation product but it's hard to see what is the target that we could really with surgery do a better job and you look at the enrich I mean, I agree with whoever said that. I mean, it's basically a stitch in the sense that we know that lobar hemorrhage are helped with surgery. Deep hemorrhage, early on, they were not included in, in the randomization process. So, Yeah, no, honestly, you can look at it as a positive trial if you want. But for me personally, as someone who's taken care of patients with ICH for over 20 years, it's a negative trial. I was hoping that it would actually show benefit in patients with basal ganglia hemorrhage. And the fact that it hit a futility threshold at 175 patients out, where the next 125 patients are on low bar kind of tells you something about where we are with ICH evac. Uh, but sorry, we're going over a little bit, but that's fine. I got nothing better to do. Uh, so moving on to our next speaker. Uh, so, you know, I the neurocritical care society that I've been a part of for the last 20 years or so is a lot like India. You know, you have... You have Indians like me who, you know, like to talk a lot, who showboat, you know, cover up their insecurities. Uh, and, you know, we're not very smart. And then you have, you know, the quiet, dignified, mature ones who, you know, like come up first in the board exams and then they excel and they get a Nobel Prize like, you know, like Ajay, you know. <laughs> yeah. But uh, the Neurocritical Care Society is actually very similar to that. Uh, because, you know, basically, as as Dave knows, it's it's a boys club, a uh, bunch of middle-aged guys hanging out, uh, you know, trying to figure out who can get more drunk, who can outdo each other, talking about their great accomplishments in life. Uh, and then we have those meetings, and then Dr. Freeman walks in, and suddenly the room goes quiet, and the average IQ of that room goes up just by his presence. And, you know, we no longer have to get drunk by doing more shots. We just get drunk on his intelligence. So, again, Dr. Freeman from Mayo, a friend and a scholar. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Naraj, for that. That's a hard act to follow. And, um, yeah, I guess I'll be able to yeah pull up the slides there. And this center screen uh, will come on, I guess. So I just want to thank the organizers, um, uh, Dr. Ricardo Canal, uh, Eric Savajo, Nima, um, Naraj Naval for uh, putting this together. Um, yeah, and I, this will be something different, but I, I'm going to try to move through this uh, fairly uh, quickly. Um, and uh, I think I tried to mix it up from the last time I was here. And really, uh, this uh, the concept went uh back to some work that you did at Hopkins uh, Niraj called the SH score. And I think Ricardo was interested in it. So I, one of our fellows did this work uh, in the middle called Rohan Sharma um, and uh, Dr. Saif Salmon's here in the audience, just a quick shout out to him. So um, the focus is, is it going to be in three parts? Um, many of you may have recognized the emergence of these CAPTCHA tests, but many of them don't know that the T is for Turing test. Uh, but this is becoming increasingly important uh, because there's the rise of uh, AI is, a, uh, is upon us. So um, these are really the, the simple three learning objectives. I'd like to define what artificial intelligence is and really give you a compressed version of about 70 years in a small amount of time. 
Second, I want to share you some uh, examples of this as applies to stroke and neurocritical care, and especially what we call the ESH score. So we took Dr. Naval's score and enhanced it by playing with one number. And then last, I want to leave you uh, some future, I think some hope. And I think uh, this hopefully dovetails into, I think what doc you saw with Dr. Coelho, hopefully next year, in what we call the Star X Fellowship. Um, so I'm a big thinker. Uh, and I, this is all of human history, actually the universe in one slide. Uh, but on the far left, right, the universe uh, began about 13.8 13 13 .8 billion years ago. Um, about 538 million years ago, there was something called the Cambrian explosion. So to give you an idea, the, the, the Milky Way galaxy spins about 250 million years, one lap. So this is only two laps of the Milky Way galaxy. Life explodes on this planet. A few thousand years ago, uh, the Egyptian uh, and mathematicians created math and philosophy. And so that wasn't that long ago in the history of science and, and human civilization. Um, and then you see the emergence of symbols, hieroglyphs. Why is this important? Because now we have computer code, symbol, symbolic. Uh, uh, and all of this is tied back mathematically into what we uh, is later emerged into uh, binary code and language itself. And then we can't forget in the middle there about the 1600s, the Renaissance, and and, and uh, Eric Savage, please don't uh, you know make fun of my my accent, but uh, my wife speaks some French, but I'm told that Renaissance means rebirth, right? But this was a glorious time in human civilization, the emergence of knowledge, written word, sharing of knowledge, thought, philosophy is a, is a wonderful time in human civilization. Why is this important? I'll show you on the next slide. Now, only about 70, maybe 80 years ago, 1940s, the greatest minds came together and what uh, used physics and math to come up with the nuclear mass equation. What I think history overlooks is they also was a genesis of artificial intelligence. John von Neumann um, was part of this group. You can see the list of names with Einstein. Uh, they essentially wanted to create thinking machines to do the massive calculations that they would use papers and papers. You can imagine how tense a room is if you have eight pages or more of calculations that could determine whether there's going to be life on earth or not if they get the calculations wrong. So this was an idea not that far ago. And then zoom in now, we're in this fourth industrial revolution. AI is already here. The world experiences what we call the chat GPT moment. Uh, now there's a uh, download uh, GPT for all on your own laptop. You don't need to be tethered to the internet. And then there's this thing that uh, some like Ray Kurzweil talk about the singularity, the rise of an artificial super intelligence exceeds the capacity of humankind, similar to the singularity on an event horizon of a black hole that we may not return to. There's it's a lot of theory. So some think that we're in the second Renaissance period um, uh, using AI to augment our uh, capabilities uh, of thought and knowledge even further. So this is just a slide uh, showing you uh, recently the World Economic Forum came out. Notice that this is per capita GPT doesn't really move until about the Renaissance times. Why is this? Sharing knowledge, industrial knowledge, some think the combustion engine, right? All these technologies, right, are like a lens into the future. Each lens helps you see farther into the future and product human productivity is going, is skyrocketing. Some think that AI and the combination of humanoid robotics in particular will increase this another hundredfold. So we're at this accelerated uh, point in human history. Very quickly, uh, comparing human brains uh, to, to what we now call artificial intelligence. It's interesting, Johnny Von Neumann, Claude Shannon, the, the founders of, of AI and ML, they actually modeled the human brain and neurons for mathematically. So zeros and ones came out of neurons firing axons or not. You can see the there's still nothing com comparable to the human brain. You can see 88 to 100 billion neurons, trillions of synapses. I compare that to uh, the iPhone 15 has about uh, 19 billion transistors um, and uh, obviously um, doesn't do everything. Um, and so, but uh, just some um, differences there. So going back to this Cambrian 
uh, explosion about half a billion years ago. Now we're seeing this emergence of Cambrian AI species. Uh, I consider myself a pretty high bandwidth person, and I've found it pretty hard to keep up with all the um, AI species that have evolved um, just in the last year and a half. Um, and so we'll talk about that in a moment. So I just want to hit the high points here, compress the last 300,000 years. The word primate means first. Um, the ability for our brains to compact and be high functioning, these massive little parallel processing, they're actually studying now in IBM labs and others called neuromorphic computing. It allows us to pack a lot, you know, these 88 billion neurons with massive parallel processing, but also the word homo sapien means one who knows, right? Knowledge. We, um, this is an emergent principle in evolutionary biology. We can learn from the environment, adapt to it far more than any other biological uh, species. Um, and I'm just going to zoom down. You can see in 1954, this, this term was coined artificial intelligence by Marvin Minsky and this group is really like a, a summer conference uh, at, at uh, Dartmouth. And then uh, think about this for a moment. They sent the Apollo mission guys with a two megahertz computer. What you have in your pocket is a gigahertz uh, giga memory computer. So you have a supercomputer in your pocket. They sent the guys to the moon with basically a, ca uh, a calculator on the wrist kind of computer by comparison. That's how things have changed that much. So I'm just gonna, uh, the last uh, component here is 2015, how fast this moves. AlphaGo, a, a part product of DeepMind. This is a chess-like game to give a comparison and uh, it beat every single human master champion. And in fact, no human champion has ever been able to beat this AI. So DeepMind is part of Google Labs now, has defined what is the superintelligence. They have five grades. AlphaGo remains the only level five superintelligence that exists. Everything else is sort of a two and a three, an average. Some people now argue that ChatGPT probably writes better English than the average uh, American. So, um, and then now we're adding other sense, uh, senses, computer vision, sensing, haptics, all of this um, barreling to this uh, point in history. So again, what is uh, artificial intelligence? I'm, I'll lay down the foundation. It was based on the philosophy, mathematicians, statistics, uh, Bayes' law. Uh, little shout out to Ava Lovelace, the first woman uh, programmer there. You can see in 1840. And a uh, little homage to Claude Shannon and John von Neumann. Just a little interesting note that uh, people who knew Einstein and uh, von Neumann felt von Neumann was the smarter of the two. Um, and this is just the archival text from uh, Alan Turing. And this is a long German word I won't try to pronunciate. I think it's uh, called the uh, thinking problem of machines, right? But this is very controversial. Uh, back in the day and still now, can machines think? And so he proposed what they call the imitation game or the Turing test, right? Which was, uh, I think we far exceeded that, which means, you know, uh, if you communicated with the machine, would you know the difference between a human or not? I think right now we're at these really spooky uh, chatbots right now that are very good. And we've probably surpassed the Turing test a while. The book on the left, I highly recommend is a short read based on John von Neumann. It's uh, quite sad because he died probably of radiation from the Manhattan uh, Times. It was supposed to be his lectures at Yale. It's a great forward by Ray uh, Kurzweil. Eric Schmidt, the former CEO of Google, wrote this book uh, with the late uh, uh, Eric Schmidt and Daniel Hootenlocker at MIT called The Age of AI. Interestingly, this book was written before um, ChatGPT was created, but eerily it, it, it points to a trajectory that we're on now. So I just want to leave these definitions uh, in this slide deck that you guys have. AI is a very broad field. Machine learning is a subset of that. There's supervised learning and unsupervised learning. I think a supervised learning like a parent, right? If you're telling them, oh, that's a dog, that's a cat. It's just a labels and classification scene that you're training. Unsupervised, let them out in the backyard, let them figure out for themselves. Um, and then deep learning is uh, involves these artificial neural networks. These are inputs that go through filters. These are mathematical filters. Uh, and they, there's a backward propagation algorithm that learns uh, patterns, and they're very, very good. And again, this is very much like the occipital cortex in human brain. Sentience, I just mentioned this because it'll come into relevance later, right? This is the uh, being aware of their environments and being uh, conscious. So there's a lot of controversy right now. I'll, I'll share with you later. There's some uh, concerns some people had 
uh, whether uh, computers uh, like ChatGPT are conscious or not. But this is just a little uh, meme to kind of keep you guys awake. You know, if the father is mathematics and computer science and statistics had a baby, you know, the, what is machine learning? It's just sort of, uh, you know, what the heck is this? It's a hybrid uh, of the two, but that's sort of what uh, maybe a schematic way to look at it. Uh, and what is GPT, a generative pre-trained transformer, right? Uh, this was invented by Google, GPT. Uh, it's not the Optimus Prime kind of thing, but it's a it's an actual architecture uh, of a thinking machine. So it uses a multi-attention head. Uh, why is multi-attention head so important? The title of the paper is Attention is All You Need. These are what the large language models use when you try, uh, type in a prompt. There's different ways to hack in uh, with these uh, the transformer models. But anyway, I think it's, a, it's an important paper how uh, thinking machines came about uh, for sure. So that's the first half. It, we covered about 13 billion years of, of history. I'm going to zoom through this middle section uh, to save some time. And this was the cover of Time magazine saying, you know, how artificial intelligence help patients, right? That's, I think, where we're all keenly interested in. I think, honestly, healthcare has been behind the other industries. And um, again, I'm not overcomplicating this. Yeah, people ask, you know, uh, where is AI? Is it here and all that kind of thing? I think we all know Amazon and Google know us, right? Like I want the brown shoes. It not, somehow knows that it makes suggestions about the brown shoes. How does it do that? It's very easy. It has a prior shopping database and it makes suggestions. Uh, these are called recommender systems. Uh, and so I think this is very relevant to healthcare. I think it's really exciting how it might help. So I'm gonna zoom through these uh, cases just to uh, save on time, but there are, all, I think at Mayo, we have three shields, patient care, education and research, but I think there's potential this can reduce clerical burden. Uh, they can also provide more empathetic responses. And I'll just show you uh, this article in JAMA that looked at the empathy using a chatbot to respond to your in-basket to your patients. It turned out that the chatbot was perceived to be more empathetic. So we did like a poll at Mayo and we're like, you know, and I had clinicians say, yeah, man, it's eight o'clock. I'm tired, man. I'm, I'm, you know, it's like, huh, you know, but yeah, why not have a chatbot write a more empathetic, longer kind of note? Maybe we're writing short, shorter notes. So this was quite an interesting uh, study education wise, I think there's uh, a wide field um, uh, um, uh, open. So you can have a, a PowerPoint summarized into questions like to help you quiz. There's even AI that will generate your slides for you. Um, and uh, there's definitely pros and cons to that. Research wise, I just share with you this is out of DeepMind's lab. There's AlphaFold now. So it'll show you the three dimensional uh, uh, protein structure. And this is really going to accelerate drug discovery. And alpha missense, looking at uh, you know these variants of gene um, abnormalities um, there, and then administratively, I think uh, we all want to be less burnout. So I think auto uh, documentation is uh, going to be key. And then I think just specific to this conference, I think there's uh, the field is ripe for um, for neurosurgery, neurovascular, and neurocritical care. And, uh, implications. Why not have an empathetic chatbot, right? The pa post-op patients I get, the guy who's a little delirious, he has the Foley in his bladder. Sir, I got I to pee. You have a Foley in. Okay. Maybe you can talk to them uh, and free up uh, the nurse for some time, right? Rather than them, uh, you know, uh, saying that. Uh, maybe it can reduce administrative and clerical burdens by making auto suggestions, saving time. Uh, and there's all kinds of uh, other um, ideas. So uh, there's recently an article uh, looking at uh, ChatGPT4 for localization and stroke. It was found that it was pretty good. Um, and there's other uh, uh, things here. I just want to share with you two quick projects. One is um, uh, the, our StarX lab with Dr. Manapache uh, is working on. And this is an open source. It's called Google uh, Face Mark Detection. So we loaded a picture of Will Smith. It's out there on the internet. You can see it does this facial mask. Uh, but you can also use this to detect facial uh, weakness. So this is a picture from Wikipedia, Bell's palsy. So now we're starting to see AI has computer vision component as well as text. So it's becoming multi-sensory. And so this is the part I, I wanted to share with you. We've been working on uh, Niraj for a while and what uh, you originally uh, published called the SAH score. And, you know, I think the concept was, why isn't there an IC8 score for subarachnoid hemorrhage patients? So this is kind of where we're at right now. This is, everyone knows Claude's paper, which really made him quite famous. It's a retrospective study, right? Of not, uh, and this is sort of the graphical look, you know, the higher the score, the, the more mortality. It's basically a mortality prediction based on a retrospective uh, cohort. And so this is the data that um, 
uh, Dr. Sammons here, he could, uh, in, in the paper that's on MedArchive, and we would love to partner with you guys um, at Baptist and, and boost this uh, considerably. And so again, the original uh, credit Naraja's paper there, you can see the PubMed ID. Um, and really, uh, we dissected this trying to figure out what are the variables that uh, would boost the SH score. And so what we really got down into is looking at is the Fisher score sucks basically um, nowadays. It doesn't really predict, or it's very weakly predictive of symptomatic spasm, 10% per modified Fisher point. Uh, it doesn't predict your need for shunt uh, or EVD. It doesn't predict your modified Rankin outcome. It doesn't predict the, the, the uh, impact of neurologic injuries. So you can see it just a shout out to uh, our uh, thesis doctoral students, uh, Fabian Fodinger, I think was here one year, um, started in the mathematical modeling, Daniel Mandel and Molina, who was here last year. And now we've uh, partnered with Google to load this uh, in the cloud. So I just wanted to show you uh, this data, uh, which shows you, um, this was early attempts. There was a lot of math before this looking at models. I wish Tom Brott was here because this comes full circle. I feel like, you know, we're repeating the research he did 40 years ago. It turned out that if you take that star-shaped pattern and, and, and approximate that, let's say the middle cerebral artery um, uh, pattern, it does actually map out mathematically to ellipse. You have to do this multiple times. It's very time consuming. And we proposed five areas of, uh, of these blood patterns. So this was what we called quantitative volumetric uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage. And now it's morphed into what we call SAHV or SH volume. So this was a five compartment model and then this is the, the magic, if you will, what happened, Niraj, when we popped in an actual more precise continuous variable into your, the, the uh, paper that you had published. We, again, looked at our population, and it turned out three variables popped out by logistic regression. Logistic regression, like linear regression, is a form of machine learning. And so uh, what we found is age, Glasgow coma scale, and the volume would predict uh, not only your alive or dead status, um, but also your um, uh, future delayed cerebral ischemia, uh, but also your modified Rankin by 30 days uh, or discharge. So this is sort of the breakdown uh, a la very uh, ICH score kind of hemp hill style. So you can see your GCS, we found these cut points. You can see we allocated these numbers to that um, to create that score. The SH volume, basically, again, a dose response relationship we found. Uh, somewhere ab above that 10 to 15 ml dose, which is very fascinating. And I haven't caught up with Tom Bright yet to, this is, you know, he was, he would tell you this is about a tablespoon, you know, 15 mls of blood. So it makes kind of sense, anything 30 and, uh, or 20 or higher. And then the age cutoff there uh, is pretty obvious. And that age factor has been uh, shown before. This is the ROC curve. It's pretty good uh, at 0.88. And so again, uh, this looks like just from the initial CAT scan at admission, their age in the Glasgow, we're able to make predictions, uh, you can see. And I think this is an important finding, Raj. We wanted to uh, come back to this group and, and really uh, open it up to uh, more collaboration. Um, this is just, uh, we replicated the ICH kind of scores, um, showing you red is not good, right? So on the left, this is mortality. On the right, this is modified ranking on it. You don't want to be red, you want to be blue. So a lower uh, ESH score. And this is also DCI prediction. Um, you can see uh, that as well. So um, it's predictive. Um, the, the main variable that changed was a more precise SH volumetric measurement. Uh, we've now gotten into sort of automated um, uh, features. We think this may be an important uh, factor for the disease, right? Just like uh, uh, Raul mentioned, right? It wasn't until we identified a biomarker like Penumbra that it changed the game. So we think this may be a game changer in terms of subarachno disease. I think uh, the Clemo group in Utah used to call this the spasmogens, right? The more blood it's toxic, right? It just kind of makes sense. But we need this call to action. We need collaborators. We'd love to work with uh, folks. So moving into the last part here, uh, technology is changing. This is just shows you how artwork can be prompted through uh, time. Um, just, uh, you know, these the human analog brains and uh, digital brains are, are also changing over time. Um, yes, I'm a nerd. And this is some chat bots that I built. I think uh, Diane's probably the only person on X, but I, if she see, I dissect these articles using my academic chat bot. It rips through, dissects an article, puts five key points with emojis in like five seconds, you know, and then I can go back and read the article slow, like a, like a Niraj um, 
likes. And then we've done some other ones for uh, so owls uh, on call for residents, a safety algorithm and lumbar puncture guide would get consulted. And then I even wrote one this year that helps me write minimal risk IRBs. Uh, so I call that the research lab assistant. So there's some other areas that we've been into uh, for AI and medical education. Uh, so there's the emergence of no code AI. Actually, some people, yeah, I don't know if you played with ChatGPT, but it, it knows seven different coding languages. The other day I had it write something in Py Python, wrote it in uh, popped it into CoLab, it, it generated, I didn't write any code, uh, Chad wrote it for me. So um, I, I, at this point, I don't know that there, it, it's definitely a great co-pilot. Um, there's also a lot of free online education uh, that's emerged uh, in this. So what's in the future? I think what's coming, uh, we're now into, I think this second renaissance is getting very weird, right? The future is very weird. There's 10 times or a million times more uh, fake news. That means we need to use probably AI to filter more of this um, uh, news uh, as, a, as a consequence. We need to not forget the lessons of the first Renaissance using reason and rationality and, and uh, how to uh, prove and disprove things in a very uh, uh, like a scientific hypothesis driven sense. Uh, and are we at this uh, fourth now fifth industrial revolution? I think uh, we're about to see. I think there are many people uh, and there's billions of dollars actually going into humanoid robotics now. Uh, we've been in discussion with a group called Sanctuary, uh, which makes a, a, an embodied large language model humanoid robot, and it will pick stuff up and move things around. So we're uh, experimenting. Uh, I, some people think this singularity may be closer than we think. It's uh, Kurzweil thinks it's around 2045. Um, just some more ethical kind of uh, interesting tidbits. Um, this was a person uh, lost his uh, girlfriend and used all her text messages to, to pop into chat and created a chat bot. And he talked about how it was very realistic, like responses she would say. Eventually he had to pull the plug on that chat bot, but this is some ethical things that we, uh, um, you know, we'll be encountering in the future. And then there was a Google employee uh, that said Lambda, which is now called the uh, Barter Gemini was sentient. Again, going back to that definition and, the last part, there is a group called Hereafter AI that will embody and, and immortalize your loved one using their text and photos uh, to have them as a permanent uh, eternal chatbot for you. Uh, and I'm just sharing uh, these these bits. So this kind of closing things out, uh, um, you know, John McCarthy, one of the, uh, you know, from the original group said, as soon as it works, we don't call it AI anymore, especially my daughter, right? She talks to Siri. She doesn't, she doesn't think that's AI, right? It's not magical. Um, Douglas Adams, the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. He was the one that said, right, it's life is all about asking the right questions, um, right? The universe is full of answers, but um, he also wrote in anything in the world when you're born is normal and ordinary. So my daughter doesn't appreciate in this as AI. Anything that is invented when you're 15 and 35 is new and exciting and you can make a career out of it. Anything invented after you're 35 is against the natural order of things, right? Um, <laughs> so um, yeah, I think Alan Kay said the best, the best way to predict the future is to invent it. I think that's what we intend to do, uh, Star X Labs and our team. I think we're seeing this incredible secondary renaissance, what we call the force industrial revolution of emergent technologies. These are radically exponentially uh, ways that are being combined. And I think we should apply them to stroke and, and cerebral vascular care. Uh, and as I mentioned, I think they can improve our, across the board what we do in healthcare. So with that, I think I am uh, have two minutes to spare. I was gonna ask to switch gears and call on Abby uh, up to the stage. Because I've Naraj, I hope you're you're happy. I I think I have one minute to do a magic trick that I designed specifically around this talk. This is just a little our team and Star X. Um, and I won't start in half. Yeah. We're going to have a camera, it's sort of like a cooking show for you guys. So, doing some documentation or something here. Okay. But uh, I think everyone can kind of see from this vantage point, so I wouldn't worry about that. Plus, it's kind of too much. Yeah. Check. 
she's super skilled. We were talking about this. And so I'll just clarify, Abby, we had not met before today, right? We just had script that started. So I just, in a very short amount of time, I was like, look, we're going to do this at the very end. We have a minute. Can we give you a mic? Yeah. Okay. One, two. All right, let's go. Okay, so this is, uh, hopefully I haven't influenced your mind, but I, I'm just gonna rifle through the cards like this. You tell me where to stop. Okay, I want you to look at the card. I'm gonna, can you guys? Okay, everyone memorize the card. This is easy if you're working with Alzheimer patients because they'll forget and I can pick an each. Okay, all right, let's see. Now, the cool thing about this, uh, this is a normal deck of cards. So I'm gonna do what's called a Pharaoh shuffle just to uh, fan them through here, mix them together. You can see there. Now, Abby, this is the part I'll need you to kind of take a look at. And this, if we get that camera up here, as I want you to look through the pack and hopefully your card is in this pack somewhere, okay? Now the analogy to AI and manual learning is imagine you have all these patients in a queue across the world. One of them has a subarachnoid hemorrhage. There's 52 cards, right? Did you see your card? And they're all different, right? This is a normal deck of cards, right? So that took, you know, 30 seconds. Now, what I would say was even cooler, Abby, is today you chose a great card and how would AI determine that? And I don't know if the audience can see, But can you just describe uh, what's going on there? Okay. Um, I see blue cards and a red card. The red one sort of pops out and that's the optics we were trying to get. What I can do here just to visually get put this at 90 degree angle, it's kind of show you that there's one card out of here. And Abby, go ahead and take that card out and show it to the audience. So with that, zero, zero on the clock. Thank you, Abby. Yeah, yeah. Back to you, Naraj. Superhuman as always. So I have one question. Do you think we live in a simulation or... Yeah, I've heard that uh, brought up. I think I think the brain, our brains, are actually uh, uh, probably a simulation of of the universe that we're living in, right? So that's my interpretation. So, Dr. Wakalu. Uh first, thanks, Dave, for the real magic you just showed us. Um, now. There are companies that are working, uh, whether we can siphon who we are into a chip and then deploy it once the body basically uh, diseases into a younger body. So transfer of personality and all that. And there are a lot of projects around that. And it looks like we are very far away from the major part of our brain, which is the frontal cortex. So it looks like what we or who we are is basically something we are very far away in translating and putting in a chip. Um, now with the quantum computing, there's still a lot of debate whether it will succeed or not. And these big players have put a lot of money. How do you see as a neurologist, what is the consciousness? What is it? Can one define it? Is that something from your research and from your own experience is something we can put our hands around in very close near future? Yeah, so I think uh, that's a great question there. I think uh, the way to answer that is, that, you know, if you guys saw the NVIDIA Jensen Wong's recent announced, they have a chip called Blackwell, which is 20 to 30 times faster than their fastest GPU. 
This has, quote, two hemispheres and a corpus callosum. The corpus callosum transfer rate between the hemispheres is a terabyte per second. We've never seen anything that fast, as I showed you in the early, but this is evolving so rapidly. Um, I think the translation from human biologic to machine, I don't, I don't think we'll, I don't know how we, we prove that, right? How do we, I think it's sort of uh, anthropomorphic that we, we think we might live inside a machine, but we're biologic beings. So I don't, I don't know how to answer that. I think, I think the second thing I would comment on is I think Elon Musk and Neuralink doing these implants is probably recording uh, thoughts and memories. I think they showed someone with, they call telepathy, being able to do things. So, um, but I, I think their goal is to try to trans uh, transpose our memories and thoughts into a solid state. First implant, first implant done today at the Barrow Neurological Institute. Wow, that's <laughs> not too bad, right? Uh, yeah. Barrow and Elon Musk together. So that's awesome. That's but great. you say that. Sorry, uh, you you said that you know we cannot. Uh, you know the the biology but i mean to some extent like getting back to what i was mentioning what simulation i mean our biological body is maybe a machine i mean if we want to go deep like obviously it is our reality that there's this differentiator there but it is a, it is a machine just that we we call biology because we don't have a grasp on the uh, on some of those make, I mean, we have more and more grasp on the complexity and mechanism of it, but. Yeah, no, I think um, some think the human brain probably has some parallels of quantum computing, right? It's 88 billion neurons times 10 times 10,000. So it's like almost 2 trillion connections. And so we don't really have a computer with all the five senses integrated in one uh, sort of interacting machine to that sophistication yet but i think hopefully that slide shows you how this is accelerating extremely fast um but yeah i i, I think that's uh only until we talk to an embodied ai machine we can talk to it and i think we're going to encounter this sort of turing test moment is it alive is it sentient these will these questions will arise so and I, I know that you're definitely a more optimistic human being than I am. Uh, how, how do you foresee the future with this? Because I could see, as far as my stand, as far as I'm concerned, it doesn't seem really, it doesn't seem a little bit scary. Yeah, I think, um, so I go back to the Manhattan Project, right? You think that was an incredible project that had, an, uh, they, it's all about harnessing the good, right? So they harness that, um, you know, a fundamental law of the universe, right, to generate energy, it's maintained, it's been contained and maintained. I think that will be the emphasis for humanity with AI. We should, it should be used to augment our abilities, our artistics, our philosophy, our drug discovery. It should, it, we should embrace our humanity. It should help us in that. I think there's a dark side. I, I know, Eric, we've had these discussions before. I, I, I think it's upon our, you know, it's not upon humanity to make sure that we stay, stay good. Hey Dave, uh, always mind boggling. Um, uh, practical question. So um, in terms of space and space, meaning size, how big are the computers that are needed to, to have, um, you know these these AI models that you're talking about, and and when when do you think that or how large a computer would you need to to replicate the human mind? So the first part of the question, there are um, large language models running on laptops and even phones. I think Apple's probably going to release something in June. They're a much modified version of Siri. The second part is a much harder question. Um, based on the speed we're seeing uh coming along i think that that that's a, it's a hard thing to be precise about um like a full replication of a seeing speaking interacting uh humanoid embodied ai that i think some people think i've heard recently maybe five years which is much earlier than 2045 but i would point out like 
we're closer to 2045 than we were 1940s when this started. Next year, we're going to change the title of the conference from Innovations in Neuroscience to Innovations and Philosophy in Neuroscience. Because this can go really deep. <laughs> and that bottle of scotch would go really well with this. <laughs> uh, are we going to do a break, Dr. Naval? Or are we going to uh, yeah, move I straight? Think, I think a mandatory break for about 10 minutes so you guys can relieve yourself. And speaking of what Ricardo just brought up, you know, the scotch, the next two talks go really well with alcohol. Uh, so if there's an open bar, go find something, and then the the talks will be more enjoyable. Box or the speakers? <laughs> <laughs> Both. Uh, just very quickly for the nurses, don't forget that I need your evals for today. That is part of your CEU. So please, please, please complete them, and then you can leave them in the table. I will pick them up. Thank you. Okay. All right. Let's try to. Uh, all right. Now, have you just tried any? Uh, make sure there's no cards inside that. No, nothing. Nothing inside. Nothing. Find that on your hand. Good. Okay. Good. Now, hopefully, this is very embarrassing. If it were to be on the top of the card, that top hook is not your card, right? Okay. Good. I can do this fifty one other times. <laughs> uh, we'll get this right eventually. But, all right. So you still remember your card? I do. I do. Okay. Good. Yeah. All right, so now I'm going to show you. Hopefully, this is also not your card, right? Like I said, I did. Okay, this is not your card. Somewhere in there. Okay, now cool. Now it goes like this. That was a card we stuck in there. Yep. Go ahead and open the box. Uh oh. Uh oh. <laughs> Watch out. Now oh, check her wallet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I always use this line, check her wallet. <laughs> nice. Even before it's our don't make Abby disappear. <laughs> yeah, the short time I knew Abby, I was like, she, okay, she's coming up on stage. <laughs> man. Yeah. Uh, I love the one with it. Tricks too, though. Oh, no, it's 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 the, one, the one he does with the ace and put this in your hand and I'll put something in your yeah. <laughs> you know the difference between uh, uh, the rod and the three? <laughs> three from the the rod the rod just said a little bit. So believe the third is by the party.
But there's one thing by the belt that I think is that right up the two is the two that are on and probably the zero or four. And I love the robots the same people
Oh, go serious. All right, good evening, guys. You may all want to sit down for this one. <laughs> don't don't throw any objects at me. <laughs> That's okay. They're, they're, not, they're not hard. That's good. They won't hurt. All right. 30 more seconds. All right. So this is my, uh, my every other year uh, anger management session. <laughs> where I get angry about something and then I unleash upon an unsuspecting audience. 
so it's been a couple of years, so making a little comeback. Uh, so we're going to talk about misguided guidelines, the seven deadly sins. Uh, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me. The only uh, disclosure I have is uh, that I am one of the organizers. I did invite myself, which is, which is poor form, you would think. But I confirmed and reached out to the Supreme Court, and they said I have total and complete immunity. I can do whatever I want. So that's great. All right, so, you know, let's talk about what are guidelines, right? So the official definition by the Institute of Medicine for a clinical practice guideline is statements that include recommendations. They're intended to optimize patient care that are informed by a syst systematic review of evidence and an assessment of benefits and harms of alternative care options. Basically, it's a rule book, right? It's a book of rules that tells you how you should manage your patients appropriately to optimize their outcomes. Seems pretty reasonable. You know, you look at the evidence, you assimilate the evidence, you break it down, and then come up with the recommendations for what is best for your patients. And the people you select to do this are the experts in the field, like the people that are proven scientists, that have done research, that know how to read statistics. Uh, we can't do it. I mean, ordinary people can't do it. We don't have the time or the inclination. There's so many studies. There's so many studies with so many hypotheses, so many objectives, so many different uh, you know, ways of doing those studies. You've got different inclusion criteria. You've got different statistics. You've got different primary endpoints. And then you have these results. And sometimes the results and conclusions don't match because if you're a scientist, you want your conclusion to say one thing while the results say something else. Well, that's why you need an unbiased expert panel that reviews these studies and tells you how good the quality of evidence is and what your recommendations should be for patient care. So it makes sense. That's why we have clinical practice guidelines. Now, unfortunately, uh, sometimes those guidelines don't really meet the standards uh, that I say, this is about me, okay? So I apologize. I warned you ahead of time. You're still here. Yes. So, but, so, for you know, we're a faith-based organization, right? It's Baptist. So I decided to go all biblical, even though I'm not Christian. So your seven deadly sins are gluttony, greed, lust, sloth, wrath, pride, and envy, right? There's some of you that don't read the Bible and may not know this. And I didn't get this from the Bible. I got this from the awesome movie, Seven, starring the amazing Morgan Freeman and the above average Brad Pitt. Uh, you know, Seven Deadly Sins, Seven Ways to Die was one of my favorite movies of all time. You can go rent it. Uh, you know, maybe Blockbuster was still there. You could rent it there. If there was Redbox, you could maybe watch it on, I don't know, Amazon Prime, awesome movie. All right, so we're going to go through, we're going to assign each of the uh, the guidelines that I have an issue with a particular specific sin and correlate. So kind of like, you know, cross-connected to the first one, gluttony. So let's define what gluttony is first. Gluttony is overindulgence, too much of a good thing. This inordinate desire to consume more than which one needs. If you read the Bible, it has to be said in fancier language, right? Ye have lived in pleasure on the earth and have been wanton. You have nourished your hearts, your hearts as in a day of slaughter. So, you know, not good, right? Not good. So what, who wins the award for the most gluttonous recommendation or the most gluttonous guideline of them all? So the winner is the American Heart Association and the Neurocritical Care Society, 2023 joint winners for critical care management of patients after cardiac arrest. Now, why do I give them this award, which is a prestigious award? Because, you know, they were asked, amongst other things, to define what should your goal blood pressure be after cardiac arrest? Should it be a more traditional goal of MAP greater than 65 or MAP greater than 80? MAP greater than 85, 65, for example, is what we use for septic patients, for any patients. That's your, like, less than that, your hypotensive, right? Why map greater than 80? Well, you suffered cardiac arrest. Your brain has been deprived of blood and oxygen. Maybe more blood's better for you. Maybe increasing blood flow to the brain somehow improves your outcomes, right? So that's, that was a theory. So 
they looked at studies. They actually did a fantastic job reviewing the studies. None of these studies on the next slide are some obscure papers or trials that I found that they missed. No, they found these, they cited these, they referenced these papers, okay? So give them credit for doing all the work that was needed to be done. The coma care trial looked at a map code of 65 to 75 versus a map code of 80 to 100. What they looked at because they didn't have enough patients to define clinical outcomes was a surrogate marker of an outcome, which was neuron-specific NOLAs at 48 hours. What is neuron-specific NOLAs? When you have neuronal injury, your NSE goes higher. So better outcomes, low NSE. Higher NSE, poorer outcomes, right? We, this has been looked at in cardiac arrest, won't go into the details. The NeuroProtect trial said, well, we're also gonna look at a surrogate marker, but we're gonna look at MRIs. So the amount of ischemia on an MRI as defined by ADC is what we will look at. The percentage voxels that fall above a certain ADC threshold will define how severe the injury is. The greater the number of voxels with an ADC threshold that show ischemia, the worse the injury must be. The third study, which actually had enough numbers to look at clinical trials, was the BOX trial, which is blood pressure and oxygenation targets post-resuscitation care, MAP goal greater than 63 versus MAP goal greater than 77. They actually had enough data to look at clinical endpoints. And they looked at something called cerebral performance category three or four, which is a poor outcome, and mortality at 90 days. So these were the results. Coma care with a MAP goal of 65 to 75, your NSE was lower. In other words, you had less injury. When you went with a MAP goal of 80 to 100, it wasn't significantly higher, but it definitely trended higher. It wasn't trending in the right direction. So surrogate marker was negative. In other words, increasing your MAP goal to a greater than 80 didn't actually give you even a signal, leave alone a statistically significant benefit in terms of surrogate marker showing that you would have improved outcomes if you had enough numbers in that study. The NeuroProtect study, which looked at ADC voxels, 12% met ischemia threshold if you had a MAP goal greater than 65, 16% met ischemia threshold if your MAP was 85 to 100. So again, trending in the wrong direction. A higher MAP hurt you didn't help you. Box trial, which looked at clinical outcomes, 90-day mortality with CPC 3 or 4, which is poor outcomes, was 32% in a MAP goal greater than 63, was 34% MAP goal greater than 77. So now you have three papers, an MRI study, a biochemical study, and a clinical study. All three papers cited by these guys that made the guideline telling you that a MAP goal greater than 80 was not superior to a MAP goal greater than 65. So what do you think they did? I don't know. I don't understand it. Maybe, maybe there's maybe there's some secret to this. I really think that you know they believed in the Nike logo. Just do it. Because I have no biological base. I have, there's no basis for this recommendation. I don't understand why. Now I look at the first author on this, who will remain unnamed, was a former fellow of mine. The last author on this was actually one of my mentors who taught me everything I know about cardiac arrest. They happen to be neurointensivists. I think there's where the conflict of interest is. And that's why I hope this is not being recorded because I'll get sued for this. Mm -hmm. But I think the problem is, you know, if you... <laughs> eh. <laughs> I'll get deported, it's fine. So the issue is if your MAP goal is greater than 80, it means you have to do something. It means those patients need to be in the, neuro, in the neuro ICU. You're being more aggressive with their care. If you're being more aggressive with their care, it makes you more useful. The same way we thought back in the day, neurointensivists were, were more important for cardiac arrest because hypothermia was something only the neurointensivists could figure out, right? So I think that's where the conflict comes. People think you have to do more in order to achieve better outcomes, in spite of the fact that the data shows you the exact opposite. But independent of that, this is your new goal. So I actually think according to this, we're gonna act actively hurt the patient. We're, we're being gluttonous here. So that is a sin. Sin number one, something very similar. Sin number two, greed, defined as materialism, avarice, a selfish and excessive desire for more. Greed is the root of all evil, right? And so the winner for the greed award, uh, surgeons, neurosurgeons, man, neurologists love to bash neurosurgeons. I have two in here in the seven sins where we can go after the neurosurgeons, right? So the American Association of Neurological Surgeons and Congress of Neurological Surgeons back in 2013 made a recommendation. Maintenance of MAP between 85 to 90 for the first seven days following spinal cord injury is recommended. I mean, it makes biological sense. 
you've had spinal cord injury, you improve spinal cord perfusion, maybe you'll have a better outcome. No one is denying the fact that this actually has a biological basis, much like the previous guideline did. So what data have they looked at? There's a paper by this gentleman by the name of Levi, awesome scientist. What he showed was, you know, if you, in patients who have high cervical injury or complete injury, they tend to be more hypotensive. When their injury is lower or it is incomplete, your MAPs tend to be spontaneously higher. So the severity of injury defines where your blood pressure is. So he said, well, you know, there's an association, higher blood pressure with, you know, or a, a, a baseline blood pressure that runs a little bit higher with less severe injury, a lower blood pressure, more hypotension with more severe injury. So he enrolled 50 patients at University of Maryland and set a MAP goal greater than 90. There was no control group. And he said, well, out of these 50 patients that I enrolled, 40% got better, but 40% did not, 20% died. This is better than my expectations. So again, you know, we're talking about spinal cord injury and what we should do as a society for managing these patients. This is not date night. Well, the date wasn't that great, but it was better than my expectations. So I'll take her out for a date again. These are guidelines for God's sake. So this is the basis. This is one of the two papers, okay? The second paper, very similar veil, right? 77 patients, University of Alabama, Birmingham, MAP goal greater than 85 for seven days, put in a swan gans catheter into them, give them colloids, and admit, admit them to the ICU for a week. Again, there was no control group. Again, very similar findings. Higher injury, tended to be more hypotensive, had worse outcomes. Lower injury, better outcomes, recovered better. Again, very similar. 30% of these patients with you know, high cervical, uh, complete cervical cord injury, eventually ambulated. 90% got better if it was incomplete. 88% of thoracic got better. Again, it was the same argument. They did better than they expected. Now, swan gans, for all of you, you know, that use are old enough as I am and use PA catheters, the utility of swan gans has dropped by about 95% over the last 20 years because either we didn't know how to put them in, we didn't know how to wedge them, we didn't know how to interpret them, we didn't know how to treat based on those numbers. It was just a complete cluster. So for a variety of reasons, we don't use swans anymore. Colloids like albumin, there are several trials, the SAFE trial, the CRYSTAL trial, the ALBIOS trial, the CHESS trial, all showing that colloids are not superior to crystalloids. So that's gone. So what we're left with is a map goal greater than 85 and leave them in the ICU. So we said, that sounds good. Let's do that. All right. So that's what we've done based on, again, no evidence. I do want to point out, because I want to be respectful to the authors of these papers, this actually is good, useful information to have. It is hypothesis generating data. You're using level three evidence when you say it is better than my expectations or it is better than the last 50 patients that I had. These outcomes are better. So it's still useful to publish this. But don't use this information to create a guideline. Use this information to actually make randomized controlled trials, right? Otherwise, you get it's crap in, crap out at this point. So what was the basis for this? I believe it was Wall Street. So I don't know if any of you guys saw the movie Wall Street with Michael Douglas, for which he won an Oscar, deservedly so. You know, and he said, greed is good. And I think people forgot that in the sequel, they showed that because of insider training, he went to prison for 14 years. So, you know, it's, greed is not always good. More is not always better. But I think our gut reaction is we need to keep doing more and more to make these people better. Okay. So again, as far as cardiac arrest goes, as far as spinal cord injury goes, the guidelines don't seem to, don't seem to mirror or simulate what the actual findings were in these clinical trials. So the next one, I want to make sure there's no, there's one little kid. Hey, uh, Zena, can you close uh, Sophia's ears, please? Thank you. So this one is everyone's favorite sin, right? <laughs> Lust. I like reading this definition because it's so much fun. It's an intense, immoral, illicit, unrestrained, and depraved craving and longing for impure, sensual desires of the flesh. It's, I mean, this is a sin, all right? It's bad shit. Uh, we may like it, but it's bad. All right, so who wins the award for being the lustiest of them all? The AN. Can you imagine... The nerdiest freaking group in the nation wins the award for being the lustiest. And why? For the PFO closure uh, guideline. Why is PFO lusty? Close the ears again? Good. So you have a hole. I must close it. That sounds lusty to me. I'm just being honest. I, I, didn't, make a, I didn't make any of this up. Listen, these are sins. They're written in books. 
All right. So let's look at the evidence. Let's go through the evidence one step at a time. All right. There was a time in 2015 when we had guidelines that said do not close PFOs routinely. Okay. And let's look at why those guidelines came out. The closure trial showed no benefit with PFO closure for secondary prevention. The criticism of that paper was there were too many patients that were included that had lacuna stroke. So it's like your patient population was wrong. That's fair, a fair criticism. Then there was a PC trial, which is negative at four years follow-up. The criticism of that paper was, well, you know, there were very few index events, very few patients of these, very few patients had strokes on follow-up. So yeah, you didn't see any benefit because not enough people had subsequent strokes. Then you had the RESPECT trial. And that was a tipping point. That looked at cryptogenic stroke in patients with large PFOs. So you quantified the PFOs. You made sure you did not include lacuna strokes on imaging. And then you randomized them to antiplatelets or a Coumadin versus PFO closure. They looked at follow-up at two years, not statistically significant. They did follow-up at five years, not statistically significant. The AN guideline comes out and says routine PFO closure is not recommended, okay? So what changes? The RESPECT trial, then they say, let's wait one more year. Because you know you didn't hit the market two years, we didn't hit the market five years. So they rechecked at six years. And at six years, they finally meet statistical significance. Your magic number of 0 0.05, you've gone just below that. It's 0 0.046. So now you meet statistical significance. Now, this was 2017, guys, okay? We don't have seven-year data, eight-year data, 10-year data, 12-year data. They pick the one year when they finally hit a mark and they say, we're never, we're never looking at this again. We're done. We found a number. This is it. This is evidence, okay? So the problem, there's a few problems. Number one, Fragility index. What is fragility index? This was one of my previous talks. How many patients does it take from a study group to actually have a poor outcome or from the control group to have a good outcome to render a study statistically insignificant? So in other words, it is not reproducible. It is not reliable. One, if one patient from the study group had had a stroke or one patient from the placebo group had not had a stroke, this would have been statistically insignificant. So you're relying on one patient the number needed to treat, 42 PFOs need to be closed to reduce one stroke. And the most important thing that I think we keep like glossing over is we're assuming that medical management is all the same. If you break this study down, that was the basis for changing the guidelines. PFO closures, 3.6% patients had strokes. With anticoagulation, it was only 4.1%. With antiplatelet therapy, it was 6.4%. So if you're comparing anticoagulation to PFO closure, there actually was no difference. So what do you do? You do more studies. You do a reduced trial, which shows a significant difference. You don't include patients that are getting anticoagulated because you don't want to, because you know that's going to like skew your numbers. There's a study called the Defense PFO trial that was conducted in Korea, where they showed 8% patients had a stroke with PFO closure, 18% with medical management. Sounds great, right? Sounds like PFO closure really works, but only 23% of those medical management patients actually were on anticoagulation. Only two of those had strokes. You've still not proven your point that PFO closure is superior to anticoagulation. We keep comparing to antiplatelet therapy because it gives us the answer that we're seeking, which makes it a little biased. Now, this was the definitive study that said, okay, listen, all your criticisms are baloney. Clearly, we're going to show you evidence. They do a two by two study, okay? So you compare anticoagulation with antiplatelet therapy. You compare PFO with antiplatelet therapy. PFO closure superior to aspirin. They claimed anticoagulation not superior to aspirin. If you're going to do a two by two design study, shouldn't the number of patients included in every single corner of those two by two be the same? In this case, it's not. If you look at the numbers, the number of patients that you have in the PFO closure versus aspirin is about 475. If you look at anticoagulation versus aspirin, it's 350. So you statistically crippled the study where you're comparing aspirin to anticoagulation. It's also interesting that in the same aspirin group that you compared with PFO closure, there were more strokes. You look at the aspirin group that you compare to anticoagulation, there were fewer strokes in the aspirin group. So don't tell me one aspirin is better than the other aspirin. The way you do this is you take anticoagulation, you take PFO closure, compare it to all the aspirin patients, and then see if there's a difference. And if you look at it that way, there actually was a statistically significant benefit of anticoagulation over antiplatelet therapy. This should then lead to the next step, which is a head-to-head -head between anticoagulation and PFO closure. But well, we chose not to do that and just publish a guideline, all right? So this is the latest guideline, like I said, lusty neurologist, right? So what comes after lust? Kind of depends, right? If it's a woman, she wants to cuddle, she wants to talk about her feelings. If it's a dude, 
night night see you tomorrow so what is the biblical definition of sloth spiritual apathy or inactivity I, a little bit like me i i'm dead inside so that's spiritual apathy on my part so the ill core is is the group that i want to give credit to for winning the sloth award they uh, were the ones that recommended induced hypothermia for patients post out of hospital cardiac arrest so the basis were two studies haka and bernard and these studies came out when I was just starting out as a resident, like probably my second year of residency. And man, I peddled this shit for 20 years, okay? For 20 years, because I truly believed in it. Like I was naive, still naive, but not that naive. So let's look at the papers and why I truly believe this works. We all did, right? I mean, Muhammad, Yogesh, and all of us, we said hypothermize these patients, cold these patients, but we had a basis. So look at the Haka trial. 2002, 275 patients. The good outcome in the hypothermia group was 55%. In the normothermia group, as we called it then, was 39%. That's a 16% difference in good outcomes. There was a 14% difference in mortality. That's huge. There's very little you find in medical literature where you can see such a huge difference. Of course, I believed it. Look at the Bernard study. Good outcomes in almost 50 patients in hypothermia. Roughly half of those with normothermia. Why would I not believe that we should cool these patients? Like that was that was gold standard. And like I say, it was level one evidence for all patients with VTAC, VFib, pulseless. Go ahead and put them on hypothermia. Until actually you start reading a little bit between the lines. All right. So how many patients did they enroll? 275. How many did they screen to enroll those patients? 3,550. So in other words, you selected 8% of the population to actually study in this paper. How can you extrapolate that data to the other 92% patients who came in with out-of-hospital cardiac arrest? So by being super selective, you had a positive trial. But what would have happened if you would have enrolled those other 92% patients? So maybe that's a flaw of the study, right? But we didn't think about it then. If you look at the Bernard study, again, we spoke about fragility index. The p-value is 0 0.046. All it takes is one patient to flip the numbers and lose statistical significance. Also, these studies were unblinded. So you had one study where you enrolled into hypothermia if they came in Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and then you enrolled into normothermia if it was Tuesday, Thursday. So you could figure out exactly which patient was cool, which patient was not. Did that have any impact on your discussions with the family in terms of withdrawal of care? Nah, they got cool. We put them through all this stuff. Let's keep them alive a little bit longer. Maybe waiting a little bit longer, they had a better outcome. Maybe they survived. Speculative, but these studies were not perfect enough to actually make a guideline that said cool all these patients. So since then, fortunately, two more trials were published and the findings of these trials should not be shocking, right? TTM1 comes out, TTM2 comes out. TTM1 compares 30, 33 to 36 degrees. TTM2 did 33 versus 37.8 or less. Mm -hmm. And TTM1, 1,000 patients, not 77, not 275, showed mortality at hypothermia was 50%. With targeted temperature management at 36, it was 48%. So actually, there was no benefit to cooling these patients as much as we did. Remember, with targeted temperature management, you're preventing a fever. Maybe the reason patients had poor outcomes in the normothermia group was because you're allowing them to be hypothermic. You're allowing their brains to get fried. There's a difference between saying prevent a fever versus saying cool them down to 33 degrees, right? And then TTM2, they actually compared 33 to less than 37.8. In other words, preventing a fever, no difference. If anything in the hypothermia group they found, you're promoting arrhythmias, you're using more paralytics, they're on the ventilator longer, they're having more side effects and the outcomes are not better. So at this point in time, you've got enough evidence to say in 2023, when the new guidelines came out that hypothermia is not recommended. Guess what? The 2023 guidelines, which I alluded to earlier when we spoke about MAP colds, post-cardiac arrest, don't talk about hypothermia. They talk about blood glucose. They talk about what a hemoglobin should be. They talk about electrolyte replacement. They talk about everything, but they don't even acknowledge 21 years later that the guidelines they come up with in 2002 were flawed and we shouldn't do hypothermia anymore. They just completely stay silent. So you've made an error. We've all made mistakes, but you come out and acknowledge it. They don't acknowledge it. So I'm sure there's places where they're still getting cool to 32, 33, 34, because the new guidelines haven't come out specifically and said, don't cool these patients. 
So, you know, this guy, The Undertaker, my favorite professional wrestler, little tidbit, you know, again, I've always been a Undertaker fan. The first thing I did when I came to the US, June 8th, 2000, I arrived here June 11, 2000, I went to Madison Square Garden and saw him perform live. Like I was an only child. I had make-believe friends. You know, in India, you, when you pray to God, you burn these incense sticks. I would collect the ash from the incense sticks, put it in an urn, and then pray to it. But like I said, I had some serious issues growing up. He does represent wrath. So the next uh, the next sin is wrath, anger, indignation, fury, rage. From rage, you get roid rage or steroid rage. So again, we bring the surgeons back for guidelines for the management of acute cervical spine and spinal cord injury. ANS and CNS in 2002 recommended solumedrol for these patients at 30 mix per kilo bolus, followed by 5.4 mix per kilo per hour, yada, yada, yada. And you see the different categories. You look at this recommendation and you're like, you've actually gotten it down to a decimal. If you've gotten it down to a decimal, you've got to be right. I mean, how can you fine tune it so much and be wrong? So again, I'm, I'm a I'm mathematically minded guy. I totally believed it and said, we should do this. Roids for everyone, right? There must be some basis for it. So the basis actually were NASIS 2 and NASIS 3. NASIS 1, oh, sorry, NASIS 2 was a study that randomized spinal cord injury patients to either high dose steroids at the doses that I just showed you versus naloxone or placebo. And this was one of those things, and we're starting to see that a lot right now again. It had gone away for a while. When a positive study or a so-called positive study comes out, it gets released to the press. Everyone talks about it. We don't have the paper to review. We can't look at the statistics, but it gets announced, right? And so what happened with NASIS 2 is it got announced in the press. We have a miracle treatment for patients that have acute spinal cord injury, and it is steroids. And everyone should be on steroids, high-dose steroids. There are physicians and surgeons who complain saying, wait, where's the paper? Where's the data? And what they were told was, no, no, we cannot, the paper is going to get published in six to eight weeks. In the meantime, we cannot ethically allow patients who are paralyzed to not get a life-saving treatment. It's why we're going out and publishing it. The American Paralysis Association that actually speaks for paralyzed patients said, we strongly endorse this because we should not lose time. It is something similar that happened with Adalheim and medications for like dementia, right? Even though you saw no clinical benefit, you saw these markers and you're like, oh, there's less tau, there's less you know, new, uh, tangles. So yeah, that, that works. We should use that. And then when the paper comes out, you're like, what are you talking about? I don't see the clinical benefit. So this was very similar. The NIH in the meantime, because the controversy sent out an advisory to all the ER saying, guys, start giving these high doses of steroids. The paper is coming. The paper is coming. Well, it came. Again, you can use steroids for up to 24 hours. 95% of these patients actually receive steroids within 14 hours. But when you look at the total patient population, 487 patients, there was no benefit. It did not meet statistical significance. It did not even get close. What they actually had done is they had done post hoc analysis of patients who, when they got steroids within eight hours, they actually had improved outcomes. That grabbed the headlines. So it was a post hoc analysis that showed them benefit, not the overall paper. Now, again, maybe I'm being petty, okay? At the end of the day, if it helps you within eight hours, it helps you within eight hours, right? I mean, fine, don't give it from eight to 24 hours, but give it to them within eight hours. So while it's probably not the right way of doing things, there still was a benefit. So should we be that critical? Well, maybe we should, because when the actual paper comes out, you actually realize that in less than eight hours, steroids do better than placebo. Greater than eight hours, steroids do worse than placebo. How could they do worse? Maybe they're not significantly better than placebo. They lose statistical significance, but they're doing worse. So break it up even more. And then you start realizing that actually the placebo group after eight hours did better than the placebo group before eight hours. So the, the so-called great outcomes with steroids was not because of the steroids. It's because the placebo group did disproportionately poorer in the first eight hours. So by that same stretch, we should say, hey, you know what? After eight hours, let's give everyone placebo. I, like why? That, that was completely ridiculous. They also saw when they were looking at other secondary outcomes, they had one and a half times higher risk of GI bleeding, twice higher wound infections, three, three times higher PEs. So this study was basically a complete crock, not the way it was done, but the way it was presented, the way it was published, and the way the guidelines jumped the gun and said, this is what we should be doing for all these patients. Now, all of a sudden, NASIS-2 has made steroids standard of care. There are people like raising their hands saying, wait, 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 this is not okay. It doesn't matter. You're being shot down, right? They did this whole survey with, uh, where the neurosurgeons 
actually were asked, listen, should we change the guidelines? And what was done was at the level of the society was, well, what we should do is give the patient the option, the patient's family the option. You know, I know the evidence isn't great, but do you want steroids or don't you want it? Guess what? Over 90% of the patients said, yes, we want steroids. When you put them in a position where you say, I can give you nothing or I can give you something, of course, they're going to say give you something. But that's not scientific, right? So NASIS-3 comes out. NASIS-3, by now you can't have a placebo group because ethically it's wrong to have a placebo group. So now you're comparing patients that are on roids to do you do it for 24 hours or do you do it for 48 hours? So now you've gone even over. 24 hours isn't enough of animal doses or steroids. Let's do it for 48 hours. What they found was that three to eight hours post spinal cord injury, you actually had improvement in this FIM score by three grades of higher in the 48 hour group if they came in between three to eight hours after injury and said, okay, in the first three hours post injury, do it for 24 hours and three to eight hours after injury, do steroids for 48 hours. The problem was that your endpoint was flawed. It was an improvement in your functional independent measure by three points. 25% of the patients that came in that were in the 24 hour group actually did not have any functional deficits. How do you improve by three points when you cannot improve? It's like having a TPA study and saying that your endpoint is an improvement in NIH by four points. And then you put a bunch of patients that have an NIH of zero, they can't improve by four points and say, see, the other group did better. I mean, again, that's statistical manipulation, foolishness, I don't know, it depends on how you look at it. Either way, there was no difference in mortality or morbidity in the entire population. So the difference though, and this is where you have to give, you know, the neurosurgeons credit, which we can't for the previous societies, is they acknowledged that this data was baloney. They actually did another follow-up study with like over a thousand patients. They showed that there's no benefit to steroids. They acknowledged that the recommendation needed to be changed. And they actually said there is no benefit to doing steroids or high-dose steroids in these patients. Like I said, we make mistakes. We jump the gun. You go back, you correct your mistakes. That's the mature way to do things. All right, so the next one is pride. I have very low self-esteem, so this is not one of my sins. Uh, so what is pride? A high or inordinate opinion of one's own dignity, importance, merit, or superiority, whether cherished in the mind or displaced in conduct, or displayed in conduct. So perfect example, right? The person who thought he was in inevitable until, until he spontaneously disintegrated. This is another one that might be a little controversial. <laughs> I, I can block out the sun. I can look at the sun without eclipse glasses because, you know, my eyes have complete and total immunity. So, again, I, I stayed away from political statements the entire talk. I had to do it once. All right. So, this is pride that we have as physicians. We must do something, anything. You can't not do something. You can't stand by and let the body heal itself. I'm a physician or a surgeon, for God's sake. I have to do something. So the recommendation comes from the American College of Cardiology. I mean, some of my colleagues here know how strongly I feel about this. For patients taking factor 10A inhibitors, and dexanid alpha is recommended for reversal. Okay. So we know that and dexanid alpha is a factor 10A, uh, you know, uh, mimic. It's a recombinant protein that binds the, the, the factor 10A inhibitors. We had a trial called the NXA4 trial. Okay. It decreased anti-10A activity by 92%. Amazing. Excellent or good hemostasis was achieved in 82% at 12 hours. Fantastic. 14% died. But hey, ICH patients die all the time, right? So what? That's not bad. 10% had thrombotic complications. Well, you have clots. You're reversing something that is causing bleeding. You're going to have some clots. And the argument that was made was, well, it's not because of the agent. It's because you stopped the blood thinner. That's why you started clotting all over the place. So what are you crying about? Like, this is right. This is good. This is great. The issues were, there was no randomized control trial. You didn't have a placebo group. You didn't know what this comparison was for. You didn't know how many would have died if they wouldn't have gotten the agent. You don't know what the hemostasis would have been if you did exactly nothing but just blood pressure control and monitor the patient, monitor the patient in the ICU. The factor 10A uh, level decrease did not correlate with hemostasis. So you don't know if the lab values that you're checking have anything to do with stopping the bleeding. You didn't include patients that were due to go for surgery within 12 hours. You didn't include patients who had a GCS less than seven. You didn't include patients who had a ICH volume greater than 60 cc's. So saying that my outcomes actually mortality wasn't bad. Well, you've excluded the sickest patients who probably would have died. So is 14% that good? I don't know. 
And the 10% thrombotic complication rate, well, if you compare some of the data that came out earlier with PCC, they suggested theirs was three to 4%. So I don't know if there's enough evidence at this point, again, without a placebo group to be able to tell us that actually there is benefit to this agent. So did we jump the gun a little bit, right? Maybe. Now, this slide occasionally was titled Suck It, Naval, because, you know, sometimes you can be wrong, right? And maybe I'm wrong, and maybe it's better to be lucky than good, right? So the study that followed that since then that was done, that was mandated by the NIH, uh, was stopped, actually the FDA, was stopped early due to superior efficacy in the index and group. That's the NXI study. Excellent or good hemostasis was achieved in 64% patients with index and versus 52% with usual care. Usual care could be PCC, it could be doing nothing. So actually, they did show hemostasis in this follow-up study after the guidelines came out. So again, the guidelines may have been premature, but in hindsight, maybe they were right. There was a 90% decrease in factor 10A activity. Again, there is something you want. And there was comparative superiority in your hemostasis endpoint. 12 and a half cc's was considered that cutoff beyond which if you have further like, you know, bleeding, that's suboptimal. So it was 12% in the indexinate group, 19% in the usual care group. You proved your point, right? Suck it, Naval, like I said. I will not suck it because look at the rest of the data. What is important for these patients, right? Is it what you see on a scan? Is it a factor 10A value or is it their functional outcome? It's about, are they going to survive? Are they going to live, right? So when you look at good clinical outcomes, modified rank in less than three, less than or equal to three at 30 days, 28% patients with indexonet achieved a good outcome. 31% patients who did not get indexonet had a good outcome. So there's no signals even going in the direction of indexonet. 30-day mortality was 28% with indexonet, higher than with patients who did not get it, 25%. You had 10% plus thrombotic events in the indexonet group, less than 5% in the usual care group. So you can't say it wasn't because of indexonet, it's because you stopped the blood thinners. And then if you look at the other issues that you were concerned about, new strokes seen in six and a half patients with indexonet, one and a half percent with usual care, 4.2% with indexonet had MIs, one and a half percent with usual care. So, I mean, what's going on here? You're seeing hemostasis at a superior level with indexonet, you're seeing trends towards worse outcomes, right? Is this something we could have foreseen? Like, is this a foreseeable paradox or is this a surprise? As Stone Cold Steve Austin would say, oh, hell yeah. I mean, clearly there was a paradox here, but it was to be expected. You know, Manny just presented the data on FAST, right? You saw superior hemostasis when you gave activated factor seven. Guess what? The mortality in patients that got activated factor seven was 26%. In patients who didn't get it, it was 21% because of all the thrombotic complications. We had a study called ULTRA that looked at giving anti fibrinolytic therapy to patients who had aneurysms, preventing early re-rupture of aneurysms. Guess what? It worked. It reduced your risk of re-rupture from 14% to 10%. You look at good outcomes or excellent outcomes being modified rank in zero to two in the group that got anti fibrinolytic therapy or TXA, it was 48%. In the group of patients that didn't get it, it was 56%. So again, the complications outweighed the potential benefit. So in my opinion, I think the ACC recommendation or the American College of Cardiology recommendation was premature. I think the NXI study termination is premature because it hasn't given us any additional information in terms of whether this actually helps our patients. The problem is, what do I do now? Like, do I just sit and do nothing? Do I give indexonet despite the clinical data? not mirroring the hemostasis data? Do I give PCC? But in the usual care group, when you compare PCC to doing nothing, there was no difference. Maybe PCC doesn't work either. So I don't have any answers, only questions. All I have is flawed guidelines that I have to go by. Final one. This one doesn't require a definition. I call this slide NB. All right, I, some of you may recognize the lady on the right, Margaret Robbie, known to you as Barbie. For me, she will always be the she-wolf of Wall Street. When you go out and pick up a copy of Seven, pick up Wolf of Wall Street, put your kids to bed and watch it. It's an amazing movie with an amazing, amazing performance. So I think all the guys and some women are rather envious of that dude standing next to her. Uh, I know I am. In Hindu sort of mythology customs, what, what we're told is, you know, how you behave during this life will dictate how you come back in your next life. That dude must have either been a saint or he went to Africa and took care of like sick kids or he died for his country or something, right? Like I said, just a little bit of envy here. So the winner of the envy award, the final award of the night is the guidelines for management of patients with spontaneous ICH given to AHA. 
The recommendation is, again, this mirror is a little bit of Manny stock, minimally invasive approaches for evacuation of supratentorial ICH and IVH, showing reduction in mortality. So we know, and the reason we talk about NB is, you know, ischemic stroke has gone so many changes, right? You've got TPA, you have TNK, you have thrombectomy, now you have the SELECT2 trial showing, I don't care what your aspects is, I can still thrombectomize you and you can do better. Whereas ICH is stuck in no man's land until Enrich, but we talked a little bit about Enrich, we won't go there again. So with thrombolytic therapy, you know, we've had previous studies, FAS, stop it, stop light, attach, stitch one, stitch two, all being negative. What if you use thrombolytic agents for a bleed? Can you improve their outcomes? And that's clear IVH, clear two, MIST one, MIST two. I was fortunate enough to work alongside Dan Hanley, who's like a genius. He was one of the people that started up neurocritical care at Hopkins. And, you know, he truly believed in this. And I think these studies are amazing studies in terms of how they should be conducted. I don't have issues with the studies. I do with, with how people have interpreted the results. So MIST three, 500 patients with greater than 30 cc ICH, modified rank in zero to three, which is a good outcome. 41% in the minimally invasive surgery arm, 41% with best medical management. That difference was not statistically significant. They tried to move the outcomes a little bit and say, well, zero to two is a better outcome than zero to three, no difference. They're like, nah, you have an ICH, a lot of people die, as you would say zero to four is a good outcome. Didn't show any difference. They did say that if you achieved a goal of less than 15 cc's, you would have better outcomes. But in trying to achieve a goal less than 15 cc's, is it possible? that you could have had more bleeding as you keep pushing in more TPA into a clot, possible. So we don't know that for a fact. The mortality reduction was not statistically significant. And then clear three, which is where you put a catheter in the brain, the EVD, and you put it directly into the ventricle and try and lyse that clot, you're giving TPA. 48% good outcomes in patients who got intrathecal TPA, 40, 45% with medical management. You had a low case fatality at 180 days, 18 to 29%. So one in 10 patients that got intrathecal TPA at six months, was alive with intrathecal TPA that would have otherwise died. And that's what they're focused on. The problem was you took a bunch of these patients from modified rank in six. So if one out of 10 lives were saved, 10 out of 100 lives were saved, of those 10 lives, eight of them had a modified rank in a five. So you basically taken a bunch of guys and left them disabled, requiring assistance with every single thing. There was no reduction even in shunt dependence. So it didn't even do the basic thing. Hey, I lysed the clot, you don't need a shunt. I'll take that as a positive, but they weren't able to show, show that. They said there was no increase in the infection rates, which to me is ridiculous because in your placebo group, they had EVDs and they actually instilled saline in their brain. So basically what you're doing for these guys is you are actually injecting something into your brain, increasing your risk of meningitis. So saying there's no risk of meningitis, I think is not true. So when we think about these outcomes, what is more important, surviving with severe disability or you know, a true functional outcome where you have a quality of life? And to find that answer, you go to James Bond, right? There's a reason the NIH came out and said functional outcome matters. And for those of you who followed Bond, Bond never died until the latest Bond. And that's James Bond, Daniel Craig, looking up at these missiles from MI5 coming to blow him up. And you have his eulogy in the background from M saying the purpose of man is to live, not to exist. If for no other reason, that should convince us that functional outcomes matter, not just mortality. Like live, right? Really live, don't just exist. Doesn't matter though, because AHA disagreed and AHA gives you a 2A recommendation for do intrathecal TPA for lysing the clot in the brain, do intrathecal TPA for clearing the IVH. Yeah, they say what they say and they're the experts, right? We're just normal human beings. So the conclusion of this talk, you know, like I said, there were seven deadly sins we've established the sins, we haven't established the sinners, right? Is it the people who publish these papers, right? You know, when they had results and then the conclusions don't match the results. If you think this was a passionate talk, can you imagine what would happen if you criticize my paper? I would go off on you guys. So I don't blame the authors for coming up with their own interpretation of the results. Like research papers, research projects are like our kids, right? You make every excuse for them. I get it, I understand it. If, you know, I, I'm sure like, I would have argued with Ricardo and Eric about thrombectomy saying, dude, the data's bullshit, IMS3 shows you. Why are you like stuck up on thrombectomy? It doesn't do anything. Persistence pays off. So it's okay to actually be in a little bit of denial if you truly believe in something. So I don't blame the authors of the papers, right? This is not a criticism of the authors or any of their papers. Should I blame the panel? Should I blame the experts who wrote the guidelines who are supposed to be unbiased? Perhaps, but I don't. 
I blame all of you. I blame me. I blame us as a society, right? These societies, American Heart Association, Neurocritical Care, whoever it is, we don't exist for them. They exist for us. They're answerable to us, right? It should not matter who says the truth. I know political times are weird right now. The truth is the truth. The truth speaks for itself. If you find something that is wrong, that is off, write a letter to the editor, write a letter to your society, you know, talk to them about uh, this guideline doesn't make any sense. Like write a paper. We keep whining and complaining. If you're not part of the solution, you are part of the problem. So reach out to those societies, tell them, I don't understand. This doesn't make any sense. Get it published. Hell, blog. You've got time for TikTok. You know, go ahead and, you know, write a blog or something. Maybe someone else will like it. And then before you know it, it becomes a movement, right? So I do think there is hope. You know, if this universe was the kind of universe I wanted to live in, which essentially is like a comic book Marvel universe. Uh, at this point in time, and I was some, I was some sort of variant of, of, you know, a brown sort of Captain America. This would be about the time I would say Avengers, assemble. Thank you all. I'll take any questions. Go ahead. Well, thank you for all the information. And going back to the reversal of the anticoagulation of the wax with Agnexa, uh, I think that we still, we don't know many things, but uh, any wrap up message regarding when when is really beneficial to use it I mean, size of the uh, intracranial hemorrhage, clinical picture, any comments? Uh, it's hard, right? Because again, we don't even know what to do, leave alone when to do it, to be perfectly honest. I mean, if you're looking at the inclusion criteria, they excluded the sickest patients, which made sense because they're trying to show hemostasis. How do you show hemostasis in someone who's going to die in the next 24 hours? So I get why they excluded the sickest patients. Uh, I just don't see the risk benefit you know, ratio matching up. I mean, if all the data we see right now is that yes, it promotes hemostasis, but no, it doesn't change outcomes, then why do we accept it now? Why did we not accept activated factor seven when the FAST trial came out or when the original Nova, Nova 7 paper came out when it showed that it actually promotes hemostasis? Same thing with blood pressure control, like with ATTACH or you know, any of the other studies. Those studies showed Yes, it promotes hemostasis. It doesn't improve outcomes. The offset was the unfortunate part of like very aggressive blood pressure control was acute kidney injury. So that outcomes actually weren't better. I think any agent or any intervention that you do has two sides to it. And those, you have to weigh the two against each other. Anything we do in medicine is a risk benefit ratio. With Indexanet, at this point, so far, what I truly believe is that it works. It promotes hemostasis. I'm not seeing the clinical benefit. Does that mean that the dose needs to be fine-tuned? Or is it just a matter of they only had 480 patients? This study must continue to 700, 800 patients, and then you will see the clinical benefit, perhaps. But even the signals are not going in the right direction. It's not like you're seeing a 3% or 4% or 5% benefit with clinical outcomes, but you don't have, have enough numbers to show statistical significance. Because then you can talk about number needed to treat. And then you can go and say, okay, if I gave 20 patients in Dexanet, one patient would survive. But right now we have none of that. Absolutely none of that. Probably, uh, I mean, talking from the clinical trenches, I mean, what first line trenches uh, is probably what is is pushing the people to do it is because we think, okay, this patient that needs a hematoma to be evacuated. So how can the neurosurgeon go inside when the patient is fully anticoagulated? So it needs to be reversed. No, I. So, but that's the same thing we do, right? We do something. We give case centra, we give Indexonet, you know, Dr. Savage or Dr. Handel get in there, they take the hematoma out, they feel better that we gave something. We feel, hey, we at least did something. What if they bleed to death? This way I did something. And trust me, that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna keep doing something. All I'm saying is that the evidence doesn't back it up and the guidelines were premature. I'm being asked to stop over and over again, so I have to stop. Mm -hmm. Uh, b before I introduce Dr. Chimaisan, uh, oh, yeah. uh, I will just uh, say that we record this and we're going to turn that into a paper. You're going to have to sign, we're going to publish. Then, <laughs> then the hit is on.
All right, I would like to invite Dr. Chamesh Sani. I, we don't have time for introductions as much, but as you guys know, like he's my friend, he's my brother. He is the only non-Indian neurointensivist at Baptist. Uh, but he is genuinely the hardest working human I have ever come across my entire life. And so, you know, I'm proud to call him a colleague and you know, I look forward to his talk. And by the way, amazing dressing sense, as you can see. This is <laughs> Thank you, Naval. Thank you guys for having me here. Slides on. Testing. Yep. Thank you, Naval. Just for the records, I don't shop. I hate shopping. My wife does my shopping and she made me wear this suit. I had no choice. Oh. I got your mic. Oh, can we start, guys? One second. Oh, am I gonna be able to see the slides? Okay. Or it's gonna be lagging behind. Okay, so, you know, I, since I submitted this talk, probably a year ago, a topic, I've been asking a lot of questions. Are you sure gonna talk about this? Like, does this belong to this conference? Even my wife did not believe I'm gonna put it off. So she wanted to come and see it in person. So the digital revolution of money is coming. I mean, we're just not used to it because we're used to analog version of money. You have to put have a credit card or cash. But the digital revolution of money is coming, no question about that. And um, and it's it's a very very abstract con concept. And I feel like the best way humans can learn is by learning and from analogies. And you'll be surprised how much analogy there are between the Bitcoin and the brain network. So I'm gonna be, send, uh, be passing on a very complicated topic, but it's gonna be all through analogy and and I promise you by the end of the talk you're gonna know more about Bitcoin than the average person and you're gonna know about the key concepts of Bitcoin why it's so resilient as a system. Next oh, I can move it okay perfect so I'm a Bitcoin maximalist so this is not a financial advice all my money is in Bitcoin but no one should do that and again I'm People who know me, I work hard, I don't drink, I'm not a gambler. I did this because of my background. I'm from Lebanon, four or five years ago, the banks took every Lebanese money in their bank account. And hyperinflation sucks. My brother lives in Venezuela, hyperinflation sucks. So that's my background. And that's what made me go into this rabbit hole. Uh, again, it's not a financial advice. So this is only that I do things by choice. Uh, and this is, this is, Clearly, I've changed over the years. People think it's because of Baptist. It's not. If you ask my mom, she thinks because of Zena. It's not. If, it's, if you ask the MPs, they think because I work on every Indian holiday. I don't think so. Um, probably Biden has part of it. But really, it's, it's Bitcoin. This is before investing in Bitcoin is after Bitcoin. Stay away from that. Because if you don't do your homework, you don't understand that you're going to buy high, sell low. So this is not for everyone. You're going to do your homework. So again, it's all about analogies here. So last yesterday we had a debate between Savaju and Nigara about who should we intervene here. And the whole talk is how we, the whole last two days we've been talking about improving stroke outcome and mortality. And even on a day-to-day -day basis, I called the surgeon, let's take this guy for the thrombectomy. He's a driver. He has to be able to see and provide for his family. Without, if you can't provide, you have no value. On the other side, if you have someone who's eight years old, and she has a P1 occlusion and she can't see, she can still play poker. So her value is preserved. So it's all about the value. These are all relevant discussions, but there's also a bigger force that no one talks about, the elephant in the room, economic inflation, which depreciates our purchasing power. And the way I look at it is, if you take my purchasing power, you're stealing my time and my effort. And that's not any different from a stroke affecting a patient, giving a poor outcome and taking away the productivity. I look at it as that. And Bitcoin taught me how to preserve someone's value. So that's why I put this talk together to demystify the topic of Bitcoin. I crafted it from the perspective of brain. I promise it's not gonna be a geeky lecture 
talking about codes. It's not gonna be as fancy as Dr. Freeman, and it's not gonna be economic lecture and boring. But I have to cover a few basic concepts just that at least we can go about the analogies later. So this, this is the problem. Only in year 2020, they printed $6 trillion in the United States. Average salary of an American is 60 to 70k a year. This means 100 million hours of work are stolen in a push button. When they say Bitcoin is backed by nothing, no, actually real money is backed or fiat money is backed by nothing. If an average American works 50 years, that is 2 million human lives of productive labor is all gone over, over just overnight. That's the problem here. Next few slides, I try to make it as simple as possible, but I need to cover the basics so everyone can uh, catch up. What is a blockchain? Best way to look at it, the most simplistic way is blockchain is like human memory. There's different areas of the brain, short-term memory, long-term memory. I may forget what's the name of the book I read last night, but if you give me the book, I will know what it's about or the name of the movie. So you can't knock out one neuron and lose the whole memory. The memory is decentralized in the brain. Same thing with the blockchain. Blockchain is a huge, it's a database put on all those computers. And there's a duplicate copies of those computers. And if you take down two, three, four computers, it doesn't matter that the database is preserved. What is proof of work? Again, just like us, we, 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 don't, we don't become physicians just out of the way. You have to put the effort to learn and come up with memories that and information that becomes permanent. A proof of work is a very geeky concept by just, that's the basis of Bitcoin. It's the work needed to uh, secure the network and to make the blocks. Those blocks are every 10 minutes, which is basically the transaction. So for instance, for example, in real world now, if I have $10,000, I put it in the bank. For example, Ricardo can have 9,000 loan from Chase Bank. He can go put that 20% down and buy a $45,000 house. And then now the builder got 45,000 house. If I look at my account, I have 10,000 and he owns a house. That's why we have money out of thin air and there's inflation. Proof of work, it records those blocks. If I send five Bitcoin to Savage, or Savage will send two Bitcoin to Naval, Naval cannot go buy a house and pay for five Bitcoin because there's a permanent ledger saying he only has two Bitcoins. That data is all packaged together every 10 minutes and saved permanently. So you can go back after five years, 10 years, no one can take the money away. For instance, again, I, I gave the example from Lebanon, they took people's money in Cyprus 2011, the whole bank, uh, they took $11.5 billion to pay from the from the population of Cyprus so that they can pay the bank, save the banking system. Recently in Canada, when there were protesters against uh, COVID, people got money on the GoFundMe page. They were able to reverse the money, take the money back, and the government took out the money. When that money is put on this uh, database, no one can touch it. I'm going to focus so much on the security and how that relates to the brain. So proof of work is recording of the data and make it secure. So just like if I eat chocolate, if I practice, if I save a patient, I feel rewarded. I feel like some dopamine surge. The people, the miners that protect the network, they get rewarded every 10 minutes Bitcoin. So you put the hard work, you, you earn your hard work, you get the reward, which is the Bitcoin. So this is the last technical slide, but that's gonna wrap up the whole concept before we go to the next slide. So if this is the blockchain and the green, Squares are the database. Though each computer, the black, the yellow, the autos ones, have a copy of this database. Now, each computer is going to try to uh, solve a puzzle so that uh, they can, and the computer to solve the puzzle will get the reward and and uh, right off that block. So they all start working and and fighting for the solving the puzzle. Let's say the red computer makes it. Then the red computer says, "I got the answer." They send a signal to all the other computers in the network, which is all over the world. And they say, okay, this guy got it. Let's prove if he got it by consensus, which is a very important concept. So consensus and distributed. And I would say, okay, the red one got it. He got rewarded. So now he's going to get the reward for the Bitcoin. And that information that he got in 10 minutes is going to be permanently added to the ledger. The money I sent the last 10 minutes to my colleagues, it's going to stay there permanent. So it's pretty much as if, in the real time lifetime, someone is opening your safe, checking on your money every 10 minutes and putting it back there and confirming that the money is there every 10 minutes. You're gonna start early teaching the kids. That's for a while was Sophia's favorite book. 
the other day when she went to the dentist, uh, she took out a couple of teeth. She said, uh, well, I don't want $5, I want five Bitcoin. So I can afford that. But she's on the right track. So again, it's all about analogies here. We are all, we are all born with 86, on average, 6 billion of neurons. What makes, what unlocks the potential of the brain is not me creating more neurons, it's the connectivity between the neurons. So then the, the connection between the neurons, how much I put the hard work to learn a new, new task, that's what makes my brain more valuable. Bitcoin, there will only be 21 million Bitcoins. And so the value of network goes up and the price isn't going up, not because you create more Bitcoins, because the network becomes more secure. And that's the true value of the, uh, of the, of the Bitcoin. Is Bitcoin and brain are both decentralized. It's the easiest concept I can explain to you guys here. This, we are all stroke doctors here. So if you have a perfect circuit for loose, you can lose a vessel and still have backup mechanism. And that's what we do in medical management, right? I'm trying to make the blood flow to that area more decentralized. I give some fluids, I do some different pressures. My goal is to bring the blood up or the certain come into a bypass. If this balance becomes centralized acutely, this balance is, goes out of control, then we have an LVO and the surgeon has to come and take the brain out. Same thing with the network. You can take half of the network down. It doesn't matter because each not, each 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 uh, computer have the backup for the whole database since the uh, initiation of Bitcoin. So uh, we talked about the distribution. This is consensus. Again, people think occipital lobe is what we need to do to see so we can see. It's actually not. This trying to make it simple here. There's two pathways that allow us to process vision. So imagine I'm trying to cross the tree which you take with a car. I need to see what's coming my way, how fast they're coming. Is it a truck? Is it a bicycle? Is it a human being? What's coming the other side and then make my decision. So the what pathway, the where pathway, pathway are all talking to each other. Instantaneously, this, this message is, is confirmed. Then I make a decision to cross or not. It's not about one area in the brain that's allowing me to do that. Same thing with the conscious. Dr. Freeman alluded to that. We don't know what the conscious is. I know some patients who have a stroke. They can stop talking, they can stop moving, but they don't go from being unethical to ethical. I wish we can find a way where the area of the conscious is, then I would know who to vote for. But hope is coming. And uh, 2000, it's gonna be landslide. Again, I had to put that on because I know is gonna have a Trump joke, so one to one. Again, and that's how my wife gets back to me. She made me work a pink suit today. So next. So again, this is a very easy concept to explain to you guys. Neuroplasticity is what makes a human being so unique. You know, if we get a stroke, we, get, we, we, we can fight that stroke and recover by neuroplasticity. If I need to learn, if I'm not good at something, I can go do it again and again and again until I get better with it. And Bitcoin has this kind of flexibility that's amazing. So imagine this room divided in half. This, area, this group is trying to mine Bitcoin. The other group is trying to mine Bitcoin. And, but those groups, for example, have more hashing power, more computers. What the network does is, says, okay, I'm going to make it harder for them to get this block, easier for them, so that no one can hijack it. Let's say the other way around, all the computers go down, there's only one computer left. It makes the solving the puzzle much easier so that the blocks every 10 minutes keep coming and coming. That kind of, that kind of flexibility is unique to the brain and also to the network here. So this slide, um, I'm, I'm, I know the car have been to China many times, you can, if you go to China, you don't, you don't see Uber, you don't see Facebook, you don't see Google, uh, Google you don't see Amazon. They, it took them only one time and were able to ban all those uh, IP addresses. How, do you know how many times China had to try to ban Bitcoin? More than 10 times. They couldn't. They said, okay, fine. How, what can we do next? Maybe we can ban the mining. So you can see where the circle is in 2020. They said, okay, we're done with the, we're done with the mining. Um, then overnight, all the miners went to Texas. And you can see overnight that there was a dip there. So they're trying to make the hashing easier so that it can keep coming every 10 minutes. And now look where we are. We hit all time high, all time high. I can't even say how many zeros, what the number is that. But basically that hashing power equates to 7.5 iPhone 5, uh, 15. So this is how much computers and network is actually back in the network. So when people say Bitcoin is actually backed by nothing, no, actually energy is transformed into money, into security. So that is the value, unlike just printing money out of thin air. Uh, this, again, I'm, I'm going to try to stay away from Freeman. I don't want to steal my, my Bitcoin password. 
or from Savage or hypnotizing me and taking my password. But as far as I can tell, the Bitcoin is very, very secure. No one can take your, no one can crack your brain code and see your information. On the other hand, the fastest computer known to people is really the one, it's called the Eagle computer for, uh, in, um, by IBM. It takes, it, you need to have a computer that's 1 million times stronger than that computer so you can break down the net for, network for Bitcoin. So the best analogy to comprehend that Imagine, for example, now Conor McGregor or Naval's fantasy that uh, Undertaker comes into the room. He will take each one of us down individually. But if you all tag team, you are stronger than that person. So the, yes, each I, the Eagle may be, strong, may be stronger than many other computers, but the whole network worldwide running 24 seven cannot be outlasted. So what makes human beings unique is ability to speak and freedom of speech. And to me is um, Bitcoin is economic freedom. If I can send the money to any person without the middle person, that, that, is, that is freedom. I can express how I feel without worry about retaliation. What happened with the, with the Canadian truckers, they, got, they, they stopped working, people were supporting them. And then the government said, okay, we can take the money down from the GoFundMe page. So those examples happen again and again. So to me, if freedom of speech is important, that's unique to the brain. And thanks, thanks to our country here, First Amendment does protect freedom of speech, but also having ability to economic freedom is, is as important. Who knows about this executive order in 1933-6102? I don't think anyone knows about it in this room. So that's when Frank Griswold said, you know what, the economy is not going well, banking system is about to fail. I think I want to take every American's gold. So every American had to give it his gold, otherwise it was illegal to carry gold until 1974. So good luck flying out with one, ounce, uh, with one ounce of gold if it becomes illegal. But no one really can take your Bitcoin. You can always claim lost in boating accident. So that happened before, happened in many other countries. So you never know when it might happen again. My favorite quote is, the future is already here, but it's not, just not even distributed. So who, who was the first adopters of pagers and cell phones? Probably the mafiosos, the, the bad people. And you know, when Zena was 18, used to go clubbing, her mom used to give her a pager to come back home. It took a while for the, for the technology to come easily adopted. So future is here, but it's not even distributed. We're still very, very early age. Only 15 years ago, people were saying, like, why I have to pay for a fancy iPhone? I was happy with my Motorola flip phone. But it took a while for people to know the true value. Your phone could be your camera, your, your recorder, your video, could be your laptop, basically. So it takes a while for the innovation to, to become evenly distributed. This graph is from one of the books called The Fusion of uh, Innovation. That author went in and looked at all those innovations that changed the technology, the human race, like adoption of the cars, adoption of the subways. And he said, okay, it takes, the time it takes for a new technology to get up to 10% is the same time or to get this hockey stuck effect. So, if it takes 10 years to go from zero to 10%, it's gonna take another 10 years when you have a massive adoption. We are around 5%. It's ex expected to be to get to 2030 when you're gonna to get to 10% adoption worldwide. Obviously there's more adoption use case in the third world countries where the currency is not as strong as a dollar here, but the wave is coming. And uh, same, same concept, man. Basically in 1700, when Vincent discovered that you know blood can circulate, and it's pumped from the heart to the brain and it makes it all the way back. He was accused as being ignorant. People were attached to the old ideas and and, and he just changed the concept of how uh, about the blood flow for three or 400 years. They said, you guys were doing it wrong. And this is, how, this is how it's supposed to be. And his famous quote was, nobody over the age of 40 will ever believe me. No doctor will ever believe me. I'll have to wait for all of them to die. So, I actually was supposed to give the stock last week, last year, but my dad got sick, so I had to cancel it. Last year, Bitcoin was rock button, so I had GoFundMe page. By the way, do you know whose address is that, that Bitcoin wallet? It's actually for the government. Government, government is the seventh uh, biggest holder of Bitcoin. No one knows about that. I tell you, it's not legal, but anyways. So fortunately now, Bitcoin appreciated 500 times. I'm good. So actually that's, so it's my ultimate free strategy. It's my exit strategy to leave Naval here. So I have actually my resignation letter all written and you guys can take a look at it. Can I play this? Can you play it, please? 
can you play? Take this job and shut it. Any questions, guys? <laughs> I'm expecting a monologue. No one's going to ask questions, but I'll try to make it as simple as possible. Thank you. He got the GQ award today. Thanks, thanks to both of you. Uh, I think that uh, unless somebody has any questions uh, for Bitcoin, Mohammed, that I, 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 I again, I don't know what I understand last Freeman or to my son is a, so it's a, brain, uh, brain surgery is very simpler than that. Uh, as my son would say, just clip it. Uh, uh, I think we didn't say enough. Thank you to the people that organized. Uh, I said to Chris, to Abby, but I think Wendy put a lot of work here. Naturally, all the people that made this possible to be in this place with this level of food and, and hotel. So uh, all the, our sponsors, right? You, you, some of you are here. Many of you left already because it's Friday afternoon. It's five o'clock somewhere, uh, beer time. Uh, but but again, uh, uh, Baptist also uh, subsidized this. So. Uh, we always try to make it better. So please uh, give your feedback. Whatever you didn't think we do well, we can try again next year and do it again. Uh, I think we have one last raffle before we close. I don't know, Eric, Wendy, Naraj, if you guys want to say anything. Marjorie. Hey, if I offended someone, I remember if you send any negative comments, I will be deported. So. All right, we're finishing up. We have uh, no more announcements other than there's a reception to follow. Thanks everybody for sticking around. This is pretty good for Friday afternoon at 5.30. Uh, so we're gonna do one last drawing for the last basket that we have. And then we're out of here. All right, guys. Jesse, Josie Thomas? No? Anybody? Okay, well, you have to be present to win. This could take a while. Christina Howard. Oh, man. All right. You should make you turn your card in when you leave. Let's see. Shauna Cross. What's that? Denise, you want to volunteer? What? Oh, what's it? Doesn't count. Victoria Crouch. I am. It's random. Sierra uh, Claire Pierin. You're here. You're here. Yay! Wow. Savant. For you? I'm awesome. All right, guys. Thanks, everybody. This was a great program. Thank you to everybody on the planning committee, uh, Abby and Chris and the stroke coordinators and um, everybody else who helped put this whole thing together. We appreciate your help. And uh, we'll see you guys next year. Oh, reception is in the on the patio. The reception's on the patio. So head that way and we'll see you shortly.